you know, grandma's in one room, mom and dad in another, and the kids, and we can do different different temperatures and things like that. You know, so so grandma's freezing to death, mom's having hot flashes. So we can keep all these temperatures different. But when I get into HVAC, I want to tell you one of the things that, you know, we all have things that people say to you that drive you crazy. You know, just, I had a guy tell me the other day, he said, I cannot stand it when somebody refers to pressure treated wood as salt treated. He said, he just, just drives him nuts for some reason. He doesn't understand. My thing is with air conditioners, it's a condensing unit and an evaporator. With a heat pump, it's an outdoor unit and an indoor coil. They do both jobs. So, and, and, and HVAC guys are not necessarily the most clever, so they said, well, the unit's outside, so let's call it the outside unit. You know, so that's kind of the way they, the way they approach that. Um, when I'm talking to HVAC guys, the old timers still call it wrong. They'll still say at a heat pump, they'll call the outdoor unit a condensing unit. You know, they'll, on, a, on a heat pump, they'll still do that. But uh, a lot of the newer guys, they're on the ball. Running a uh, natural gas air conditioning system? I know about them, never seen one. Know about them, have never seen one. Kenny, can I interrupt for just a minute? Sure, go ahead. Uh, for just some quick housekeeping. The, um, we have uh, about a third of our audience is remote. They're, they're not present in the room. So they can't hear anything that's being spoken out here if you're not at a microphone. So out of courtesy for the rest of our audience, so people will understand what Kenny is responding to, if you have a question, we have four microphones in the room. Two of them I know for sure work, and the other one I'm, I, I'll, I'll test during the break. <laughs> But if you could use one of these two microphones on the stands right now, if you have a question, please go to the microphone. Uh, and Kenny, if you can call on people, uh, you, if, if people are standing in front of the microphone, you know they want to talk to you. Yeah, but I might not want to talk to them. You don't get a choice. No, okay. <laughs> Damn. Anyway, uh, the answer to your question is, do I see any gas air conditioning systems? I, I really do not and in a lot of a lot of different states are going in the opposite direction they're trying to get them to go away from natural gas which i think i personally i think it's a mistake yeah you know i i just think it's a mistake gas burns so clean we still got some we still got some things that we can do with gas to even make it more efficient but it, but it's clean burning i know that uh the electric industry is actually the electric industry is actually counting on them using more electric because a product that they're putting out right now is the you know, film, a film to go out, to be installed in a house on the ceiling, and then you just put the sheetrock over it, and that's electric radiant heat again. And we haven't seen a lot of that since the 60s and early 70s, but they're actually putting it out as a new product. So we, we, will, we will see that, I don't, you know. So it's a, it's a different kind of heat. Radiant heat is definitely a different kind of heat. And the floor is fantastic. Not so much up there. Okay, well, 50 years in the HVAC plumbing business, and I'm gonna talk about 50 defects. Now, when I hit the defects, because we got several hours here, I will, I will show you the defects. I'm gonna talk about them. I'm gonna tell you what I know about the defects, how things happen, and I'll probably tell you some history of some of these things. Or otherwise, I'll be finished in 50 minutes. So we'll start with this, cast iron. One thing you never see PVC rust or corrode out like that. This pipe may have been turned over. It may be a section of pipe laying under the house turned over because it does that on the bottom a lot, especially if it's on the ground or buried in, in, in a crawl space. We have an entire neighborhood in Virginia Beach where I'm from, Norfolk area. Um, we have an entire neighborhood that has this problem and I've warned the home inspectors that go in there. I'm, st I'm still a member of, of ASHE. I'm retired ASHE. All the associations, I have a school and stuff like that. So I see a lot of home inspectors. And I tell them about that particular housing project. I say, take a screwdriver or a probe or something and probe around under the cast iron there. See if it's wet. I said, because sometimes you just don't know. It doesn't show up. Maybe they haven't used a drain in a while. And you don't want to you don't want to get involved with that. If if they got a problem, just tell them. I said it's a major defect. It's a major defect. 
There are there's some cast iron that's been out here 70 years and it's doing great. But there are some that that's that's pretty common to, to actually see that. So failed Kenny, cast real, iron real pipe. Quick, is this microphone working? Is that a reaction to different water types possibly? Is it accelerated by a certain like around here we have five counties? Chester County has a lot of iron in the water. Philadelphia does not. It is a, it's a reaction to the water, but, but look at all the stuff we put into the water. And it's also the pipe is the quality of the pipe isn't as good as it used to be. So you're saying the quality of the pipe? Let me rephrase that. The quality of the material. I see this more in second generation cast iron than I do in first generation. Why do you think that is? Why do I think that is? Yeah, why it's more in a uh, second quality generation? Quality of the material. It's not consistent from the specifications or manufacture. Well, well, or, the original cast iron is definitely heavier, and so forth. So I, that's what that's what I see. Whereas the second generation, there's a lot of spinning going on when they're manufacturing it and stuff, and and it it just doesn't hold up as well. Kenny, how about the cracks on the top of the pipe? That well, you so see that as well. Yeah, you, know, you see it as well. The, and it, what well, I would just say is just just. Keep a you know keep your eye on the pipe if it's laying on the ground scrape out a little little area around the pipe to see if you feel any moisture down there I know we don't inspect things that are not visible but for some reason they forget that I have a, I have an opinion about what causes the crack on go, the top go ahead <clears throat> you find where the toilet drops mm -hmm. so when 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 the waste drops turns into the cast iron everything's moving very fast. For about six or eight feet after that point for about 30 feet everything is well the solids slow down but the liquids are still moving very fast so you leave a little bit of debris on the bottom of the pipe quarter inch half inch after about 30 feet everything is slowed down and more of the debris is moved out of the pipe so you don't have any stoppage or clogging because you only have a little bit of waste on the bottom of the pipe and then after that more moves now the failure is after that six or eight feet down to 30 feet and the reason is the hydrochloric acids in our stomach eat out the top of the pipe and then the, and then after about 30 feet that uh that pipe is clear and it lasts another 20 25 years that's okay, what we'll i think. go with that what's that yeah we'll go with that okay. bottom line is look at the cast iron Look at it really close. But if you know where to look, it's a lot yeah, easier. The top and the bottom. Um, how many of you do the crawl space near the beginning of your inspection? Very, very good. I always do the crawl space dead last. I always do the crawl space dead last because I've run a lot of water by then. And I know, for instance, galvanized steel will leak in a wall um kitchen sinks are notorious for it where they cut the pipe down and make the thread joints you'll flood a kitchen sink dump it and then you, there'll be water coming out in the crawl space out of the, you know you can tell it's coming from above it's coming up in the arm of that drain and it drips into the wall and what we have is if we did the inspection first they may not have been running water when before we got there and we'll miss it you know so I flood the heck out of it the whole time I'm doing the inspections. As I got older, I, I flooded it to the point where I actually have forgot I was flooding it and, and flooded the bathroom, you know, so you gotta, gotta be careful. But that, I do that, I do that every time. I make sure I put plenty of water through that system because as a plumber, I've actually been called in as a plumber to look for leaks and just running a little water, I could never find it. I would have to I would have to really go into some detail. I've had homeowners get in the shower before and let water bounce off their body and stuff like that to find tile leaks and stuff like that. You know, because I've had them say, I'm going to go get my suit, my suit on and hop in the shower. Please do. So you can help me find it. So some of the leaks are kind of hard to find. And if you're not flooding it, you're, you're likely to miss it. This we know. I mean, plumbers know this in the on the trade we i never really doubt when i go to when i went on a service call that what the people were saying was a problem was a problem but there's a lot of times when you get there you can't make it work just by running water but it's amazing how when somebody gets in a shower or something like that especially a fiberglass shower and they're moving around it opens gaps and cracks and all that kind of crap and, it, and it's it's much much easier much much easier to find when when they uh when they do that um now you see holes like this 
if I had to guess, if I went up there on that job and looked at that, I would figure somebody did that on purpose. Because plumbers on older cast iron jobs will knock a hole in the pipe to access it. Now, this may have been something entirely different, it's hard to say, but we find this, as a plumber, we find this in like in the front yard all the time. Somebody's knocked a hole in the pipe, they'll take a piece of four, four pound lid and wrap over the top of the pipe and then just cover it up. You know, roots are growing there and everything, but they'll do that because back in the day, they didn't emphasize the importance of clean outs. So plumbers know, I'm not gonna dig out here all day for the clean out, I know the sewer's down there, they dig it up, bam, pop a, pop a you know, hole in the top of it, stick the snake in there, unstop it, put a piece of steel or, or uh, you know, sheet metal steel over top of it, or usually lead, plumbers like to carry pieces of lead and they'll fold that over top of that thing, throw some dirt on it. You've got an unstopped drain, we haven't been there all day, you're happy, you know. But, you know, a lot of times that, that's, that's the case. This material, I have spent, I don't, let's see if this is gonna work. I have spent entire, I don't think, let me see, I'm gonna see if I can make this work. Hollis, I think it, it'll work. Tell me if you're not seeing it on your, your side over there, Hollis. Just watch this guy real quick. You can, we can see him moving here. I spent an entire summer doing what he's doing right now. I don't know how well you can hear it, but anyway, all he's doing is putting the snappers on there, and he just snapped off the pipe. That's how you cut it. And I've done it all summer long, from eight o'clock in the morning till four thirty in the evening. You know that that's the way we used to. That's the way we used to do that. Today, they still have the chain snappers, but it come. You can buy the Pro Press tool. Pro Press tool. You stick the thing up there and push the button, and it squeezes the copper fitting or the different fittings around with the O ring in it. The Pro Press tool will run. The, you put the chain around the Pro Press tool, pull the chain, snap it just that quick. Some guys say, "Well, I use my my cutoff saw with a wheel on it." The problem with that is that there's usually too many sparks. You know, you don't want to be the guy that always sets the job on fire. You know, so we don't we don't do that. Now, what we do is we do use a grinder with a cutoff blade to access a line under a house, for instance. We have to get in there and cut something off in order to get to it. Absolutely. You know, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, when I got into the business, we were just, we were just getting into, um, let's see if I can find out how to get this over there. I'm doing everything backwards up here from what I can see. <laughs> Molten lead. See that he's got that joint runner around it, clamped around. It's like a rope. He pours in the lid and it keeps it from coming out of the joint. He's not finished. He'll go over, put his he'll put his ladle back in. But what he'll do now is He'll go back and he, he'll have a, uh, let's see, I think I'm gonna have a picture right here. No. He, um, he's gonna go back over and pick out a thing, a bag full of what looks like chisels, all kind of weird shapes and stuff like that and hammer that joint in and pretty it up and it'll look good. That's what he's gonna do now. I've done this many times, but not for entire houses. Uh, about the time I got into business in the early 70s, we had already gone to, no. we were using no hub still, but we were using the no hub bands and things like that. But a lot of us would still pour the closet flange. That flange that goes to the floor for the toilet, we would pour that. And even today we find them broken, we'll drill the lid out 
and put a new flange in. A lot of guys will pour new flange. Uh, some of the newbies, they'll go under and take the pipe loose and band it or switch over to plastic or something like that. But I poured many a joint uh, over the years. It's um, it just, Despite how good the joint is, they really aren't root proof. I mean, roots find a way. And they'll get in there and they'll work on it. Even the no hub bands that are supposed to be root proof, the newer ones are better, but the older ones, you didn't get everything just right. Get that 60 pounds of torque on it and stuff. You could you could still end up with some with some leaks as well. This is something you guys have have probably seen. Um, the lead bin, closet bin. Um, can you see? Let me see if I can right there. See that crack? That crack will open up and it'll you'll flush the toilet and it'll leak. And you know you got a leak. Now, um, the house flipper, the do-it-yourselfer, those guys, they'll come in at the top. That is usually the top of that is usually soldered to a brass flange. We soft soldered it to a flange. By the time it's doing that, the flange is loose. You go upstairs, the floor is a mess, and and they can't really you know do a whole lot with it. the The way to really take care of this is you you come in and you cut that off it's a it's failed lid pipe what we do is we come in and we cut it off you can see that up there at the top where i'm cutting the pipe loose this is on an actual job that i did a few years ago and we then melt the lid that thing sticking out with the lid bumped up on it is brass and the way the guys used to work with it a lot of times you'll see this stuff in like how in the world did they do that under the house a lot of times they didn't they did it out in the yard and they drug a whole bunch of this stuff up under the house that they had already put together. And then they would flip it over and push it up in the floor because that's that would be kind of a rough job to, to work in place. You know, there are some things that we do in place. We can even pour an upside down joint in place. But, you you know, you look at it and say, well, it'd be easier if I do a bunch of these joints out here, drag it underneath the house, put it in place and then just do one joint. That kind of stuff happened a lot. So today when you see that, you get the lid melted. The last thing that I'm doing over here to the left, I'm melting that lid off of that furl. And there are so many of these connectors available today that we can find a connector to transition to something else. And in this case, see how big that connector is on one end and then it's small? Do you all realize when you're under house, we used to do a lot of four inch drains on toilets. We don't need a four inch drain on the toilet anymore. Three inch drains, plenty big. I mean, even since I got in the business, we've gone, we went to energy saving toilets when we went from a five gallon flush to a three and a half gallon flush. We just thought that this will never work. Three and a half gallons is not enough, you know, no problems. 1.6 gallon, I hear a lot of complaints about it. Uh, to me, the biggest failure I find with it is we usually have a low seal in the toilet and the toilet bowl itself kind of gets kind of dingy. You know, but the, 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 because it's a shallow seal, you know, no other way to say it but splatter. And so that's that's a problem. But as far as uh, as as far as a 1.6 gallon flush, you know, and, and I, I didn't I don't get any more calls on a 1.6 than I did on a three and a half. You know, so if you have a particular problem, you know, it's a big problem to you. But I'm not like, OK, I got to go to that 1.6 gallon toilet today. That's not deep. We got 1.28 gallon toilet too, high efficiency. It just doesn't seem to be as, as as big a deal as I hear some of the industry guys are saying. I just, I never just found it to be that that big a deal. And if we can save some water, you know, great. Hey, you guys might have them. Well, we we call it areas up there in the sticks. You know, when we're out of town, uh, most of our area is pretty much on city sewer, municipal sewers, and stuff like that. But when you get away from town, you get into the sticks. You want to save water there because you don't want to keep pumping water into your drain fields. Hey, man, if you can, you can cut that flush down every time, you know, the, the land doesn't have to take in with so much of that water. So that's one of the other things that we're able to do. That's why uh, back in the day, I would get a service call and I would go, they would say the drain stopped up. We'd go out in the middle of nowhere. I'd walk around the backyard and as soon as I hit the backyard, I realized, uh oh, slosh, slosh, slosh. The drain fields are, they took, they've done all they can do. So now it's flooded. 
And we walk back in the house and they got five faucets in the house that is trickling water. You know, so they're wasting water, but it's going into the yard. And so that's one of the first things we tell them. We might be able to stop some of these things and it might recover. May not. Sometimes you can, sometimes it's just beyond repair, but sometimes it, it'll recover. But anyway, by putting a smaller drain on there, if you uh, can take an adapter like that and transition, I, I like the strong backs. They're really good. But anyway, you can transition to like that. Now I can put an elbow on there. That's three inch pipe. Elbow or flange. So, you know, secure that flange good to the floor. Don't use nails. I see guys using nails. I'm like, what are you thinking of? You know, good. I like to use stainless steel screws. A lot of the older guys will use brass screws. Brass screws, they strip out too easy when you put your electric drill on it, you know, or your battery powered drill on there. But now we're over to plastic. We're going to get a lot of years out of that, you know, once we, once we we'll switch it over. Um, I just put this in here. I won't elaborate on it on it too much, but it's another thing for you to look out for. ABS. We did have a failure in ABS in like in the 80s. It was a big deal. It, it was a lot of it more out in the Midwest. Uh, names like Phoenix and stuff like that. They they had a lot of problems. There was a lawsuit. Um, but I'm getting calls. That picture there, uh, John Craner, who's actually on the board in Virginia, Home Inspection Board in Virginia. John Craner uh, sent that picture. He says. They're seeing some of it in Richmond, you know. And he's we. I'm I'm from Virginia Beach, Hampton Roads area. John's from Richmond. I got family in Richmond, and so a lot of times we'll be talking. And even that short distance apart, sometimes there's things that are going crazy out there that we don't see as much of. We don't see as much of the ABS problems because we don't see ABS. You know, once on a blue moon, we'll run into an ABS system because what happened. Years ago, they were using ABS and they were using PVC, and the local manufacturer for our main uh, the supply house, not the manufacturer, Ferguson, they just went to selling basically just all PVC. So everybody just switched. You know, it kept them from having to keep both things. And so anyway, that's what we that's what we we see. We see the PVC, no real issues that I know of uh, that I've had. Uh, but the ABS is starting to show some problems at some joints again. It's, they're not going to get tagged as, you know, in a lawsuit or something like that because it's been in a long time. But, but what it makes me do as an inspector, I look a lot closer. Okay, I'm going to look a lot closer at things that I know can bite me in the butt when I leave. You know, I mentioned a minute ago, who does, who does the crawl space first? I always shoot for the crawl space last. I, sh I would always do the crawl space last because... How many of you have been on an inspection and something happened at the inspection? I've literally seen agents about ready to come to blows. And the, and the job is done. You, you're going to leave. So that's why I never did the crawl space until very last. You know, with that in mind, I would do it because maybe I don't have to do the crawl space. You know, they're still going to get a bill, but I might not have to do the crawl space. Uh, the guy that I got in the business with in the late 90s, he taught me the number one rule to home inspection is don't let them block you in. He said, there's two things that happen. Something can happen. I've seen the loans crash. You know, right in the middle of the inspection, the loan wasn't going to go through. And they said, Kenny, you might as well stop. You know, they can't afford a house. Uh, since they went and, and uh, applied for the loan, they bought two cars. You know, they're supposed to do that after they get the loan. But anyway, that's what happens. And so the deal would come to an end and we're packing up. That's a weird situation to be in. Everybody's upset and you don't want to have them having to pull cars out of the driveway so you can get out. So my friend always said, don't let them block you in. But the other thing, and you guys have seen this, the house is beautiful. Maybe a couple little minor things, but everything's pretty good. And when you get finished, they're in love with you. You've gone through the house, you've showed them things. They're your best friend now. They want to walk out and get in the truck with you. You got a three o'clock inspection. So that's another reason. Don't let them block you in because you can get in the car and leave, you know, at, at some point. It's hard to leave if they still want to get in the truck with you, but they got you blocked in. So we always looked at it that way. Some of the some of the tricks of the trade have nothing to do with the actual the actual work. But pay close attention to the ABS. Pay real close attention to the ABS because some of the joints are turning up an issue and there's ways to, to make repairs and stuff. I mean, probably gonna have to be cut out or whatever. But just look at it because you don't want to be the guy that pays for the repair. I got some <laughs> hey, uh, quick last question on cast iron. Um, 
a lot of times I'll see on the main vertical line coming down from the second floor, there's a lot of what I call rust mushrooms on them where mm -hmm. they seeped out. And, um, and normally that corresponds with they've had their main sewer line replaced. Mm -hmm. But I've heard different reasons for why that happens, sand pits and things like that. Do you have a thought I, on that? I kind of go with the sand pit idea because I, I do see a lot of them weeping. Sometimes you just see a little spot. You'll just see a little spot on there. But I'm going to note all that stuff because I don't want to pay for it. You know, I'm going to tell them that it, it could indicate failure, something like that. Uh, a lot of houses don't last as or the, the plumbing, the, the sewer, let's say, didn't last as long as the plumbing in the house. That's a real common thing. What we had a lot of in our area is the area started out on subdick, and now it's got sewer. So the line will come up under the house and you'll actually see a transition from cast iron at the building ring from cast iron to PVC, a big rubber adapter on there and it'll transition over. But yeah, that, if you see that, you know, I call it out. Now, sometimes you'll see at a joint that it looks like oil. You know, you can put, you can rub your finger on, you can tell it's oil. You know, I mean, it ain't leaking oil. Now, in other words, unless unless they've got a real situation going on, but that, the, a lot of stuff will come out of the will come out of the joint over time. But if if, if I see anything, oh, let's face it, guys, that pipe's been in a long time. And if it's no hub, I'm if it's no hub pipe, like I said, I don't have the confidence in the old no hub that I did in the old heavy hub and spigot stuff. I have way more confidence in than in a lot of that stuff, you know, because I mean, you know, it's heavier because you're walking out and picking up a ten foot section of no hub. And then you go back in the day, you'd go over and pick up maybe a four foot section of a hub and spigot and, and it weighed more. It was heavy. And so, you know, there's there there was much more to it. I look back on those days when they were first doing that. And I was and I think back and I'm like, man, what do they think they were trying to hold in? You know, the, the water pipes back then you're you're having to solder water pipes and do all these things. And nowadays we just we just smash a fitting around it with an O-ring in it. You know, it's so just entirely different. We got, uh, uh, you know, shark bites. We're done. You know, we, we got some of that stuff. And I'll show you later on, we got shark bites that'll hold 800 plus pounds of pressure. Mm -hmm. it's it just, it just crazy. Some of the stuff you, you know, you run into. Uh, so a defective ABS joint, when you write that up, you might indicate, you know, the, I, I always use the phrase, have it evaluated and corrected. That's the phrase I use, not, you know, that call a plumber or whatever. I never use a licensed contractor. I never said use a licensed contractor. I always said use a qualified contractor. If he's qualified, he's going to have a license. If he's if he's got a license, I know guys that paid for licenses. You know, they they can't even they can't even remember how to flush a toilet, but they they got a license. So I say qualified. That helps me when they call me up and they say, "Hey Kenny, who do I call for this?" I called I called an HVAC guy. He showed up and to look at my system. And he says, oh, I don't work on boilers. You know, you got to you got to qualify them. You got to ask them a few questions, you know, tell them what they're going to work on. You tell a guy, you know, say, I got I got the, the uh, home inspector says I got some cast iron pipe leaking under the house. That way they won't send the little 18 year old apprentice. You know, they'll send the old grumpy guy and you'll see him snuffing out that cigarette before he gets out of the car or before he gets out of his truck. So keep that in mind. Um, Anybody know what the defect is there? Cross connection. The cutoff point of that valve is under the water, so it gets submerged. And because it gets submerged, it can siphon. That valve will do it too. I bought one of these at Lowe's recently. The other one is hard to find. Not, it's hard to find new and buy them. It's not hard to find them in place because you could fix them for $2. You could buy a little diaphragm that goes in there and keep repairing them. We sold thousands of this guy right here back in the day because it was replacing the float ball type. We're selling that one. I mean, we were getting them by the case for like $2 and something, you know. And plumbers will charge $14 for that book. You know, so we put a lot of them in. The service call that we get on this, when we realize they do have a cross connection problem, look at 
why do I have blue water? I used to write some articles for drinking water and backflow prevention. I think they changed their name, but drinking water and backflow prevention. Prevention. I wrote uh, some articles for them, and they, they sent us a list one year. Anybody want to write an article on any of this stuff? I said, I'll do the blue water one, because I knew what it was. You go to a lavatory, you turn on the faucet for a second, and blue water comes out of the spout. It's siphoning from the toilet tank. Everybody doesn't use the blue dye in their toilet tank. So there might be a few where they're getting that water. Well, the, the comment with that always is, well, it's clean water. In the zombie apocalypse, I will go to the tank and get me the last drop of water to survive. In the meantime, I don't want to drink out of your toilet tank. There's some nasty stuff in there. So that, that's the thing. So it's considered cross-nation. I wrote the article, and I, what I did was I studied the standard. And I can't do anything now, plumbing or HVAC, without thinking home inspector. So when I, when I did it, the one thing I found to say absolutely positively for sure, first of all, those two are the main things that you're going to see that are wrong. There's not too many other ones out here that are wrong. But the thing that I, I wanted to find that I could say, if you see this, you're good to go. Can anybody tell me what's the same on those two valves? The same. It's identical. There's something on those two valves that is identical. And there's some weird looking valves, right? I mean, the comparison. By the way, the one on the right is the one that the same manufacturer made the, the brown one. And what they did was they essentially put the, the cutoff point above the water and where it was before it was below the water. All right, here's what you look at when you look at the valves to know that they're approved. It says CL. It says CL. It stands for critical level. We're supposed to have the water be below that level, basically. I mean, they can tell you an inch or whatever. But anyway, if you see a CL on it, it's approved. You know, but remember, the main things you're going to see out here in the field are going to be that one. And it's wrong. And like I said, you can still buy it at Lowe's. It's wrong. We love these because they were, man, there's nothing in the tank when you put that guy in there. But when they failed, you know, they would waste a lot of water. So that one. That one are probably the main two that should catch your attention. I found, I found this one in a in a house on the eastern shore one time, and it doesn't work. Um, I found that one in a, in a house on the eastern shore, the the brown one. I can't get it to stay over there for some reason. So anyway, um, and it looked really new. And when I was the house was vacant, people had moved out. I got to looking around the house, and I actually found four or five of them on a shelf. A guy had bought them, and it had just been there over the years, and he was replacing the same one, probably because it was so cheap when he, when he got it originally. But, you know, and, and, the, and the thing that people will say, well, well, it was legal at the time. Maybe, I don't know. That was a long time ago. You know, but the, the thing is, we think way more about cross connections than we used to, and we should. We should, because there's a lot going on out there in your, in your drinking water. How about this? What is the problem? Um, they at least used a steel basket. I've, I've seen a peach basket before. You see these in the house or on, or at the water heater. It's improper support. You know, initially they're not real crazy heavy or anything, but they, they'll fail at some point and you're going to be full of water. It's heavy. It'll break something. They are supposed to be well supported. And here's one. At some point, that would probably break that CPVC. Now, that's, if that thing gets full of water, it gets bumped the least little bit. When CPVC gets some age on it, it gets brittle. You know, it gets really brittle. How about that one? That's beautiful work, isn't it? I would not want my name attached to that. As a, as an inspe as a as a plumber, but you know somebody did. Here's the thing, guys. There's no need for it. They make all kinds of kits for hanging these things. They can just be put on the wall in the boiler room or in the in the utility room next to the water heater, and you pipe over to it. The one on the left is probably I don't know. The last time I think I bought one, they were around fifty bucks. So it's a little bit expensive, but they do a great job. I've got some of those mounted to carts in my uh, class. 
and we've got big tanks mounted with those clamps to these carts. And what we do is we pressurize them with water. We take a hose from a spigot, we put it on there, we turn it on, and when the pressure equalizes out, we turn the valve off. And now we got about 50 pounds of water pressure there, and I can squeak out about three pounds of water or three gallons of water out of it. And it, it makes a nice setup. But these are not, not crazy expensive. The one on the right, when you put the little bracket on the wall, the little bracket, and then you, you can just kind of thread the strap. They look like big hose clamps. They do a great job. They do a great job. You don't have to rely on a, a peach basket. You know, I've looked all over the plumbing code, and I have never found peach basket listed as a, as an, a proper fitting. So if you see that, you know, point out to them. It's, it's not properly secured. It could break the pipe. And, you know, you might even want a note on there because you might find an HVAC guy that he only goes to Lowe's or Home Depot and he might not see these. But if he goes online to plumbingsupply.com or some place like that, he'll probably see them and like, oh, man, you know, he'll put a few on his truck, especially the, the one at the far right. They, those are fairly inexpensive. All right, look at this one. What's the defect? The trap's on its side. Okay, the trap's on its side. So you see the trap on its side and trap installed on its side. A trap has to be installed this way. So it has a, um, water in the trap and then really you want to maintain a seal so it'll stay full of water to keep those sewer gases out of the house. That's the point of this plumbing system. It's also something that will help keep vermin out of the house. You know, you'll get insects. It, sometimes you go, and I'm sure you guys have done it, you'll go into a vacant house um, and there'll be like cockroaches and stuff all over the kitchen sink and things like that. A lot of them just came up through the drain because the water in the trap, you know, evap <clears throat> excuse me, evaporated. So they, they were like, hey, we go to the house, you know. And if you wonder if there's a lot of cockroaches in the plumbing system, go in a manhole. I've been in a manhole 14 feet deep before and they were dropping off the walls onto my back and stuff, you know. So you have to tighten, you tape your shirt at the bottom because you want them to build up in your shirt and you can take them home, scare the wife and stuff like that. That's why I'm not married anymore. No. All right, what's the defect? What did I just tell you? Traps on its side. There's another defect in that picture. Do you see it? Yeah, it won't hurt it if they put it on there flat. Look at, hey, look at the watermark on the duck. It's been underwater. That duck has been underwater. That's a watermark on that duck. That's been completely submerged. I live in an area where if we get a hurricane or something, we flood. So that duck's been full of water, you know, or a good portion of it's been full of water at some point. So. I mean, I look for watermarks in my area all the time. I will find watermarks on boilers and furnaces. You know, we know it's been submerged. If, if you you find that, you need to let the H, you know, tell them, let the HVAC guy put it on him. You know, some manufacturers say, hey, if any part of our furnace becomes, you know, submerged, replace it. And in a lot of cases, the insurance company is going to pay for it anyway. You know, yeah, well, that's the thing, the whole thing. But all that water, all that, I mean, I look for crap like that all the time because, like I said, in my area, you know, we know that we're, we're prone to flooding. If you, if you guys got a lot of basements, in my area, if you got a basement, when you click onto my report, it points out that at some point that basement's going to have water in it. We, they all flood in Norfolk and places like that. So Kenny, Kenny, we got a question from the remote audience. Okay. Uh, they, um, somebody was just following up on the these uh, supporting the um, expansion tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the, the the concept is that if the pipe is going directly up and the thing is balanced on top of it, is that okay? In, in most cases, if it's you know copper or a good steel, a good heavy pipe, it's fine. I'm just telling you on CPVC, not so good. You know, CPVC will break if you, if there's any extension of the pipe at all. It is known to break. You know, CPVC when it gets old, I'm telling you, as a plumber, because a lot of times we want something in writing. We'll write this down. As a plumber, I'm telling you, CPVC gets brittle with time, and it will break. And if you have something way up here in the air, 
would be a problem. But most of the time, we, 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 what do we do? We put a we put a valve in the line, and then we put a T on top of the cold water part of the uh, water heater, and and have that expansion tank. You can usually tell if it's pretty well supported. But I'm not a you know we see a lot of pecs and stuff going on now with this stuff shoved in pecs, and that's why they end up in baskets hanging with strings and ropes and stuff. You know, I just like honestly. I mean, you know, read a book. You know, so you see some of the stuff is just crazy how how that is. All right, so this one here, like I said, a lot of times you get so fixated on something. I mean, I'm going to assume a professional plumber didn't do the trap, but but I wouldn't make sure the home inspector looks around because we get so fixated on one thing we miss the other thing. You know, you know, so you don't want to do that. Look for evidence that it's it's been flooded at some point. You know, we. Uh, I've actually gone into houses. I was called when I worked for a company called Home Buyers Inspections. When I first got in the business, I worked for them, and um, I, I would get calls, and they would say, "We want you to send Kenny because it's got a you know plumbing issues, or we want you to send Kenny because it's got a, a you know special HVAC system." So I, I, I remember one call in particular, I went out there and I'm looking around the system and now they had a water to air heat pump, which is not every day. I, I don't consider it special. It's just not an everyday thing. So I'm looking at it and all. And then I start noticing something that out of some of the floor registers, I saw a piece of like three eighths, quarter inch, three eighths tubing. It went up and there was a hole drilled in the baseboard and it was fished through the hole in the baseboard. Now that's unusual. So I'm walking around outside and these little hoses are coming out into the flower beds. I was what in the heck is this? So I go back in the house and I'm looking around and then it dawned on me. I was standing on a concrete slab. I forgot it was a slab home. I go over and pop one of the registers out and there was water in the duct, a little bit of water in the duct. This duct system would flood periodically. They had a system set up where they would flip a switch and they had all these little condensate pumps kind of tricked out so that when they flipped the switch, they would come on and pump water out through that little tube on the side of the house. That's a major defect. All that crap in the duct system, air blowing it all in the house, all that kind of stuff. So when I got to the point, we, when we did inspections, I know a lot of you taking reports home. I was in home inspection business for years and I never took a report home, ever. I wrote the report on the job. I had my computer set up, so I put the button, boom, it would tell you something, and anything else you needed to know, it came up. And a lot of people say, well, I couldn't do a good inspection. Well, all I know is I had a really good report, I had a lot of information on it, and I never got sued. So I figured, well, you know, I'm gonna keep doing it, and that way when I go home, at the end of the day, I'm home. By the way, I was a single dad taking care of two teenage daughters, and when I got home at the end of the day, there was enough going on. So anyway, uh, we, would try, we would actually sit down afterwards if we had time and go over the report with them. And when I got to that part, did the heating, and the lady says, can you tell us what's so unusual about this plumbing or about this heating system? And I said, well, I don't know if it's unusual, but it is defective. And started going over the thing. And an underground system like that that's rusted out and you've got surface water coming into, that's a major expense because they've got to figure out probably where to put the system now they actually did come up with a way they put it in the overhead but it was a two-story house getting getting duct work on the ceiling of the first floor is tricky on a two-story house you know if, if the house is already built and so forth so it was a little tricky but anyway we you know that that kind of stuff you know uh i don't know if an average guy would have missed it or not but you know i'm i how many of you are home inspectors and you've been an electrician okay I guarantee you, you do a better electrical inspection than the other guy because it's in your blood. You're used to it. Same thing with plumbing, you know, plumbing, HVAC, the guys that do that, you're going to have an easier time of it. You're also going to know stuff that they tell you that, well, you know, this is kind of a problem. And you're also going to be the guy that knows, yeah, it ain't that big a problem. You know, we see stuff like that from time to time. You know, I'll get some, you'll get a story that's blown out of proportion and you, you can at least sit down and qualify it with the people. Yeah, that, but the reason that happened was blah, 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 blah. You explain that to them. And, you, you know, and, and a lot of times an issue that might seem a big deal may not, maybe it isn't as big a deal. But, you know, half of this job is CYA. You know, we have to, we have to make sure because 
they, all they know is it's broke. You were there. I mean, it's like me getting a call. I used to get a call to go change a water heater. I go change the water heater. The phone will ring the next day. Hey, you were just out here changing my water heater yesterday. I said, yeah, the sewer, the sewer stopped up. What did you do? I didn't even go to the bathroom. You know, I'm like, just because I was there, it's the same thing with you. You know, you turned the thermostat up and you broke the furnace. So I know, believe me, I've been there. What's the problem? That's a package unit. It's installed in a building. That's an out, that's outdoor equipment. It's going to get real hot there. It's going to get real hot there. So there's a location issue. It's an exterior unit installed indoors. Uh, it's going to build up a lot of heat. Now, sometimes you'll find clues from the outside of the building. You're looking at a building and you're thinking, I wonder why they have so many exhaust fans on this building. It's because all that heat is building up from the unit that they put in there, excuse me, that they put inside the building. They're trying to get it out of the building, the, 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 you know, the residual heat from it. But their listings on that's gone. You know, they're, the listings aren't going to stand up because it's made to be installed outdoors, not made to be installed indoors. You know, it's just like some guys will they'll take a duck and they'll put a big, a big elbow on the exhaust or something to turn it away. You know, you, you basically re redesign the unit. Now, I've done it myself as a plumbing and HVAC guy. If the compressor ever went out, you know, you certainly wouldn't be talking to the manufacturer and say, well, that thing has a lot of issues anyway because I had to put a big elbow on top of the unit. You don't tell them that. You, know, you, would, never, you would never tell them that because you've redesigned the unit. They said, well, when this unit got its, its approval, its UL approval, whatever approval it got, we didn't have a big elbow on it, you know, on, on, on top of it, trying to kick the, the heat exhaust away from the building. So, but that one there is, is real cut and dry. It's installed in the building. It's an exterior unit. As that thing discharges heat, it's going to accumulate in there. The heat is then going to get pulled back in. And over time, it's going to be, when it should be outside pulling in maybe 90 degree air, 95 degree air at, at the most, all of a sudden it's, pull, it's pulling in 115 degree air. It's gonna work harder, it's probably gonna perform less, and it's probably not gonna last as long. You know, so that kind, of stuff can, that kind of stuff can sneak up on you. You guys are gonna have to tell me, are we supposed to take breaks every hour? I mean, some of, some of you guys do, some of you guys don't, I don't know. Pardon me? 10.05, okay. No problem. Anybody want to guess where that unit is? It's right below the valley of the roof. It just pours water on those things. And, you know, sometimes it, it ends up icing over unit, you know. If it, it, I tell you where I see that, where it usually ends up causing the most damage. It's, it's a heat pump that's had some problems. And over time, water, you know, water would be going on it and it would start freezing over. They get it, they get something fixed in the house and then they go to turn the heat pump back on and it's iced over like that. So sometimes the motor just goes, huh? You know, the fan's not going to spin because it's got so much ice on top of it. But in most cases, you can just put a deflector or something on the roof and kick the water away a little bit if you don't have a gutter on the house. Most people are going to have a gutter anyway. But that, I see that quite a bit. You know, you know, there's certain things like that. I, I tell you something about a, a a mini split that we try to get our people that I that I know in um, in Hampton Roads to talk about. If a mini split is sitting near a sidewalk, it's a heat pump. Mini split heat pump sitting near a sidewalk. We I try to tell the guys remember this unit pulls in the air through the back of them. Most of them are front discharge. Pulls in the air in the back and discharge out the front. In the winter time, that air is going to be freezing, and it'll all of a sudden they've been walking around the house for years, and now they've got this thing in there, and they got a little sheet of ice on the on the walkway in front of them. We just tell them, you know, be careful. You just remind them. You don't have to write it up as a defect. It's perfectly legal to install it like that. But little tips like that are helpful. Just say reminding it is a front discharge unit. You know, you've never had a 
a unit like this before. So just be careful when you come around there. You know, you don't want to end up on plenty of some videos or ridiculousness or something like that, you know, from, from slipping and sliding on the sidewalk. But it, it's something you gen generally don't think about. But the HVAC guys know, HVAC guys have been in the trade, they know, because they're the ones that have to go around there and work on it. They're already uptight because it's a cold winter day. That's the most miserable thing you can work on is an outdoor unit on a cold, miserable day because the air blowing off of it's freezing. You know, so you're already cold. So, now, in the summertime, we walk up and we take our shirt and we hold it out like this and we dry our shirts out so we're ready for the next job. You know, How many times have you been down the road and you see a, a, a tradesman going down the road with his shirt hanging on the mirror? The shirt got wet from sweat and he just hangs it on the mirror to dry the shirt out when he's driving. You know, when he gets to the next house, he's nice and dry. He smells, but he's nice and dry. Yeah. It's kind of kind of stuff you see like that. Um, another um, issue. Again, it's going to build up a lot of heat. And it's going to recycle that heat. I put my gauges on that. And the discharge pressures are going to be out of sight. You know, and if you get the discharge pressures way up there, if, if the temperature of the discharge line gets up at... 200 plus, you know, two, two and a quarter, you'll cook the oil in the compressor. And then what do we always worry about in, in the HVAC business and what do homeowners worry about is having to replace a compressor. You know, if you walk out there and you put your gauges on and the, and the compressor shot when you're checking it and you tell them they need a new compressor, you're also going to tell them as an HVAC guy, and hey, we got to move this unit. Or you got to move that deck, if, if you can call that a deck. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have any um, uh, limitations on clearances underneath of decks? I've got units? all kinds of clearances. I'm going to show you a picture. Um, I don't, I mean, uh, if you got slides, you certainly, you certainly can make a copy of this. I'll explain how I did it in just a few minutes. But yeah, I, got, I did one of overall clearances for outdoor units. I, I got manufacturer's instructions for probably 15 or 20 units, and then I compared them give you some general ideas. The manufacturer, and they're a little different depending on the manufacturer. So we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but uh, how about this one? Honey, it's summertime, go open up the deck. Um, here's one of the problems with that. It, okay, it, it might work. It might work. The discharge coming out of that thing absolutely might work, but the, the, the one of the big problems is you can't get there to service it. You know, you probably couldn't get you know, around behind, it looks like it's, it looks like I see a little bit of foundation wall back there and stuff like that. So that's ridiculous. You've got to be able to service a unit. The one thing I appreciate about the trade since I got into it in 74, I actually got into it in 72. I used to work summers, but I didn't consider it full time until the day after I graduated high school, I went full time. And what, what I think, um, it's changed a lot is they they now they now emphasize we need room for the technician you got to give the guy some room to work on before it was like hey, he only makes three dollars an hour if he dies he dies that's the way i used to feel about a lot of that stuff we had a technician in our area one time he he hung around on a job until everybody and you know, everybody went to lunch and you know he probably ate a boiled egg or something and just hung around the job and then he went back up in the unit to do some work before the other guys got there. When they got there, they found it on top of an air handler. He had to climb over the air handler to get to the disconnect. He climbed up on the air handler and got electrocuted. You know, so in fact, a lot of that stuff just wouldn't be necessary if they would have put the disconnect where he could have got to it. You know, the average guy's not going to climb on a unit. So this one here, the guys, I mean, I would tell them right off the bat, it's not accessible for repairs. Uh, I would look underneath and Tell them, you know, because the, the discharge, it's not going to get hot under the deck because it's discharging out the top. But I would but I would also look for other things. But I'd point out, when you have to have this service, the service is going to be outrageous. They probably tell you they can't do it without disconnecting and all that kind of stuff. It's not supposed to be installed that way. Now, some guys will say, well, you know, I got a guy, he works pretty inexpensively. Guarantee you they're going to figure out a way to get it out of you. You know, they'll charge you $14 for a $2 ball cock. Well, they'll damn sure do it on air conditioning. But if you have to have a, a motor or something, that motor will triple in price if they have to stand on their head to get to the thing. That kind of stuff is, is you know, it's just not necessary. And this, I, I found this. 
it was okay until they put the, poured the concrete. And if you look at it, I mean, you can tell it was, it was sitting there for a while and then all of a sudden they did that. So why in the world didn't they spend the money for an HVAC guy to come and raise that puppy up? I mean, he may have had to cut the lines and braise them. The, the, uh, the disconnect, the seal tight looks like that would probably wouldn't have been a problem. He might have had to, but that's okay. It, you know, he wouldn't be working in a hole. What's going to get in that hole when it rains? You know, it's a mess. You know, it's, it's a mess. So you see, you see stuff sometimes and you're like, what in the world? Uh, units too close together. When they come on, they pull against each other. And, you know, that, that's always going to be an issue. They'll, they'll recycle the same discharge air. You know, you find that kind of stuff. Here's the little checklist thing that I put together. Overhead clearance is almost always going to be between four and five feet. It'll, it'll say right to manufacturer's instructions, no overhead, you know, anything over it closer than four. Some of them say five feet. I see that's the two numbers. I, never, I haven't seen two feet. I haven't seen three feet. But I've seen a lot of them that'll say 48 inches to 60 inches to a wall or to like a, uh, we see this privacy fence. If it's a solid wall privacy fence, it might as well be the side of the house. Six to 10 inches between the units, typically 18 to 24 inches. And though we like to see 30 inches for serviceability, and a lot of the codes will say 30 inches, I have seen manufacturers say minimum of 24, you know, to work on it. What does it mean if you, you know the code says 30, manufacturer says 24, when you call for a service guy and you don't have as much space, you don't ask for Kenny, you ask for the little skinny guy that works there, you know. So that, that, that kind of stuff. But these are the numbers I came up with. Elevate for snow, heat pumps, you know, elevate for snow. It could, be, it could be pretty high if you get a high snowfall. You guys probably get more snow than we do. We get some snow, they call out the National Guard, you know. But last year we had, we had snow on the ground one day. I was, uh, you know, just, just, just didn't, don't get it that often. So, you know, that was, that was pretty quick. Um, and if any, you got my email address. Any of you want a picture of the slide? If you if you didn't get a picture of it from the presentation, you know, do that. Um, number nine, polybutylene leak. I get asked this all the time. Uh, people will say, "Kenny, is the polybutylene situation as big a problem as they made it out to be?" They always figure the the plumber knew more about it, and he was. Eh. It only happens on Wednesday, you know, something like that. They want to hear something like that. I always tell them I loved polybutylene. Absolutely loved it. I, I, I installed it for years. What I love about it is I got paid to install it. Then I got paid to replace it. And now I get paid to talk about it. So what's not to love about polybutylene? If you want to ask me if there were definitely problems, there were definitely problems. And though the fittings were, that's the other thing I hear people say, it's the fitting, it's the fitting, it's the fitting. Fittings were definitely a problem, especially early years. The, the plastic fittings, the acetyl fittings. But later on, I would, I would find leaks on the pipe itself. It did not take abuse. If you had a piece of it laying in the back of the truck rolling around, you know, you stepped on it when you went back there looking for a fitting or a tool, and got a little dinged up, it's probably where it's going to leak. See that, you see the leak on this one? It's kind of hard to see. That leak. Look at you can tell it's wet there. So, polybutylene leak. Um, do you guys see polybutylene around here? Okay, good. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the money ran out. You know, but uh, for years we had Plumbing Express there, and Plumbing Express would have you guys come to a meeting at Ruth Chris Steakhouse and uh, they'd have an open bar and they would feed you. And I, they hired, I wrote an article for, for uh, the Ashley Reporter about it. Mike Casey wrote the first article. I followed up with an article and they hired me to go with them or show up in the same city. And I would just do an hour of regular CE. Wouldn't even, I wasn't even gonna talk about polybutylene. 
I just do a regular hour of CD, and we we are uh, CD. We went to Atlanta, Maryland, Virginia. We went different places and did this little presentation. And one night I was sitting at the table, and I looked over at the guy's credit card receipt, and it way over ten thousand dollars to pay for the food and the drinks. I was surprised the drinks were lower than they would be with home inspectors. You would figure the drinks would be way up there, but anyway, there was. There was just this bill, and I looked at him. I said, "That much for every one of these meetings?" He says, so "Sometimes they're a lot higher." He says, "We'll make it back in two calls." And they spent years just—they weren't even plumbers; they were repipe specialists. They had to have a—they had to have a licensed plumber in their company. They had a guy that had like two dozen licenses or something like that for different states, but they weren't, you know, necessarily plumbers. They wouldn't come out and do a drain anything like that but they that's all they did was repipes and what they did on the repipes that was so cool was they had a crew come in to cut it out first they would actually come onto the job and the guy would they would open up a nice hole and uh, i've never seen it done this well i mean they would they would open up sheetrock so nice in some places they put the same piece of sheetrock back in the hole and then they would take the joint and blend it in i was like man you know they're i mean they were they just were that efficient um we tend to take sheetrock out. Plumbers tend to take sheetrock out with a hammer. You know what I mean? So not quite as efficient. Got a question? Hey, Kenny. Hey, Kenny. David. So a um, buddy of mine does that. He repipes buildings, apartment mm -hmm. stuff. And he said, and it's something I wanted to see if you've seen this. He said that the inside radius of a building that's had chlorine on this for a long time mm -hmm. is more likely to fail than just Definitely a, a problem. Chlorine was definitely a problem. We have... Uh, we have two or three different treatment areas in, in Hampton Roads. Hampton Roads is sometimes gets called seven cities. We have uh, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Portsmouth. Um, well, that's it. That's all I can remember. I'm getting old, I can't remember. But anyway, we have all these uh, Newport News, Hampton, and uh, so forth. And sometimes the water doesn't come from the same place. In some areas, they had more chlorine than others, definitely had more problems than others. You know, I'm, I'm certain that I'm certain the chlorine had something to do with it, though it didn't seem to be a consideration. You know, when the lawsuit was going on, the deal with the lawsuit was pretty was pretty cut and dry. What they would say is if you had two qualifying leaks, you know, you could you could get it repiped. Now, what we found was I would go to the job to try to get a repipe, an insurance guy to, to give him the repipe. They had one insurance company would come around and I learned early on he didn't like to go under the house. So I would make sure that I had the crawl space opened. And when he came around to the side and he would go to look under the house and he couldn't see anything, I would say, why don't you just, I'll go into the house with you. And I said, I even got a couple extra pair of coveralls. He would say, no, you're good. And he would write it up as a qualifying leak. He never wanted to go into the house, but it was very simple to get a, a repipe paid for, for on Coxie shell, the light, the lawsuit for Coxie shell. People got, people got a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff taken care of. Yeah. Hey, along those lines, your odds of a failure are much, 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 much less on well water. Yes, yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. And I mean, in my yeah, there's no doubt chlorine was an issue. Yeah. In my I've seen people use it on pools for some kind of goofy little thing that they were doing, and it didn't last no time, yeah. you know, because they were pumping water out of their pool for something. And it, just, it just didn't hold Yeah, up. in our area, people call the county about it. Yeah. The county guys, if they're on well water, it'll go. It's not going to be a problem. And think about this, though, now. If you see polybutylene now, it's probably been in for 40 years. You know, it's kind of hard to say, yeah, this stuff's going to leak. Well, the copper's going to leak too, you know, probably, you know, at some point. So that, that could be kind of a thing, you know, the, the, the length of time. Now, um, this is, see the, uh, the, the gray fitting in there and the aluminum rings? We definitely had issues with those initially i had five gallon buckets full of elbows and tees and stuff like that we would take it in the job and one day i went to the supply house and they said yeah we don't sell them anymore you gotta buy the uh, so i had all these buckets that i had to toss and i look back now and think man i could have been giving that stuff out to home inspectors all these years i got a big a big huge box of polybutylene in my in my school where the guys if they don't they want a piece of it they can you know they can take a piece of it but uh, just so they so they can see it, and it's all from jobs and stuff that I took it off and just. I went into a shed one day that my father had at his house, and I was going to empty out the shed. And he was like me; he would save all kinds of weird stuff 
and he had buckets full of old pipes and fittings and stuff like that. And I, and I found them, so we've been giving it out. Giving it. This is the uh, original suit. That was really, uh, I think the manufacturer that was involved in this was, it's, it's the Spencer class suit, but it was also, in, it was involved with uh, DuPont. What, I, what I've heard, it was DuPont. So, And that, you know, that went for a little while, but then the, so many people had to have their whole houses redone. Cox v. Shell came out. Cox v. Shell paid $950 million. I think it was another $50 million set aside to disperse the money. They had people that were, that, that's all they did until they ran out of money. And it went until 95, from the time it kicked into 95. And some companies just set up and that's all they did was repipes. And that's, you know, that's cool. I, I particularly care for repipes. I could, I could do much better charging by the hour on something else. Than I could on a repipe, and and like I said, we took out the sheetrock with a hammer. People get a get a little freaked out. You ever watch TV? You guys been in the business? You know how a house is put together. And if you see a guy, he he accidentally bumps up a wall and he pokes a hole in the wall. They're like, oh my god! They think the world's come to an end. How are they going to fix that? And you're like, piece of sheetrock, some tape, and you're back in business. You know they they see it and then they just assume it's a massive thing. It's just like water heaters. For years, I used to have people, they would panic when their water heater was out, and they just assumed it was going to be 1500 2000 or something like that. And we were running around putting in water heaters for like 800 bucks, 900 bucks. But after a while, I realized these people think it's going to cost $1,500 to get this water heater replaced, so we obliged them. So, you know, that way, Kenny could afford a new truck. So... Um, I wrote an article uh, for Ashy one time, and some of the guys were really nervous that they were going to miss it. Because you could go to houses that was completely in the wall. It was completely covered up. You couldn't see it anywhere. And what I pointed out was you could open up the wall under a washing machine box. A lot of times you can take the trim off. And there was a little area that would be under the trim. You could cut it there, and you can look in the wall, and you would see that connection under the hose, the hose connection for the for the wash machine box, and I've seen houses you didn't see it anywhere. People thought we were hiding it because we knew there was a problem. We were hiding it because it was embarrassing. It looked like crap. My father said he would never do it. I, I went to a meeting when they first started selling polybutylene with my dad, and like I said, my dad was in the business till seventy three years old. Died on a call. He was really into his his trade. And he used to always say, they're taking, they're taking the trade out of the work. He said, it's, it's no longer a craft, it's no longer, you know, he said, some of this stuff is like artwork. You know, you put it in, you do a really good job. You know, it's not the Mona Lisa, but people, you know, you've looked at jobs before and you're like, wow, man, I got really new his stuff. All right, that's what, the way he felt. And I remember <laughs> this guy did this polybutylene meeting and went through the whole thing, fed us, all this stuff. And then guys started raising their hand because they were so excited. Oh, this is going to be great. We're going to make a million dollars. You know, and, they were going to... and my dad raised his hand and he says, the only way I'm ever going to use this stuff is if the sheetrock guy is standing behind me. Behind me, he said, I want him to cover it up as fast as I get it in because I don't want him to see this crap. He said that's in a room full of plumber and they applauded him. A bunch of the old guys applauded him, you know, because they had gone through the profession. They had trained and all like that. So, like I said, so when you would see it in the wall, like you didn't see a stub out coming out with polybutylene, you figured that when they hit it. No, you made copper come out of the wall because it looked better. You could use a solder valve. You could use a chrome escutcheon. Instead of that crap coming out of the wall, it was all limp hanging down and stuff like that. We didn't want that. So that's when you see it, don't just assume the guy was hiding it. Because he was not. Uh, if you look at this um, down... Under the do not, it talks about not using it for recirc lines. You know, they knew circulating water through this constantly, it would be a problem. So when the lawsuits came out, a lot of guys would find a house, a lot of guys would find a house that had what we call an Apollo system. I don't know if you guys see them. They're combo systems where they have a water heater and the water heater heats the house. They, they were built to compete with heat pumps. And they actually put out better or hotter air than heat pumps, but the problem was you could come in at the end of the day and everybody hop in the shower and when they got out, you had a cold water heater. You had cold air blowing out of that 
that little heater for a while. It took a little time to come back. But anyway, they made the connections with polybutylene, a lot of them, and the, and the Coxby shell suit wouldn't pay for that, to replace that. So you might have your whole house repiped, but they wouldn't pay for the research line. You know, and that could add another several hundred dollars easily to the job because they said, no, we're not paying for that. You weren't supposed to do that to start out with. <laughs> you weren't supposed to, and that was true. You definitely weren't supposed to. Uh, there's a few fittings that are floating around out here that are uh, pretty cool. This, this fitting here, uh, you could almost tighten that sucker up with your hands sometimes and it would, it would work. But what it would do is if it was on a hot pipe, it would expand and contract and it would actually unscrew itself. So you, you know, tighten it up pretty good. But it was the same, out, the same outside diameter. Hold on. I'm hanging up here on something. There you go. It had the same outside diameter that other pipe has that are considered copper tube size. Copper tube size is, is copper pipe, CPVC, polybutylene, PEX. They're all the same size. So you could transition between those pipes with that fitting. You know, it would, so you would go into a house or somebody would make a, a splice sometime just in a line. They would cut it, a section out and they would splice a piece of PEX in there. Or they would, or a piece of CPVC with, with that particular with that particular fitting. So you still see a bunch of them out here, there, um, and some companies still sell them. You know, there there's a company in our area called uh, Comet Plumbing. They they're a supply a small supply house. They actually um, they have a source because they've got old polybutylene fittings still out there in the rings. So somehow or another, they got a source. So they must be using it somewhere. Probably Puerto Rico. <laughs> the reason I say that is one time I called the manufacturer that made that ball cock, the brown ball cock I showed you earlier. I called them and said, do you guys make these anymore? Oh, yeah, yeah, we still make them, but we don't sell them in the United States. In Canada, I said, where do you sell them? He says, we sell them to Puerto Rico. And I said, well, what have they ever done to you? <laughs> I was like, really, poor Puerto Rico, <laughs> you know? And anyway, they still make some stuff, you know, you just you just assume it's going. It's like for years, people would say, oh, that's outlawed. Wasn't outlawed in the code. It was still in the code, but nobody was going to use it. They never accepted, they never, you know, come out and said, yeah, that, that pipe's a problem. But they just agreed to pay for stuff. The Coxby Shell, the Shell is Shell Oil Company. So they only hurt for a couple of hours, and then they were, they were good. You know, but that, that's what a lot of people used to sell us. I mean, I'll go into Home Depot and they'd have the little plumbing expert in the corner here. That's outlawed. You got to use that anymore. No, it ain't. We're an outlaw. Eventually it dropped off the code. Nobody was using it. Nobody was that stupid. You know, but because it wasn't outlawed every now and then you see a house piped in it after 90, after 95, because the Coxby shell thing ran out, there was, there was no chance in the world you were going to get any, anything for it. If you got a leak, the transition, you can splice PEX in there. That's PEX. Uh, tell me what you see in that connector. Connector there. Something that's real obvious. See the rings? One's brass or one's copper and one's black. The copper ring is made for the polybutylene side. The fitting, fitting itself, the fitting itself is made for the, or excuse me, the rings are, are uh, the fitting itself was made, you know, let's say the T, that would be made for PEX. You couldn't use that T in polybutylene. PEX and polybutylene are, are not the same inside dimensions. So if you see a splice and the guy's got See if I can point this out real clear. I used to have an image, and I can't find it. All right, polybutylene's got the copper ring. PEX has got the black ring. And the adapter in between there is two different sizes. You, you almost can't see it. It's that close. But if you see somebody splice between the two, you should have a copper ring and a black ring. Or some of the rings are now, I noticed, the newer ones, will just say PEX on it. But it, they're different. 
They're not the same size. They won't, if you, you know, you might get away with transitioning a little while, holding it up, but it's not made for that. So the transition, that fitting is two different sizes. It's a little bit bigger than the other. PEX is thicker. So the inside dimension is smaller. PEX is definitely thicker. So anyway, that, you know, you see that stuff out here. Uh, again, it's been out a long time. No doubt chlorine had to be a problem. Um, I haven't heard of anything that's paying for it anymore. But again, 40 years, you know, what do you, what do you expect? And if, and if they had city water, I didn't get that worked up about it. Anymore. I mean, well water, I didn't get worked up about much about it. All right. What's the problem? Can you, can you pick up on anything? Damn, this thing is getting close. This is one of those things that even HVAC guys get messed up on all the time. They got an open vent between the coil and the trap. Here's the coil. Here's the trap. Here's an open vent. I don't know what they were trying to achieve here. It's stupid. But anyway, it was there. They got, a, they got a primary and secondary drain tied together. Why don't you just put a plug in one of them? I mean, it's kind of stupid when you're going to tie them together. It doesn't do anything. But when this unit is running, it will not drain. The whole time it's running, it won't drain because it's pulling air in through this vent pipe. The air is going backwards, up, and back into the coil. It's literally holding the water back. Literally holding the water back going backward. I got a unit in my school, we got a plexiglass on it. You can see it going backward. It's going sh 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 sh. As soon as it cuts off, whoosh, water flows out of there. I can walk up and take a cap like it's on here, stick it on that pipe and it'll start draining immediately. If it's in the negative side of the system, you know open pipes between it, and there's really no need for one. There's no need for a vent on that side. Most units, there's no need for a vent probably at all. Most of them will drain fine. A, a, a unit where it's on the blow through side, there, by the way, I wrote an article for ASHE called Let's Concentrate on Condensate. And you got a draw through side, that's a draw through side because it's a negative side, and you got a blow through side. Everything will drain on a blow through side. It's like somebody putting an air compressor against it and pushing the water out. It's going to drain. But on the, on the negative side, you've got to have a trap. That's not my favorite trap, by the way, but they, they used a running trap. I would rather have a standing like P trap, but they use that because of a height issue that they had there. Any, any lower than that, people would bolt their head on it. it was, that's hanging from a garage ceiling. You see that? A little, a little bit different. So anyway, no open vent. You do not have to have a glued cap on that. It just, just stick a cap on it. They came in, uh, there's a company that maintains the heating and cooling systems in, in the building I have my school. They went and inspected my unit, and two days later, I walked in the office, and there was water all over the floor. Some of the ceiling tiles were wet. I stuck my head up over, and they had pulled the cap off of the unit that had been on there previously, and the unit didn't drain. It was really hot. It produced a lot of humidity, and it ran over and dropped two ceiling tiles on the floor and everything. Hollis? Yeah, so sometimes you'll see um, just somebody's put a piece of tape over that thing, and that, that would be the reason for that. Yeah, that's exactly why. And the tape doesn't hold up very long. Yeah, but I, I was wondering, asking, I want to ask about that trap. If that pipe is under positive pressure, do, do you need the trap? And whether you need it or not, is it required? A lot of them, they go, typically what you'll see is the code authorities will say, install according to manufacturer's instructions. And the manufacturer's instructions will say, it's install, install according to your local codes. So they kind of cross each other. So on a blow through, there, there is a benefit to a trap. When a unit is running on a blow through, if you walk outside and put your hand over the condensate line coming out of the side of the house, you feel air pumping out of that thing. So a trap will fill with water, and that would be like sealing a three quarter inch round hole in the ductwork. You don't lose that air. But will it drain? I've never seen one that wouldn't drain. It'll definitely blow through. So the importance of the trap on a blow through is energy related. 
say energy related because it it's losing some air. It's not, like I said, I always tell somebody, drill a three quarter inch hole in your ductwork, and that's basically the same thing. We like a really tight system. But I, I will tell you this on a blow through, what's a blow through mostly? A gas furnace, oil furnace, coil sitting on top of it. Walk outside and put your hand on it in the middle of the winter time. It's got hot air blowing out of it because the trap's dry. The trap will dry now. So, you, you know, you, if you were really an energy saving guy, you'd figure out a way to shut that thing off in the winter time because that's air you could put in the house. You know, but that, that's the importance of it in the winter. In the summer, critical. I mean, uh, on a draw through summertime, you got to have a trap. I usually see them with no trap. I usually see them with an open vent. And then every now and then they'll come out of the secondary drain with a fitting and an elbow and turn it down to the to the emergency pan. So stupid. It literally is blowing or sucking in air from, in most cases, the attic or a utility room through that pipe because that secondary drain is just another hole right next to the first hole. So it's sucking in air. So you're sucking in air out of an attic, 135 degree air out of an attic pumping it into your system. And if it did overflow, why would you want it to run in the emergency pan? The emergency pan should never, ever, ever have water in it except in an emergency. And if, you, if, you, if they tie it in such a way that it'll go in there and they got to at least put another drain on that, it's just one, one part of the system that doesn't need to have, doesn't need to have water going to it. So I don't pump them that way. I would take the secondary drain, put a float switch in it. It's not required that way. If, if you put a pan under the unit and the primary drain, you're good to go. They basically, it's two ways to drain it or, and a way to keep it from overflowing. Some localities will even let you just put, well, let's say an upflow furnace. Upflow furnace, you set a coil on top of it. You have a primary drain. It's hard to get a secondary drain on them. It's kind of congested up there. Some, a lot of guys will just put a float switch in there. That's good. you got a primary drain draining it. If it doesn't work, it gets clogged up the float switch will cut it off. And that's really good on an upflow because the upflow coil, you know, the coil on, on an upflow, if, it, if that evaporator overflows, it runs all down into the furnace, runs on the heat exchanger, everything. So I always look for two ways to make sure that that water doesn't get, you know, into the ceiling. I, I look for two ways to make sure it doesn't, doesn't get to the ceiling. So I thought you were getting ready to dance or something over there. Um, open vent before the trap, primary, secondary drain tied together, and a running trap. Again, a running trap. The, the depth of the trap has a lot to do with the duct system. How much negative pressure are we going to pull on that, you know, in that evaporator area from the fan has a lot to do with how big the return duct is. How many returns are connected to it? How 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 good is the the filter? You got a MERV four filter in there, and it's not gonna it's not much to it. If you got a MERV eight filter in there, it's gonna create some some suction some some uh, obstruction there in the suction side because it's a much thicker uh, much thicker filter. The coil gets dirty, negative negative pressure in there as well. So. I'll see guys, they try to explain to me exactly, try to explain to me exactly how deep the trap needs to be and all like that. I'm telling you, and unless you know the static pressure and stuff like that, you, you know, you can do manufacturer's recommendations, but sometimes you can get away with less. Just depends on the duct system. One of the problems we have in duct systems, and I didn't put it in this presentation, but one of the problems we have with duct systems today is people will come in and they'll say, I want to filter my air really good, so they'll get a high MERV rated filter. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar, MERV ratings go from one to 16. Once you start getting above 11, you're getting, in, a lot of times you're getting in standalone units. But when you're like in the eight, nine, 10, stuff like that, it's probably pretty restrictive. So you're gonna build up a lot of resistance. And a lot of times you're starving the system for air. A, a, if a guy's going to add a new filter to a system like that, an HVAC guy can come in with a hood and check the outlets and everything and tell you, yeah, you, you can do this, but you're going to need to put another, like a 12 by 12 return or something somewhere else. 
to get the, you want the right amount of air. People just don't think about that. They don't realize that when they put a restricted filter on there, it's going to starve the system a little bit of air. So it's just, you know, it is what it is. So that system's pulling this way. That's where the fan is in the middle. You, you, some of the heat, this is mainly heat pumps that you'll see this on. Some of your heat pumps are moving the fan a little bit, so it is a blow through. But the majority that I still see out here are draw through. So negative pressure all that. Uh, I got a video on here where I actually, I've done this in Kentucky for, for a group. We brought the unit in and set it up and we played with it. And I've done it. Uh, I, think, I don't know if I did it for you, Hollis, but I know I did it recently. Uh, oh, I know what I was in. I was in Maryland. I used to do some seminars up there on my own. And I did one. I got a bunch of the Maryland inspectors up there standing around one. We were, again, playing with the, playing with the unit. And it, it's, it's amazing, you know, when you see the difference. I, I tell you a, a thing that you can tell you got negative pressure pulling on the coil. If you're standing outside looking at the condensing unit or the, if it's a heat pump, you're looking at the outdoor unit and you see the two condensate lines a lot of times are coming out of the wall. When that outdoor unit shuts off, sometimes you'll be standing there and it goes, shuts right off. Look at the condensate line. If you see water come gushing out of it, it's, it's holding water back in the system. And all of a sudden when it shuts off, it releases it. That's why it doesn't overflow all the time. Some days it only runs for a few minutes and then it cuts off because it, it's a, a mild day. It's those 95 degree days and stuff that the unit is hammering away trying to, trying to do the job that is when they run over. But that's like everything. You know, I always got service calls on the hottest day of the year, you know. And then, you know, same thing with the coldest day of the year, air conditioning. So that's just kind of the way it is. So that's uh, this is Carson Dunlap uh, image in their, in, their, in their system. And you can see it, it's in the negative side of the system. It's in the negative side of the system. It, it, it's got to be trapped. Got to be trapped. And the secondary drain needs to be plugged or it needs to have a it's trapped and be installed just like the first line or it can have a float switch in it. You treat the secondary drain like you would, you know, don't, don't let it stay open. People figure that it'll drain better. If the water gets up that high, it'll drain better. It's, it's sucking backwards on that too. You know, it's doing the same thing. All right, how about this one? See, the, see what the issue is with the trap? See what the issue is with the unit itself? I hear talking, but I don't. guys, that that's an easy trap. I love those traps. Here's an ad for easy traps. You can see in the trap when you got crap in the trap. You know, uh, they give you the brush, to clean it out, put that puppy in there, and it knocks it right out. The float switch is on the wrong side of the trap in this picture. If you look at it, if the trap the easy traps installed backwards. What you got to have is the float needs to be on the other side. So when you get a blockage in the trap, the water from the unit goes and tries to go in the trap, can't get through the trap, it backs up and pushes the float switch off. The way it's installed the other way, the trap is more prone to blocking anyway. So the trap will be completely blocked. It can be completely blocked, not affect the float switch at all and you're going to have a flood now this one luckily was in the garage it's hard to see here but there was actually below my hand below that hand there was actually a a light a lens from a, a fancy car that was parked in this garage i was working on that job um i was working on the toilet and i walked into the garage and saw that out of the corner of my eye and turned like i said you know you do the trade you see stuff and i caught it out of the corner of my eye and walked over there and realized it was backwards. And I went in, got, I went out and got a camera. Back then, that was a camera. That wasn't my phone. Uh, it had a floppy disk in the camera, and it would hold four shots, you know. But I could at least take it and put it in the laptop and take the pictures off of it. I didn't have to take it to the, the photo mat. But anyway, I took that picture. I remember my dad saying, what are you doing? So I just taking a picture of this. Why? I said, it's wrong. I said, I need it for my sessions and stuff. Oh, man. He got, he got as annoyed by me taking pictures as I get annoyed by helpers on their phone all day long. You're looking over there and the guys, I, I drove all the way to Orlando with a guy that was going to help me out. I think we said six words all the way from Virginia Beach to Orlando. And I think one of them was, do you see my phone? 
in this picture, if the um, float is removed, is the clean out still on the wrong side of the trap? If, if you on only that, have on that particular one, one um, I mean, they got it. See that clean out in the middle of the T? They got its own clean out on this one. They actually, when they make that, they actually have a cap for the top of it. If you have, um, by the way, this is a blow through. This is a blow through. This this was blowing down into the into the crawl space, so it is blow through. But you could you would put the the clean out on the outlet side of the trap um, if it was if it was draw through. In other words, the water you couldn't have a trap between. I mean, excuse me. You couldn't have a vent between in here if this was draw through because it would suck air through that. Uh, these these can be bought with the, the float or without the float. Now I have one on mine. The floats over here, and we put the trap on right. The floats over here. Like I said, it's got a clean out here, and actually has a clean out on top. So over, but again, it's over here. And I was doing one of my sessions. I I was gone for weeks, and um, when I when I walked into the house, I lived with my disabled mother and brother and I walked into the house it was like 85 degrees in the house I said what is going on my my brother said well it's been real hot here I just figured the system can't handle it I said the system can handle it I said and if it can't I'm going to a hotel tonight I ain't staying in 85 degree weather but it was you know it was it wasn't that crazy hot outside I walked outside and I looked at the unit and it ran for a minute or two and it shut off and it hadn't cooled down the house it was still really hot in the house what had happened was debris in the trap the, remember my floats over here the debris in the trap would push the float up and it would cut off and then the, the debris wasn't a complete blockage a little bit of water would seep by and the unit would come back on and run for a couple minutes and fill that little bit back up and it would cut back off. They've been doing that for days. They've been sitting in an 85 degree house, you know, but I it would just fill up enough to push the float that's on the, again, installed properly and it would, it would shut the unit off. So that's, that's kind of a weird thing to have happen like that, but it, but I happened to catch it, happened to catch it right when it did it. So I was able, all I did was grab the, the brush and Pushed the little brush in there a few times and it boom, took off and I didn't have to get a hotel that night. We'd been on the road three weeks. My daughter used to travel with me. Some of you might have seen my daughter at Ashy Convention or something. We used to travel around and we did a big session down in Atlanta for several days. And when we walked out, my daughter said, well, where are you headed to next? I said, I'm going to Seattle. I said, I've already got a ticket and I'm flying out there. And, oh, I wish I could go to Seattle. I said, you want to go? She said, yeah. So we drove. We left Atlanta and drove to Seattle. And when we got finished and we were there about a week later, we did a session. Got finished in Seattle. We drove to LA. And when the trip was over with, we'd been on the road three weeks, stayed in like 18 hotels, and every bit of money I made on the trips, we had to spend getting to the next one. But we got to see the country. You know, we, did. we drove three weeks, we drove all over the country, man. It was it was pretty cool. This is a this is one of those things too that drives me nuts. You'll see a condensate pump and you'll see these thermostat wires sticking out of it and they're not being used. A condensate pump has a float switch built into it. And if the system fails, the float switch, if it's installed properly, will shut the unit off. But you can see there's no wires going to it. It's just wires hanging out of the unit. That's in the code now. A couple code cycles back, they actually said to put that in this in the system what i always do is i connect it to the outdoor unit so that if the floats if the if the pump's not working something's clogged up and it fills up the condensate reservoir it'll shut the outdoor unit off what will happen is they'll notice they're not getting cool they'll call uh, in many cases if the fan's still running you can talk them into letting you come the next day so I, didn't have, I don't have to get out of bed at midnight and go to that house because the fans run in the house, circulating the air. But if everything shuts off, they want you there right now. 
But a lot of times you can just shut the outdoor unit off. You can shut anything you want off with it. It's just a, it's just literally a switch. It's activated by the water. But if you see these wires, and then one of them is plugged into the wall, and there's other wires that is a float switch. You can actually have it set up. You get wired into an alarm system. Water gets up too high, it turns on the alarm. Most people just turn off part of the equipment, and that'll you know that'll do the job. So float switch not installed. Again, we're talking about a condensate pump. Number 13. How many of you see this? Raise your hand, everybody. You all see it. <laughs> we all seen it. Probably not as much as we used to. We, we figured out what was causing it. Somebody out here shout what's causing it. Hollis. I heard Hollis. Did anybody else say ultraviolet light? I only heard Hollis. Hollis, I'd give you a prize, but I don't have one. And I just mumbled. And he just mumbled. He's only, I hate to have to tell you, I can't, I can't see some of you and I can barely hear you. But anyway, UV, the UV light, the ultraviolet light, coming in through a vent or something, broke down that plastic. And sometimes the system would be perfectly cool until the people had a... a an attic fan installed. They get an attic fan installed, and right below the attic fan would be some ductwork. The light would come in and disintegrate the the wrap. The worst I ever saw this. It was a it was a massive house, and the third floor was unfinished. And at some point, they would finish it. And it would be big, huge, beautiful floor, but it was used as an attic at that point. It had dormers. It was lit up like daylight in this third floor. You walk into the, you walk into the space, you're like, wow, why is it lit up? I walked in there and it looked like a whole bunch of dryer hoses everywhere. All the insulation had fallen off everything. People hadn't even gone up in their attic. They just said it wasn't cooling as well. Well, it was because the wrap comes off and that's holding the, the fiberglass. The fiberglass would just unfold. It was, it just looked like clear dryer hoses everywhere you know run to everything so all that they got all that heat gain from that attic all the heat gain went in there but uh if you see that i know uh one of the inspectors in our area did a report on it for, i think for the reporter one time that that's kind of interesting um you guys get right many boilers don't you or do you okay you, you know there's parts of the country you go to they don't they don't know what a boiler is you know they don't, they don't know what the country is. Go ahead. Kenny, we got a question from back on the uh, condensate pump oh. about cleaning those. Should they be cleaned with, yeah, with, with chlorine? Yeah, they can get pretty dirty. How often? With chlorine? Um, normally, if you've got somebody coming out of the house, they're supposed to clean it when they come out, you know, for spring. Yeah, I know. But, you know, recommend it. I mean, we put a lot of recommendations in our report, you know, at least before the season at least before the season, but I mean, it, it can, you know, it's just dropping in there. It gets crap in there, everything. Another question over here. Uh, could you talk a little bit about working now on R22 systems? Okay. You got one you want me to work on? No, but I, I mean, down, down where I am, All right, I tell you major what. companies won't work on them and they'll yeah. tell you it's illegal and you must replace your systems. Yeah, they're all lying. And there's uh, lots of freons that'll merge in that are a lot cheaper, yes? All right, here's, here's the deal. He's, he wants me to talk about R22 and R410A. Those are the two. Refer now, they are not interchangeable. When they say we're substituting R22 systems for R410A system, they didn't mean we we're going to put R410A in the R22 system. The equipment that was once comfort cooling equipment that used R22 was being replaced by comfort cooling equipment that uses R410A. It's not interchangeable. Okay, the refrigerant's not interchangeable. Some guys will tell you, you've got a leak in the system and I can't top it off with R22. The, the requirement is that you can't top it off, I, I think it's the EPA thing, but you can't top it off if the system holds 50 pounds or more. That's commercial equipment. If you got a house that has 50 pounds of R22 in it, you live in a motel. 
You know, that's, it's just not that happened that way. They can top it off. Now, is it practical? Is it practical? You know, if you've got a really bad leak and you're always having to go out there and do stuff like that, it's obviously not practical. That stuff is expensive now. I used to buy a 30-pound can of R22 for $33. You know, we played with the stuff. We would turn the can over and go, look at this. You know, we thought that was hilarious. You know, but that... You, you, what you're supposed to be getting now is supposed to be recycled. You know, we're, we stopped the manufacturer of that. Um, but there are what they call drop-in re replacements. You can take the R22 out of the system and use another refrigerant in that system. Aren't there several other... There's several other ones, MO99 and different things like that. So you can take it out. Uh, I know guys do it. They're not supposed to. You're not supposed to top it off. You're not supposed to top off R22 with one of the, the drop-ins. It's supposed to be replaced. What you have to do a lot of times, what you have to do a lot of times is you have to take the oil out of some of the, depending on the, depending on the drop-in refrigerant. You would have to take the oil out of the compressor, and then you can convert it over. Because the, 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 some of the drop-in refrigerants can have problems with the oil. But... How many of you know that R410A is getting is, is going through the same process? Okay, can initially, you remember when they first started talking about refrigerant problems? What, do, you, do you guys remember what they talked about it originally? Hole in the ozone. They weren't talking global warming. Hole in the ozone. So the first refrigerants they banned were R12 and 11 and stuff like that, refrigerator and car stuff. That's because it had chlorine in it, and they said it was putting a hole in the ozone. The next, when they started doing other refrigerants, now we're starting to talk about global warming and things like that. The global warming potential of R410A is not as great as the global warming potential of R22. So it's kind of a, you know, you're stepping down. But now we're gonna come up with something better than that. So that's what's gonna be replacing you know, it seems like we just got to the R410A to some people, but it's been around a long time. So is it is it illegal to top it off? No. Uh, I have seen systems where every year I had to put a pound in it. But, you know, that refrigerant is crazy expensive now. Unless you use the old stuff. Yeah, but, but to get, but to, all right, if I could, let's say I came to your house and I said I could put $100 worth of refrigerant in it. Or you, we can convert you to the other stuff. How much will it take me to convert to the other stuff? Uh, we can convert you for $800. And you might do the math and think, yeah, I'll let him just top it off for a while because this system's already 10 years old. It's going to die. So you have to kind of weigh it in. But remember, the, 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 you're not topping off the R22 with something. You take, take the R22 out and put the new stuff in. You put the new stuff in. A lot of times they put something, they, they're really broad when they tell you you can't do or you shouldn't do or something like that. And a lot of times the technicians know, you know, well, I can make, I can do some changes in the system and make it work. R410A is, is not just one refrigerant. R22 is a compound, it's one refrigerant. The R410A is a mix of refrigerants. When we charge our R410A system, R22 system, you'll see a guy sitting there with the, the hose off the top of the can and he's charging it. That's cool. That's the way you charge it. On our R410A system, he turns the can upside down. Because if you leave it upright, the refrigerants, there's two different kinds of refrigerants mixed together. But when you have the can turned upside down, they'll separate. I think they call it fractionation or something. Anyway, it'll separate. One refrigerant will boil off of it and go out of the can quicker if you have it upright because it comes off as a gas. And then you'll have a can with mostly the other refrigerant instead of the mix. By turning it upside down, you kind of keep it mixed up and everything. So a lot of refrigerants that we're using today are blends of other refrigerants. It might have been around for years. Just blends, we figured out how to do it. And I think the goal initially was we can, we can deal with the global warming thing by just making this refrigerant a little less damaging. But it's still, there's still some, something going on but it's just not as damaging. Now they're stepping it down. I, I tell you what, you see words in the description of the refrigerants now that we never saw before. Words like flammable. Some of the new refrigerants, you know, can, will even say this is slightly flammable. Some of the new car stuff. Any of you charged your car recently and gone in there 
and they say, how old is the car? Because the older cars will be using 134, and some of the newer cars use that new one, two, whatever it is. It's a different refrigerant. You know, I think it, I think it started on imports first, but it, you, you actually have two different charging kits now. Again, they don't want you to mix it up. So it'll actually come with a different one. But originally cars were R12, same as your refrigerator. If you get a refrigerator today, it's going to have 134A in it, and the car will have 134. It's, why? What's the, what's the same about both of those? They have to get a lot colder. You know, a refrigerator's got to get colder than an air conditioner. Is that you? That's weird. Anyway, if we're, and, a, and a car air conditioner's got to get colder. What do we look for? 15 to 20 degree temperature drop on an air conditioner? Or, you know, in a house, that's what most of us usually go by, like 15 to 20 degrees. If you drop the air temperature 15 to 20 degrees in your car when you were driving, that wouldn't do the trick. You get in a car, it's 125 degrees. Whew, boy, that 120 degree, you know, 105 degree air feels really good. You know, it's not going to do the same. So you got to, you know, so it's a, it's a different temperature. You put refrigerants in, in separate, in different classes. Comfort cooling, you know, food. There's other things. Uh, industrial processing. Had to do stuff. We had to, things get really cold. Do you, do you have any faith in wheat stock? Shooting the system with wheat stock? I haven't. I've, I've used the chemical, the, the colored stuff in there that you put in there to help find a leak. But I've, you know, sooner or later, leaning leak stop. I think we think of it, leak stop, like the stuff you used to put in a radiator. I think we think of it the same way. There's a whole lot more pressure on it. You know, R410A, it's got, it's got like, you know, it's pushing 400 pounds of pressure on the discharge side. You know, on the on the suck on the on a R22 system, it's like 235 pounds of pressure when they're doing the same jobs. You know, it's a lot more pressure. R14. One of the one of the main things they train you when you do your you you get trained first. You get your EPA card. You know, we all got an EPA card when in the business. I got mine in '93. And then what happened was when they when they came out with R410A. I mean, uh, Carrier had been selling it for a long time. They, or they, they've, so, and used to, you didn't even think about it. it they called theirs Puron. And the carrier was putting it in their equipment. So, so what happens is when they go to train you to learn to do that, they mainly train you on pressure stuff. You're like, oh, you're going to deal with a lot more pressure. You got to deal with a lot hotter pressure, you know, higher pressure and stuff. So you want to, they warn you about things like, yeah, don't leave that damn can sitting in the back of your van right by a window with light shining on it. Cause that can's going to get pressure on it, buddy. So that's the kind of stuff that they keep bigger hoses. Like when you're when you're charging a system daily with R22, you still find old systems and you're charging them. You usually don't use the same set of gauges on your R410A system. You usually the gauges you use on that, it might have some of that 22 locked in the hoses that hasn't got out of the hoses. We switch equipment when we're charging and stuff. A lot of guys don't want anything to touch that was using one over the other because over time it can it can definitely cause you a problem. You know, so so they mix them. Uh, I've got a, a nephew that uh, uh, he works with me quite a bit. He passed his R, he passed his uh, EPA, I think it's 608 test before he got out of high school. And he, he texts me, hey, I passed my, I was blown away. I, I'm teaching HVAC2 at a trade school and some of those guys couldn't get, get through the test. This guy passes it in 12th grade. He passed, I mean, I was like, man. So the other day, I, he worked with me a little bit because he just got a job uh, at an aircraft company, you know, doing stuff for air, aircraft and all. They, they're near the naval shipyard and everything. So, you know, they, it, it's a lot more to it. So, but like I said, that's not how I look at it. When I, when I hear that an HVAC guy said it's illegal for me to put it in there or something like that, you know. There's a there's a few guys out that got some YouTube videos that are real good about that. I think the biggest thing that, that usually stops you from doing it is the price is crazy. Price is absolutely crazy. Um, all right, uh, hard to see in the image here, but this is a boiler that I actually worked on. And the first thing that I noticed when I walked up to the boiler was, got a little closer, no back flow preventer. Uh, the backflow preventer you would typically use on a boiler would go between the, the shutoff valve and the pressure reducing valve. 
that backflow preventer is probably going to be uh, in the industry we call them a 9d watts 9d uh it's a it's a backflow preventer with an intermediate atmospheric vent it has a combination of like check valves and a vent on it and you put it between the hard to see on this image but there is a shutoff will be over here so the backflow preventer then the pressure reducing valve you can't get it backwards if you get it backwards the backflow preventer won't work backflow preventer has to have 25 pounds of pressure on it what is a pressure reducing valve drop the pressure to 12 they you know they might have hand adjust them a little bit you know the pressure is important because the you know get a really tall house you got to run the pressure up to get that get that water up there so uh, the 9d was built mainly for boilers and it was built because it was an economical backflow preventer in other words you didn't have to put one of those real expensive rpzs on there because the guys just wouldn't do it they wouldn't they you know they would they knew that people would be putting in boilers without permits and not doing it if they had to put a 400 dollar backflow preventer on it these are you know less than 100 bucks so that's why they why they use them uh, these are the backflow preventers you're likely to see in a house. The one upper left might be on an irrigation system. We use a lot of those. Um, of course, the, the one down here, you probably won't see it, but it's usually at a meter. It's usually at the water meter. Um, when we started putting those in, uh, we were worried about, and, and I'll talk about it in a few minutes, but we were worried about the water being contaminated in a house and flowing back into the city side. So we use these as basically just two check valves. And it, it should prevent that. Uh, the reduced pressure zone, the one up at the top, you can pretty much use them anywhere you want. But like I said, they're real expensive. And notice they have pet cocks on there. They have to be tested yearly. So, you know, it's good for the guys that install them because we get a hundred dollar or better service call every year out of it, checking them out. So. Um, I wrote an article called Straight Talk on Cross Connections, and I got called by some city down in Florida. They wanted to know if it would be okay to not test them every year. I said, instructions say test them every year. I was like, I could override this. It's amazing what people think once you get something in print. You know, and they just, I said, instructions say every year. Well, we got a lot of people down here on fixed income. I said, well, tell them every other year and they're just going to take a chance. You know, but it, that's it, weird stuff like that happens to you. It, it, sometimes I just wonder. Uh, you see it open to return right next to the water heater. You know, typically we know, you know, return a grill or something maybe 10 feet away from the system. That's usually a good number to go by, but that's right there next to it. It's literally, literally next to it. Here's an open return on a furnace. It's pulling negative pressure on the room, pulling it right in there. And that was that was the installation, you know. And so both both of those are gas appliances, and of course that's not the way that's not the way to do that. So I, I just write them up as an open return, and then in my in my description I would explain more, you know. I uh, I was talking to John Kerrigan a little bit ago. He's, he's the guy that has the software that the company I work with, we use John software. And that would be something we would boilerplate something. Click the button and it would just spit out a whole bunch of stuff. So that's, that's where that kind of stuff came from, you know. But we, we were short and sweet and then we let the computer do the work. That's a garage. No return in the garage. You know, no vents attached to this. The the uh, the house system should be in the garage, okay? You know, a garage is a great place for a mini split. People get out there and they use it like a they use that space out there like a shop. They use it like a family room. Everybody gets out there. Great place for a mini split is in the garage. Anybody recognize these fittings? Yeah, that's. Do you recognize the tubing? That's a line set. For, that's a line set, and they used a line set on an HVAC system. Uh, shark bites top out around 200 pounds, I think it is. And I was in West Virginia a while back. I did a presentation, and I said, you know, that's not going to hold the pressure. 
And one of the guys in the classroom came up to me later on. He says, Kenny, they have some now that'll do it. I said, really? He showed me a picture. He was in the HVAC business too. So sharp bite on a line set, it's not rated for that kind of pressure. And then he showed me that. It's rated for over 800 pounds of pressure. 870, up to 870. So I got one, I bought one. You just so I could have it in the school to show them the difference. A lot more robust, it's a heavier fitting. But that could be a nice thing because there are a lot of HVAC guys out here, they can't braze for nothing. So they could at least use that, you know, and they won't. What's it made out? It's brass, We've got, uh, you know, I don't know what the ring itself is made out of, but does the job. Definitely rated for it. You can buy them in Amazon. You know, but they got them. Of course, we know you can buy them in Amazon because that's why so much of this stuff ends up in the field. You know, whether it should or not. Uh, I wanted to show you something. Sharp bites are, are, you know, they've been around a while. We all know about sharp bites. There was actually a fitting before that. Uh, I remember years ago, Delta had a fitting out called a grabber. Grabbers. And as quick as they came on the market, they went away. And uh, they were mostly plastic, but they did essentially the same thing. You couldn't release them, though. You know, you can release a sharp bite. You know, guys will go buy that little tool for the sharp bite, and they put it around the line, they pull it. Uh, a talon will do the same thing. You buy the talons, you nail the pipe up against. You take the talon and just put it on the sharp bite and pull it down to the sharp bite to release the sharp bite. But this fitting here, you couldn't release it. And they were out there for a while and then they started failing and no trace of them after that. You just don't see them anymore. But I happened to find an article and it, it talked about the grabber fittings. So it's a very, very similar fitting. They, you know, give it a try for a while. Um, I put on here missing expansion tank. I don't even know if that guy had to have one, but generally we see we generally see an expansion tank today on there. Of course, you can see the, the TPR valve, the vent pipe is a little short. Obviously, that, that could be an issue there. But I put that on there because I wanted to talk about this. Um, mentioned a while ago, we're concerned with pollution from your house getting back into the drinking water. You got, the, you got a system like this tied into the municipal system and somebody has a contamination take place in one of the houses you know, it could end up in the drinking water. As a matter of fact, the vast majority of contamination happens that way. A, a, a business or something and it flows back. Uh, in Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, North, places like that, just about all the commercial buildings are gonna have backflow devices on there. They gotta be checked annually. It's a big deal. They'll shut your water off. If you don't, if you don't get that report into them annually, they'll shut it off. But the, what they started doing on residential was putting a check valve at the meter. And initially I, was, I wasn't finding a lot on it, but now you can almost always uh, talk about meter program and, and you just, and it, just Google it and you'll start getting different cities. And what they're doing is they're putting like a, a door hanger or a postcard go to you that says, hey, we're gonna come out on this date. We're gonna, we're gonna replace your meter with a meter that we can check electronically. They're not, they're not really talking about the check valve that's going in there. I don't think they want you to know because what they're, what they, the, the check valve is to stop the water from going backwards. The meter might be able to be digitally read. That's fine. Or, you know, they go through neighborhoods and read them. But what they're, what they're concerned with is the cross connection contamination or the contamination, backflow contamination coming from the house. So what, uh, they'll put in there, if you read the fine print a lot of times, it'll say, after we do this, if you notice your water heater drips on the floor, contact a plumber immediately. Or if you notice your water heater drips on the floor, contact this number and they'll come out and fix it for $135. And what do they do? They put an expansion tank on the heater. That's why we put expansion tanks on water heaters. You know, I got interviewed one time by somebody at Popular Mechanics or something, and I told him, I said, once plumbing got beyond hot on the left and cold on the right and drains don't flow uphill and we don't usually say drains, once I got into that, I started I said, the, the, the book changed. I said, every time we change a little thing in plumbing, it affects something else. Every time. I said, we worried, we're, worried about, we're worried about scalding. We lower the temperature of the water to prevent scalding, and the incidence of Legionella goes up. 
every time we change something, something else happens. Ken, Kenny, that's hot on the left, cold on the right, and don't chew your fingernails. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, and if somebody asked me, and it's payday on Friday, right? I don't know. When I was in the plumbing business, some days I felt like I wasn't getting paid. You know, that's the problem with owning your own business. All right, um, thermal expansion. If a, if a water heater is connected to a city system and it heats up, it can go back to the main line. There's some movement, you know, the water, the, you can't compress water, but it can move backwards into that main line. There's expansion tanks on it somewhere, you know, so it can, you can do that. But when you put the check valve in, you put that at the meter, now what happens is you've got a closed loop. Water heater heats up, it tries to exert pressure on the tank. TBR valve drips. You guys are pointing, that was the slide. <laughs> I think somebody thought somebody was breaking wind. <laughs> we gotta hear that again. <laughs> it's pressure exerting on the tank. I've never had anybody take it for that, but I saw a bunch of eyes light up and pointing. <laughs> we'll know in a minute. So anyway, the expansion tank on the top will do the job. Now, there are other devices, but the most widely accepted way to deal with that is the expansion tank, okay? They have a ball cock that'll drip into a toilet. They have actually a pressure valve that you can put on the system. And they have, they have the valves that go on the water heater, the shutoff valve, the ball valve with a relief port on it. So you can put a piece of plastic hose on it. But the, the tank by far is the number one thing, so. That's why we, if you're wondering why all of a sudden we started putting tanks on there, that's why. Guys, I'll tell you, they were worried. I'll tell you when a lot of the changes took place. It took place after 9-11. They got to worry, and I think that somebody might move into a house and do something to people. It would, it's an easy enough job. You know, you could certainly do it. So they were jamming. We were putting in pressure tanks and all kinds of stuff. And uh, if, you, if you read the trade magazines back then, you knew something was up. All right, I just said it a minute ago, hot on the left, cold on the right. I see that every now and then I say, what is the defect? And people will say, a cross connection. Right. No, it's, <laughs> it, it's hot and cold reversed. It's a scald hazard, okay? It's a scald hazard. The, the code is, is pretty clear. I mean, everybody's gotta worry about it, the average everyday people, but certain people have to worry about it more. You know, you worry about burning a child. An older person can certainly get hurt. Now that I'm an older person, I know, you know? And, and that little girl on the right there, that's my daughter. Um, that's an old picture. Kristen's 40 now, so they grow up real fast. But she could actually not feel the hot water on her legs if it was scalding water. She wouldn't feel it on her legs. She, when she was a child, she nuked a hot dog one time on a paper plate and then sat down. She sat down and put the paper plate in her, on her legs lap lap and wheeled over to the table and when she lifted it up she was eating the hot dog and looked down and she had a burn all the way across her leg the hot dog had burned through the paper all right so we came up well, actually not too far from here we used to go to ai dupont and uh in delaware so we go to dupont we go to dupont for a surgery she's going to get and the the caseworker come down, comes out of the room and she looks at my daughter's legs and without blinking said nuked a hot dog didn't you it's a big thing. I mean, it happens all the time. So if you got a water filling full of scalding hot water and one of these kids climb in it, you know, so we, we got to look out for stuff like that. We've got to look out for stuff like that. So the uh, standards say conventional stuff, we got it hot on the left, cold on the right. If it's got a dial on it, you kind of dial it in. You know, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, I used to see jetted tubs where they would do it backwards so that they would walk up to the back of the tub and turn the hot water and all. It's facing the spout. Hot on the, cold, hot on the uh, left, cold on the right, when you're facing the spout is, is the way it goes. And I just mentioned a minute ago, well, we're, we're trying to do things to eliminate scald. And the number one thing we were doing was lowering the temperature. When we lowered the temperature, Legionella went up. So Legionella goes up, you know, the issues of that. Um, I'm in the state right now where it probably got its disease, the, the disease name, Legionnaire's disease. I said I was in the state, not the Commonwealth. By the way, we're a Commonwealth too, from Virginia. Virginia's a Commonwealth. Pennsylvania's a Commonwealth. 
Who knows the other two? No. Nope. Massachusetts, Kentucky. And I have no idea what the meaning is, why it's any different than a state. I still pay taxes. You know, if they didn't pay taxes, I'd say we don't have to pay taxes, but no, that ain't it. But anyway, what happened was it happened here. In this hotel, Legionnaires Convention, 17, uh, 1776, it was a long time. 1976, a bunch of the attendees, American Legion people got, got sick and they, and they realized it was, you know, something coming from that, they, they thought it was in the hotel. Uh, they, knew, they pretty well thought of that. And the people got, you know, people were getting sick. Some people died. And they were, it took them a little while to kind of narrow it down. And a few people that weren't in the hotel, the people that died were typically older people, but American Legion people, a lot of them are older. But what happened was they, it came from the HVAC system. I've heard different things, but the, the one that I heard that seems the most likely is it came from a cooling tower outside near the building because you breathe it in as a mist usually. And some people that and some people that got sick also walked the same path, you know. So they walked the same path. So anyway, that's something you got to think about. You know, I know a woman that got it. Uh, they believe she worked at a at a food line uh, grocery store, and I think she got it from the misting that they put on the vegetation, the vegetables and stuff like that, the produce. She got real sick. She didn't die, but it weakened her immune system. That eventually it was something like the flu that killed her. You know, so this guy over here, I bet he knows about. Yeah, the EM, the uh, these guys. Uh, I think they even have a presentation that pops around. If I remember correctly, I saw something like that. So that's that's the thing. I think they breathed it in. It took them a little while to narrow it down, but now we call it, you know, Legionnaires' disease. There's a milder form of it called Pontiac fever. Now I don't know about you guys, but but back in the early '70s, I had Pontiac fever, and it was a whole different thing. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, it has something to do with a car, you know. But anyway, that's like a, a milder thing. Here's something you probably don't think about on a home inspection. It's become a thing. What's the deal? Anybody got a guess? Toilet seat falls. You, this is hard to believe. Young boys, one of the most common causes of genital injury is having the seat slammed down while using the toilet. It only happens once. You know, so, <laughs> oh, I know, and then they have to transition. But no, that's the, that's the thing, and you don't think of that, and I was doing some research. I was actually doing research for this article. <laughs> this article caused so much pro so many problems at ASHE. started out as an article on flanges, and Sandy Brousseau was there. She asked me, could you do a two-parter? We need more content. So I made it into a two-parter. And then it went into, she said, I need a little bit more. And they made it into a three-parter. Then she started getting letters and they were like, what the hell are we doing here? Kenny Hart's writing about toilets every week, you know, or every month. And they couldn't figure out, we're home inspectors. But, you know, they need content <laughs> anywhere. All you got to do is put a string some words together and they'll print it. So anyway, you know, you do some research and you find out that that's a big deal. That happens. Now, I tell you what, you, you, you find it what happens when they put the little dressed out skirt thing on there and all, it kind of pushes away. But you don't think much about it unless you're a, a guy, you know, but you can imagine a child, he's just the right height, like putting it on a cutting block, blue. So that's a thing. That's actually a thing. It happens, it happens every year, so. Only I would have put, right. Um, here's another one. I see this all the time and I'm like, what are they thinking of? Those are line voltage wires. I know why they did it, but they needed to get another guy work on it when they did it. These line voltage wires are coming out of the condenser fan motor. They can take the wires out of the back of the motor and reverse the rotation. That way they can keep one motor on the truck that can do the job of two different motors. So they pull the motor wires out, they reverse the rotation, and they can't get them back in the motor the little housing thing. They can't figure out how to get it back in. So what the hell, let's just let it hang out the top of the unit. Those are line voltage wires exposed to the sunlight and sooner or later, it's going to chafe. And if it, if it doesn't blow a fuse or something, you might light somebody up. They're not going to be happy about that. But like I said, it, it, you know, it happens. Motor wiring exposed. Look, there's another one. Why would they do that? You can reverse the wiring. You can change the motor rotation 
by reversing those wires. You pull them out of a little compartment, you reverse them, and now the motor goes the other way. If, if the question is, why do they do that? Yeah. So one motor can do both jobs. Because sometimes motors are counterclockwise. They turn a fan counterclockwise. Sometimes they need to turn it clockwise. You don't know until you get there. Now, this guy here, he wanted to make sure I noticed on this slide, he wanted to make sure you knew which way to put the blade. He wrote up on every blade. Like if you if you didn't do just one, you had to do all of them. They don't, it's only one blade. But anyway, I see stuff like that sometimes. And I'm just like, really? But he did he he has an arrow on there too. So it shows the rotation of the motor. But see, it's the same thing. He couldn't get the wiring back in the little cabinet, little compartment thing when he pulled it out. It's a little compartment on the side of the motor that the wires go back in. He couldn't figure out how to get it back in. Oh, what the hell? I just put it out here. Well, that's that's dangerous. That's going to turn that thing into a line voltage short at some point. You know, so it's it's got to the somebody needs to come out there that knows how to put the wires back. Is what needs to be done there. They need to take the motor back out and get the wires back in before they stick that thing in there. How about that? We see it all the time. I used to, most of the time when you see this, there's two things wrong. The airflow might be bad, could be a stopped up filter, stuff like that, but it's probably a little bit low on refrigerant. When it's a little bit low on refrigerant, there's a there's a a point there when it's a little bit low on refrigerant, the pressure changes, it goes lower, and the pressure at some point can be low enough that the coil's below freezing. Coil can be below 32 degrees, and as the air flows across there, it gets restricted, it starts to ice up, and it just gets worse from there. So the most guys, when you see them work on that, they'll turn it off and say, you gotta get rid of the ice, and then they'll put some Freon in there, clean up the return or whatever, but that's what that causes. When you tell somebody you're a little low on refrigerant, they look at you like you're stupid because they think more refrigerant makes it colder. It doesn't work that way. It's temperature pressure relationship. Temperature pressure relationship. It does, it, you get, certain pressures have certain temperatures, okay? That coil is usually 40 degrees, something like that in the unit, 40, 41 degrees, something like that. But if it's 32 and the if air goes across there, you know, low, low pressure and it start icing up. Once it gets going, it's done. You know, so that's a ice coil is, you know, definitely a problem if you if you see that. Um, iced evaporator on a heat pump, what do we call it? This is the indoor coil. Remember, we're inside on this one. Now, we do see ice all the way out to the air conditioner sometime. You remember the outdoor unit? You see that? That means that suction line was 32 degrees or less all the way outside. That's really cold. You get, a, you get an air conditioner or a heat pump, running with that line super cold like that, you can actually increase the chance of slugging with refrigerant and stuff like that. I uh, something I see out here in the field, another thing that just, there's a dirty filter. Uh, some things that I see sometimes out here in the field that drives me nuts is people will call the refrigerant coolant. It's not a car, it's not antifreeze. Sometimes it's coolant, but on a heat pump, it's not coolant, it's getting hot. We're running the pressure up, it's not really coolant. And I, another question I get asked all the time, they'll say, well, does it have refrigerant in it or does it have Freon in it? It's the same thing. Well, you know. Freon, Freon is the, it would be like calling facial tissue Kleenex. It's the brand name. DuPont called it Freon. They latched on something really good because we almost all call it the Freon, you know, in the system, but they have different names, different companies, but it's still the same thing. I can't remember the exact, configuration, but it's really like dichloride, dichloride, methane or something like that. I just like saying that, trying, or trying to say it. It's like a, uh, the queen, the queen of Hawaii. I used to, I used to love to answer questions in high school where they'd ask you the queen of Hawaii because I knew how to say Lily Ula Kalani. Say ABS. ABS? Yeah. Not that whole word, no. It's <laughs> the black PVC. That's what some guys call it. It's the, I got the black PVC. No, you don't. <laughs> totally different animal. But look at that thing. These are the kind of things you find in systems that nobody's found for years. You know? All right, who can see it? What's the problem there? This is a big, and this is a big deal. This is a real big deal. The evaporators 
upstream of the heat exchanger. So that means this guy's going to run. It's going to pull air across the evaporator and then blow that cold air over the heat exchanger. In the summertime, that furnace is going to sweat. It's going to be dripping wet. That coil, if you, can, you can tell it's kind of a, we'll use the term improvised. That's another word I like to use, improvised instead of amateur workmanship. Non I, I learned a long time ago, I could tell somebody something was improvised and it didn't upset them. If I said it was non-professional work, the guy sitting at the table with you might have been the guy that did it and he was upset. So you say it's improvised. He's not sure whether you're insulting him or calling him MacGyver. You know, so anyway, air is going through here, across the fan, over the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger is going to sweat because it's not insulated like a like an air handler. So it's going to sweat and you're going to have a sweaty heat exchanger in the summertime. Over time, it's going to crap the system out. It's going to rust it up. It's going to be a pretty bad deal. So that's a, that's a big expense. And they and they actually had to redo the duct system and everything to make that work, but it's really wrong. Anybody, somebody talked to me about this at the break. This line is in an attic and it's tied into a plumbing vent. Now, during the season, you might not notice it because there's going to be some water in the trap. You might not notice it, but there's sewer gases moving up that pipe. With the sewer gases moving up the pipe, a, a week after cooling season, you're going to start sucking in sewer gases through that. If that's a heat pump, you're going to suck in the sewer gases. And you're going to distribute them through the house, through the duct system. You know, So you're going to be blaming your wife, the dog, the kids. And it's because some guy hooked up the air conditioning system and tied it right into a plumbing vent. It'll go to the right place, but it, you need to get it there another way. You need to go through a a floor drain, or you need to go through like down a sink. The difference is those, they will have traps under them and something else will be going on to keep water in the trap. Can you use a sink if you're using a sink to drip in it? Trap, you know, you can use a sink probably daily. You'll keep it prime. A floor drain, now that used to be the same thing. We used to get sewer gas out of the floor drain. What happened, what happened, uh, not too long ago, the, the code the code started requiring trap primers. Trap primers at least keep some water in the trap. You know, because we'd have you'd have a drain in a utility room or something in the floor. The only way it got water in there is if you splashed it on the floor. You know, they used to say, Well, can you mop the floor? And I'm like, You ever been to my house? <laughs> Damn. I mean, I have to pay I have to pay people to come in there and mop the floor, and and, and they're so meticulous they'd never get any water down the drain. So condensate drain into a plumbing vent is a no-no. Big expense here. All right, let me tell you when it happened. The blower came on. The blower came on. I'm not talking about I'm not talking about the inducer. I'm talking about the blower that blows air over the heat exchanger. The blower came on, it blew air over the heat exchanger, and the gas fire came out the door. It's a hole in the heat exchanger, a big hole in the heat exchanger. That's a bad one. Now, a lot of times, you know, it's harder and harder to see uh, see burners today. I know that because they're all closed in. But there has been times, even with just a little bit of flame showing, when the blower comes on, you can see the flame move to the side. And when you turn the blower back off, it straightens back up. So you know there's a hole in the heat exchanger. It's pressurizing the out of the heat exchanger. Air is going into the heat exchanger where the spent fuel is. And it's pushing back on the it's pushing back on the fire. Think about this. I mean, a hole in the heat exchanger is a major expense. It is a safety thing. But a lot of times, if you have a hole in the heat exchanger, the likelihood of the gases getting into the house might be pretty slim because you've got pressure blowing inward. It's not like it's, it's let's put it this way. If you put the heat exchanger in the return, you'd be sucking that gas out of there with a hole in the heat exchanger. You'd be killing everybody in the house. You take the front cover off like that and the blower motor goes on. That's a little exaggerated there from what we would see, but you do see a shift yeah. in the flame. Yeah, you got it's gotta be even... it's gotta be dramatic enough to see it. Uh, but if if you see it, I would if you saw it just move over a little teeny bit when and when again, 
blower, not inducer. It's the blower. The blower usually comes on, what, a couple minutes after the burner comes on, a minute and a half, something like that. And then you notice it. That's a visual indication that there's a hole in the heat exchanger. Now, you really want to check one? I used to do smoke tests, you know, um, gas, you know, search gas, all kinds of stuff. Today, we typically to look for a hole in the heat exchanger. We just run a combustion analysis on it. When you run a combustion analysis on it, you take, you take your readings when the furnace comes on, and then you take your readings when the blower comes on and compare the two. And if you've got like more oxygen and less of this, and that, you can tell something's going on. So what you do is if you, now if you see that, you probably don't have to write it up. They're going to see it in your face, literally in your face. But that, that kind of stuff, that's a major deal. Yeah. Yeah, but anyway, that's, most of them are nowhere near like that. Most of them are nowhere near. There's another thing that can cause that. I had this happen to me. I, uh, the blower was on automatic, or it was on manual, and it was running all the time. It just, you know, I walked up the house and the blower was running, but the furnace weren't on. They hadn't turned the thermostat up. I told my helper, go inside, because they said they were having a problem with the furnace. So they had the blower on because they were trying to get air through the house. He walks inside. I said, you know, turn the furnace on. He turned it to heat. Again, blower's already running. He turns it, turns up the knob to run it up. And I'm sitting there in front of the thing, and I hear it click. And I hear gas coming out, and I'm like, it's not lighting. And it, it was a standing pilot. It didn't light until it got enough enough gas in the in the firebox for it to ignite. And when it did, it singed my eyebrows. And uh, he come walking out and he looked at me, he bust out laughing. He said, what up your eyes? I said, you almost killed me. That's what happened. You know, so another time I was working on a furnace with that guy, it was an oil burner. I was messing with the shutter and it went boom and it shut off like that. And I pulled it back and when I did, the furnace puffed really big. And I said, oh, man. And I leaned over. I said, turn that switch off. He bust out laughing. I had smoke rings around my eyes. Perfectly perfect smoke rings. Now I have them, but they're it's, it's in the blood or something. So hole in the heat exchanger. That's a visual clue. We, you know, Hopefully you got in your report, we don't check heat exchangers. It's not something you can typically check you know, without. But I think you would be negligent if you didn't say, hey, I noticed when the blower comes on, you know, it opens up a grill. You're going to see, you're going to have other things with this. What else are you going to notice? It's scorching. You're going to have wire scorch, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. yeah. I, I only see maybe one or two of those a year because yeah. that furnace has to be at least 35 years old. That, yeah. The yeah. furnace is usually pretty old. But I'll tell you something. There was a report in HVAC manuals a long time ago, magazines a long time ago, that said most heat exchangers have a hole though. They're just not very big. They're small, and, and they don't leak outward because the pressure is usually going inward. But they almost all have something. But when they get big like that, and that's one of our biggest fears. You know, I, I never feared missing a roof, you know, because, I mean, I, I did a good inspection. I tried not to miss a roof, obviously. I feared missing a hole in the heat exchanger, a TPR valve messed up or something like that, things that kill people. I can go to sleep at night knowing that I got to, you know, we got to come up with $8,000 to replace a little roof or something. But I would have a hard time knowing that, you know, I killed somebody, you know, so that, that kind of stuff bothered me. What is this? Anybody see it? Threaded spout. The threaded spout is a potential cross connection. It becomes a cross connection when they put a hose on it. So you can put a, you can put a hose bib vacuum breaker on there. Some people, some people make a spout so you can actually unscrew the threads and put an aerator on it. You know, you just fix it so they can't put a hose on it. That's all. But you can put a hose bit vacuum breaker on there. How about that? Anybody recognize that device? It's a, it's a, it's a pressure vacuum breaker. It's, it's set up on their irrigation system. They got the irrigation system connected to the city water. It has to be upright. It's supposed to be accessible and upright. This thing's laying down if the if the if the crawl space floods and fl first it's not going to break it's not going to open properly because it's laid on its side so it's a improperly installed backflow device you know it's got to be standing up usually we put them in the front yard we usually put them out in the yard put a fake a fake rock over it or something put you know put some bushes in front of it things like that how about that when did they start making clear gas lines <laughs> It's CSST, you got some black iron in there, and then he'd use, he'd use what some people would put on a dishwasher <laughs> for a gas line. It's a, it's a clear vinyl hose. 
He just, he's, there's a gas line. He's got gas going through an appliance through that clear rubber hose. Yeah. <laughs> you see stuff like that sometimes. You're like, damn, what were they thinking? But see, you know who put who does this for us is the flippers. And, you know, you watch a TV show. You can watch one every night. And they say, you can do it. You can do it. You can. Some people can't do it. You know what I mean? And they see a show and it's easy money. Make it sound like yeah, oh, it's easy. Everybody can do this. This woman only does it on weekends, and she's making a million dollars a year. I'm like, I'm like, yeah, you know, she's only killed three people. So anyway, that that kind of stuff. So improper materials used for gas connection. That's one I would probably even tell them. Let me turn this off. I've been in an attic before, and the and the and the vent pipe on the back of the ad on the back of the furnace had set a, um, a rafter on fire, and I turned the furnace off. And it had smoldered. You could tell it had burned and it had smoldered. And I turned it off, and I went down the stairs, and I told him, hey, the furnace has set some of the structure on fire. I said, I turned it off. Well, how are they going to have heat tonight? I said, well, if they leave it on, they're going to have a lot of heat. <laughs> I, said, I, I said, we need to get a hold of the owners. The agents, all they were worried about is closing the deal. But I'm like, this is a, a fire. Fires kill. You know, you have to kind of drive that point home. And, you know, I said, hey, I'm in the HVAC business. I'm not going to leave that on. I said, you know, if I was a home inspector, yeah. <laughs> maybe. You try to, hey, you try to get the agent to do it. That's what we used to do. We used to tell them we don't turn on the water, and, but we would tell the agent, but we got the curb key if you want to do it. <laughs> Let them go out there and turn it off the house, flood it out. She turned it on. I didn't know it. Your curb key, your name all over it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But they'll turn it on. They don't want to come back. They'll turn it on. I would tell them, since we started, since we had cell phones, at least we could call and say, turn it off. You know, we couldn't do that before we had cell phones. You had to run through the house, you know, and get to them. Um, you cannot put the appliance connector through the wall. You know, appliance connector through the wall, a, it's... It's, it's right on the appliance connector not to do it. It could chafe, it could damage it. But this one here, what happened was when they tightened it on the other side, it, it tied that sucker into knots. You know, it was, I think this, when I saw one uh, like this recently, they had, I don't know why they did it, but they had changed from my, it was a furnace room, a little furnace room. And then they, it was like they switched closets with it or something. So, but oh, we can get the gas line, stick it through the wall. So. Anybody see the problem? If you don't see the problem, you got a problem. That's a that's a dryer hose on a gas vent. Is that a little foil type one? What happens is, I think what they see is they see these out in the field, and then they think that they think, well, that's dryer hose. No, that ain't dryer hose. That's a that's actually an approved appliance uh, a vent connector, and some people call them flexible V vent. But it's it's approved. It's right on there. It's approved. It's got like B vent. They got locking joints and stuff like that. It's kind of cool because you can you know you can kind of use it to make that last little connection. Sometimes it's off a little bit, you know. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, and there's easier ways. But you know, some people would would prefer you know prefer to do that. I was, I'm losing power. Where am I losing it from? I just noticed. I just noticed it lit up. It lit up and said, you're losing. Man, this computer did pretty good. It went all through this morning. I ran a battery all morning, apparently. That's pretty good. Most of my computers go out about 15 minutes. Um, I'm going the wrong way. These buttons seem backwards to me. OK, uh, what's the problem? Same thing as the other one. Wrong material. This is a category one furnace and they put category four vending material, PVC pipe. They use PVC pipe. You can tell that got hot. You know, you can really tell that got hot. Sometimes they're not as blatant, but anyway, that's 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 too much. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you guys have seen the new plastic, the ABS and, and PVC now have the, you guys, I can't see this number. Is it 1628 on there? Do you see 1628? 38. That's the newer material that's rated specifically for furnaces and, and appliances, condensing, condensing furnaces and appliances. The old material 
was never rated for this use by the manufacturer of the PVC or the ABS. The, the appliance manufacturer would tell us to use it, but the, you know, the companies that made the plastic said, we never said it was good for that. So they put this on there. It's good for a little bit higher temperature. And so it's coming to an area near you. You're going to, you'll start seeing this. For, it is. Yeah. It's a, I think what I've seen visually seen out there um, in, in one of the supply houses, it'll actually say on the side of it, what it's for that it's rated for. Typically, you know, they just grab some PVC pipe and, you know, glue it up, but you know, we've used them for years, never was approved by the pipe manufacturer. It was approved by the furnace manufacturer. And, and the pipe manufacturer said, well, hey, we don't approve that. They also have a polypropylene one that's out. Polypropylene has like gasketed joints. I think it'll, it'll have the same number. What color is that? It depends on the, uh, on, no, the polypropylene does, it's not like always white and, and black, like this is white and black, you know, but uh, polypropylene, I, I think I've seen some in, in something like some off green and all kinds of stuff. All right, look at this. Excuse me, we're getting a little bit sloppy on using the mics and we're getting some comments from the people out in the uh, okay. interland. So please go to when the microphone we, if you have a question. When are we stopping? Anybody know? 12.15? Did somebody say? Okay, we got an hour. Okay, that's cool. Are you looking for me? Yeah, for the approved PVCs, the whole long list of materials that are approved for that yeah, thing. Right. Yeah. Here it. Anybody? Anybody see what that is? Is it? It's. You, you got PVC transitioning into a metal vent, okay? So when you see that, you know some, something's up. This one here, they've actually, on this one here, they've actually used a, a fern co, you know? So uh, first of all, what is that appliance? Anybody recognize it? Tankless water heater. When you first walk by something like that, you might not catch it, but it, it's obviously it's been replaced. If you if you pay enough attention to it, it's it's a replacement. And a lot of times you're in a neighborhood, you know, well there was a tank water a tank type water heater here earlier, so you'll see that, and it's got a metal vent pipe on it, so that ought to attract your attention because usually usually they have direct vents or they they'll use plastic venting material or something like that. Here's the big thing: inadequate gas supply. It's got a half inch gas line going to a, you know, gas line like that going to a tankless water heater is not going to carry, it's not going to carry enough gas. It's, it's, I mean, the, the heater itself will have a three quarter inch gas line on it. But here's the thing. It, if you look at one of these, you can see the gas line down at the bottom. I mean, I heard somebody say there's no drip leg on it. Well, Look at that appliance connector. I guarantee you it's working like a drip leg. What I would be more concerned with than everything else, you know what I mean? <laughs> it, it ain't good, but it, I'm not worried about stuff getting in there. That crap's down in the bottom of that, that appliance connector. But look at that, guys. That's a typical um, storage tank water heater. Most of them come today with a 40,000 BTU burner on it. Okay, 40,000 BTU burner on it. Um, a tankless water heater, it could be over 200,000 BTUs. You're not going to get that much gas to power that. Now, do you guys have two pound systems here, natural gas, called a two PSI system? Okay. If it was a two PSI system, you can get away with it. Because a two pound system, if the half inch line will absolutely handle the pressure, you're gonna have a regulator there, it'll handle it. But if it's a traditional system, it's not gonna work it. The traditional gas is more of a, a, a volume thing of gas. It's very low pressure. A, a traditional system has one eighth the pressure of a, of a, you know, a two PSI system. Now, that doesn't mean there's that many more times pressure going into the appliance. The pressure going into the appliance is the same, but the line itself has like eight times the pressure 
up to up to the regulator it has the pressure so you can make that work on a on a regular two pound system but uh, on a traditional system you know the white meaner you see the little white thing it, that traditional system's got about seven inches of water column on there uh it probably ain't gonna do the job you know we see we see uh in movies where uh, arnold will run behind an appliance and jerk the line out and it's going that's called movie pressure it's not real gas pressure real gas pressure there's not a pound of pressure on that line not one pound of pressure and it would just sit there and go it wouldn't so we when we see that we think oh man that line's gonna be it, it won't happen that way even a, even a high pressure system in some areas we consider two pound high pressure that's it's still only two pounds of pressure but the way they work is they've increased the pressure from the meter so you can deliver it to where you need to go with a smaller line. Look at that. One eighth inch line. It's going into a house. It's connecting to a water heater and a little gas furnace. And it's big enough because it's got two pounds of pressure on it. When it goes from there to the appliance, right before it goes into the appliances, there's a regulator there that takes the two pounds drops it down and supplies the pressure that's needed for if one appliance is on or both appliances. It, it regulates it. It goes up and down and regulates it, but you can run that smaller line. Now what would be what would be the biggest difference for an installer in running a copper line like that to the far end of the house or running a piece of steel pipe to the end of the house? Labor. I can do that in a couple hours. If I'm cutting and threading pipe, steel pipe, it's gonna take a while. It'll take a while and that's why the two pound system is so popular it's because it saves so much labor and labor is just and labor is just really uh really expensive now there's an article i think it's yes yeah, in the reporter alan carson and i wrote an article together called uh how the bottom line changed gas piping or gas system, something like that. And we were talking about, apparently in Canada, they use a lot of this. Some parts of the United States, we don't use, we don't use copper because the gas can damage the pipe. Other areas, I mean, we use it all over the place. We don't have any problem with natural gas going through copper. Some areas do, it's usually the sulfur content's too high or something like that, but a lot of areas don't, so they, you know, they do that, yeah. Does that copper line go through the wall? Yeah, I thought that wasn't allowed. I thought you always had to take steel through the wall oh, I, or iron. No, he he's sleeved. I don't think you can see it, but it's sleeved. You can sleeve it. John, what were you getting ready to say? I saw you stand up. Yeah, well, I was going to ask because in a utility round, it's copper. Okay, well, if that, that's the thing. If they can't use copper in an area, you know, it, the code is whatever they tell you it is. And then one more thing. You went through some vent stuff. You got slides on all the vents. We're still some of that out there. Uh, I don't have them in this, but I know it. Ultra vents like a semi-transparent type pipe. Some of it's a color, but it, it every now and then, the ultra vent and stuff like that. It was a pipe that was actually uh, recalled. Consumer Product Safety Commission. They recalled it. The joints would come apart. You know, it, I I haven't seen any in years. We see it yeah oh yeah the joints come apart it was yeah it was a plastic pipe i don't i don't have any of that here because then i would have to change the name of the session to 51 defects for you. and i didn't want to change that it took too long oh here you here you go guys there's the regulator see that's copper coming out of the wall now the copper connections on on natural gas have to be made with flares or it has to be brazed you can't solder it this this fitting here he's got a he's got a male adapter brazed to that copper line and then he screws the valve on it. All right, now, so what happens is there's the line, the gas goes into the regulator. The regulator's feeding, so it's receiving two pounds of pressure. But as the appliance, that's a water heater right next to it. There's probably a, probably a furnace nearby. As the appliances come online and need the gas, it'll open up. Now, notice that the regulator doesn't have a vent on it. It doesn't have a hose coming off of it, you know, or a line coming off of it, a lot of them do. These have a thing in the top called vent limiters. If it if it leaks, if what causes a, a regulator to leak, it gets a hole in its diaphragm. It's got like a rubber diaphragm in it. If it gets a hole through that diaphragm, then the gas will come spewing up through it. And if it was a vented regulator, you would smell gas coming out of it. The way these work is they put a vent limiter in there. And the vent limiter 
event limiter will limit the amount of gas that's coming out of it. Probably, you'll probably smell it and know that there's something up, which is the whole point of the smell anyway. And, uh, and but it, it keeps it from just spewing gas everywhere, stuff like that, the vent limiter does it. But it allows them to put a regulator in the house and not have to run another vent line somewhere, or that would have defeated the purpose of having the gas line because now you're having to run two. You know, so that, that's kind of the thing. But if you guys are not using it here, I understand. I understand there's some, there's some areas they just can't use it. Some reasons are because of the gas. Some reasons are because of unions want to make sure that plumbers have to do things a certain way so that you can regulate the trade. You know, you have, there's places in the country where you have to still pour a lid joint to get a plumbing license. Even though you may never pour one in the field, they, you know, they do that. You know, we need, we need help. You know, we will, we, you know, probably give you a license if you can just walk. You know, well, he's upright, except on the weekends, you know, a little off on the weekend. That's a, that's the problem when you're the, when you're a boss. I told somebody the other day, the worst thing about being a boss is you don't have to be the guy's, you don't have to just be the guy's boss. You have to be his daddy half the time. You know, oh, Friday night, I got to go get him out of jail, drunk and disorderly, you know, but he's a hell of a plumber, man. He does a really good work, you know. Works all week long, spends it on the weekend, you know. I know a company that has employees that would blow their money on the weekends, so they set up a, one of their rooms and they started having poker games in it. And they pretty much got all the money back that they had paid their employees for the week before that in these poker games. I thought that's the craziest thing I ever heard. All right, same picture I showed you a minute ago. Look at the, um, the furnace. It's got plastic on it, it's, it's legit. I would have ran that one on the right, the plastic on the right, outside. But you don't have to run it outside, that's an intake. You can bring it, if it, if it don't go to the outside, it's not direct vent. You can't follow the rules of direct vent if that one on the right side doesn't go outside. It's considered a single vented appliance. It's a single wall vented appliance. If it has two pipes on it, but the, the intake doesn't go to the outside. Because it's pulling air out of the building. All right, what's in the air in the building? Maldehydes, chemicals, cleaning, all that stuff. So that goes in with the fire and then kind of mixes it up and it's probably not as good a flame safety wise. All right, so now, now the vent on the other side is, is the discharge, PVC, that's cool. Of course, that should have went outside as well, should have gone outside, but they tied it right in. So they've actually tied it in and what do you usually have next to a furnace? A water heater? That's a Category 4 furnace. What's another name for a Category 4 furnace? Anybody know? Condensing furnace. It's a condensing furnace. You know, that's, that's what you, most of us buy today, is condensing furnaces. It's, it's going to make condensate because it sucks so much heat out of the spent fuel, it ends up in the system. We have to get rid of it. You cannot connect a, a, a Category 4 furnace to any other appliance. It has to be vented independently. And they've tied it right into the water heater. The water heater is a category one. Water heater is a category one appliance. Category one is your, you know, your basic natural draft type appliance. You cannot, category one and category four furnaces vented together is a no-no. That, that furnace is putting pressure that could actually go into the vent and go back around and blow into the water heater. No, no. I, I, let me rephrase that a little bit. Every now and then you'll find an engineered system and they'll have these big, huge manifolds or something you might see it going into, but there's usually other fans and stuff. That's usually like in a big commercial situation. But generally in a house, you should never see that category four going in. The, it basically says no just across the board, but you know, engineers can override some of that and they do put these big systems. I've seen where they've lined up a bunch of category four, um, uh, tankless water heaters, and, they'll, and they will tie them into a massive vent the intake and, 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 and then their uh, air supply. But typically, just go by the rule, category four it has to be vented independently, period. So if it's a condensing furnace, it's tied into something else. No, it's not right. Category, I tell you what confuses people on a category one, the category one venting. Most people get the water heater, the old, the old furnaces, the old gravity furnaces, they know it's a category one, the old draft, you know, natural draft type furnaces. 
a lot of your 80% furnaces that have the little inducer fan on there, they're category one too. That you don't think of it because it's got a fan on it. But that fan just, it's kind of like helping to get the gases through that really tight heat exchanger, but it's not exerting any extra pressure. So, but, so you can you can a lot of times tie a category one water heater and a category one 80 percent furnace a lot of times you do see them tied together they get written up a lot because people see the fan and they assume that's a problem here's what all you got to do is make sure they on the data plate they both say category one if they both say category one you can invent two category ones together there's no problem you just can't fit a, a one and a four four by itself four by itself i'm not sure what they were doing they literally, they didn't, they didn't just trap the line. They put a trap in the line. You know, this line, that line is supposed to be coming back to the, to the blower, do the heat exchange. It's supposed to be coming back to that inducer fan at a slope that if it does make condensate in the line, it will drain back to the furnace. You want condensate on a con condensing furnace to drain back to the furnace. So they got a trap vent. So when your line leaves one and it's hitting to the outside, it's supposed to have a little slope on it to where it goes to the outside, or if it goes straight up, it, you know, it's gonna, if it makes condensate in the line, the condensate will fall down into the furnace. And the furnace is designed to get rid of it. It's got some way to water collects and it'll get rid of it. So what you, you wanna make sure, well, this one here, it ain't gonna run but so long, that trap's gonna fill up with water and it's gonna cut off. The, 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 the motor, the, the, um, uh, the inducer on it's going to have back pressure coming on it, and it'll just shut itself off, shut itself off on safety. And people get a little confused about that because they think, well, it's making condensate. Don't I want to drain the water outside? So they think about, but what would happen if the water drained outside? It would freeze. And if it starts freezing, it'll clog it up, and then it'll shut down. So you drain it back towards the furnace. I had a guy call me uh, on a on an article I wrote one time, and he says his furnace, you know, was having problems. He started telling me. And I said, well, first of all, where are you? He was in Minnesota. And he had a very long line. And at first it was sloped the wrong way. He said, I get ice on the outside. I said, well, it needs to be sloped the other way. So he, he actually did it himself. I don't know what he did, but he sloped it the right way. He said, most of the time it worked all right, but every now and then it didn't. And I said, is it super cold when it doesn't work? And he said, yeah. I said, how long is the line to then on it? It's really long. It just might need to be insulated because you can't have anything get in there. Usually stuff that gets it is, if the line's got a dip in it, it'll get water in it. But I mean, every now and then you do see something crazy like a bird, a bird. I've, I've actually seen somebody pull a bird out of one in the last few sections of the pipe. That bird got in that line and kept going to the furnace. That was a hell of a way to die. But uh, most of the time it's water. You can get up in an attic sometime and you'll see a vent, category four vent going in an incline, going uphill. And you'll notice it's got a dip in it, a strap broke. And they dip in it and come back up. What about the change in size for the piping there, for the vent pipe? It's increased. Yeah, you can go bigger. You could go bigger from the furnace, but you're not going to go smaller. Yeah, well, I'm saying I, all, the, this whole thing is messed up. Okay, this whole thing is messed up. You believe me, a guy that would physically put a plumbing trap, a P trap in the line, he's done more than this. He's, he's probably got a hot neutral reverse too. I just can't see it. Where is that vent pipe discharging into? It's going to the outside. It's not going into a terracotta chimney. No, it was originally. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. It's, I mean, this is this pipe here. Is, it, this particular one goes through behind it, goes out the wall. If it was going into a regular chimney, like a, a terracotta, you know, line chimney or whatever. Of course, the problem with that would be it's going to condense. It's not going to put up enough pressure. You're not going to get the additional draft that, you know, what, remember when the flu, a flu on a conventional, a conventional furnace or a flu on an 80% furnace, you really don't want to change the size because it's counting on the heat to help it draft. Uh, a condensing furnace, you're not really counting on the heat to make it draft. First of all, the heat's not very great. It's low. You're counting on the fan to make it draft. So most people will take a condense, a, a regular furnace or a, a flue and actually just run the PVC through it. You'll see them sticking up out of chimneys. You know, they'll put a nice little cap on it. On a condensing category four furnace, you can do that. You know, you, you can use it, but don't count on the furnace itself. You never would put a, 
a, a Category 4 furnace into a terracotta-type chimney or something like that. You just, just wouldn't do it. i tell you something else we've learned about Category 4 appliances. When you, when you put the intake vent, a lot of times we'll put them high up on the house or something like that, or we'll put them... Uh, we've learned that if you put them near a floodlight, they get full of moss and stuff. The bugs fly around. You know, I mean, techs pick up on stuff. You know, I've, I don't know how many times I've seen them say, you can't do something, or you're not going to have to do something, this will be perfectly fine, and then later on we find out they were wrong. I mean, they used to say you don't have to clean out the, you don't, I think we'll talk about it this afternoon, but you don't have to clean or, or vacuum the vent on a FVIR uh, water heater. It's a little screen, everything is in there. They said, oh, it won't, won't be a problem, it won't drain. It clogs up all the time. And so now, they're, now they've got a whole lesson in their, on their website about cleaning it. You know, but I remember specifically when they were selling these things, they said, hey, well, you won't need to do maintenance, it'll be fine. Weren't fine. It actually gets uh, dryer linen in it, stuff like that. Anyway, this is, this is just a crazy mess of vent pipe. But to put a trap in there, I don't know what he was thinking of. Because that trap's going to fill up with water. The pressure switch on the furnace is going to blow against that water. Back pressure, will, will, the control will tell it to turn off. You know, it's got, they all got boards on them now, boards that tell it what to do. It'll flash the code. It'll tell you the pressure switch kicked it off. And you'll look up there and say, well, it's got a trap in it. No wonder. Somebody asked about this earlier. PVC, ABS tied together. Um, proper transition joint between PVC and ABS. Uh, it's, it's not... The glues are not compatible. Okay, I have seen people try to use, excuse me, try to use um, universal type glue or something like that, the clear kind that's supposed to do it. I, I've never seen it hold up that long. Now they do have this. They do make a PVC transition cement. I haven't seen it in all the codes, but I tell you what, I trust that manufacturer. They make great stuff. I would use that PVC or that transition glue. It's kind of a pea green color. I'd use it in a minute. Would think anything of it, you know, as a as a plumber. Now, before that, I would have probably transitioned with a Noha band or a, a Fernco or something like that if I was going between different products. So, if you tie PVC into galvanized steel, we use a we use a Noha band all the time. Well, have you ever been under a house and had a really old trap underneath a tub? You know, there's a flat bottom trap that they have. We call them North. Uh, Richmond traps. The bottom's real flat. They clog up real easy. They're a pain in the butt. Uh, it got a brass plug in the bottom for cleaning out. In 50 years in plumbing, I've never been able to get one of those plugs out. You know, so we just saw the line off, drop it out of there, put a, a, a no hub band or a fern co on it, and then we put a regular P trap on it. You know, and it's good. That's a good way to transition between it. But when you're doing plastic to plastic, you know, you have to find out what your code allows. Because it doesn't necessarily have code approval, it's still being sold. You can buy it at Lowe's and places like that. I would buy it and I would use it in a minute, especially if it was under a house in an area where if it, if it ever leaked, it wasn't going to flood anything. And, and I've used it and I never had any problem with it. You know, I've used it on a couple of situations like that. You know, when you use it yourself and you're in the trade, a lot of times, you, first of all, it's not going to kill somebody. You know, it, it might leak. You try stuff. You know, worst case scenario, they got a leak. Guess what? Kenny will go fix the leak. You know, that's, that's the kind of stuff I, that I see. But, you know, if it was in an area that was going to cause a lot of major problem flooding. But, you know, again, kind of think out the whole situation. What's the worst this is going to do? It's going to leak. If, if, where is it leaking? On the ground. You know, now if it's leaking in a house and you were more concerned with it, you could transition with a, a band or, or go try to find the right pipe. You know, but like I said, I hardly ever had ABS on the truck. Almost never had ABS on the truck. You know, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer in the, in the PVC. All right, this is a little, little extra, but you see this? Anybody recognize the problem? Oh. Don't, don't get fixated on that American standard flush valve. This is, this is basic repair stuff. Look at this. 
the tank bolt is improperly installed. The tank bolt is supposed to pull down on a rubber washer. The metal washer is supposed to go up under the toilet and you tighten it up and it pulls that big headed bolt down on the rubber washer. That's metal to metal contact in the toilet. You got a brass nut or a, a brass cap on top of that thing. They're pulling down on the metal washer. It'll leak. Water will go right around it. And I tell you, you might get away with it for a while, a, in some cases a few weeks. You go back and look at that in a month, I mean in a, in a year, it'll be gigantic globs of stuff in there. That, that reaction that it has causes that. This is a do-it-yourselfer problem. But remember, you might be the first professional to look at this house since they did all these things to it. Because, you know, the big box stores provide all the material that we need to do everything. And everybody thinks he's a plumber. Everybody thinks he's an electrician. And they don't call the plumbers to do stuff that they think they can do themselves. I mean, I know guys that'll plug in something and say, well, it works, so it must be right. And it's got a hot neutral reverse. You know, and, and it could be, you know, just because it works doesn't mean it's right. You know, so you, you'll see that kind of stuff. But this one here, the, the problem with this is they didn't read the instructions. See it? The big nut pulls down onto the rubber washer. And then it pulls it down into the china of that tank. And so that, that will make it, that'll seal it. But if you put the metal washer under the top, you know, this is, this is deep stuff, I know, mostly plumbing stuff. But I'm just showing you, do it yourself or selfers will screw a lot of stuff up. Now, how many of you actually pull the tank lid off? So for two, three or four of you guys, this is important. You other guys forget it. Don't worry about it. I mean, it isn't a big deal. I know a lot of guys that don't do it. A lot of guys that don't pull the top off the tank. You know, I did. I mean, I felt like I'd be held to a higher standard. So I always pulled the top off. I found some weird stuff, you know. I, just, I put in there many times, replace guts and tank. You know, I mean everything because it was so bad, you know. You know, remember they used to say put a brick in the toilet, it was safe. I've seen guys that, you know, that, that put five or six bricks in the toilet to try to make it flush better. And then they call you with the stopped up toilet and wonder why. No, you, displacement's okay for a little bit, but you can only do so much. Here's another one, it's kind of a similar thing. They put the rubber washer on the bottom and they tighten it up, you know, they change the ball cock in the toilet or the, we don't always say ball cock anymore, we're supposed to say fill valve. You know, they're taking away the, the genders on fittings. A lot of areas are no longer saying male and female fittings, they're saying inside and outside threads. I'm not doing it, I'm old and I don't give a damn. I'm not changing, you know. You don't like it, don't call me. Uh, but anyway, the, val the valve is improperly installed. Again, instructions. Instructions just tell you to put the rubber washer up at the top to make a nice seal. Otherwise, it's just that plastic just pushing it. Plastic isn't soft enough to seal it up. So little little nickel and dime things, but they just don't read the instructions. Um, see that right there? That, this is just a little trick for you guys to know. You didn't, remember the rubber hose is in the, and you put it over to the top? You, what, do anybody knows what will happen if you take that rubber hose and just shove it down in that overflow pipe? It, it'll suck water out of the toilet and go down the drain. It'll suck it right out of the tank and send it right down the drain. I've seen people do it before. They say, I don't know what's wrong with my, my, my toilet. I notice it cuts on every two or three minutes. It's because when you have that hose pushed down it, it'll actually suck water through the, through the fill valve. It'll go over and go right down that overflow pipe and it's literally going down the drain. You take it and you lift the hose up and put the little clamp on it that comes with it and holds it above it and it stops. Again, don't read it. People don't read the instructions. Everybody, everybody thinks he knows. All right, what's wrong with this shower? Looks like painted wood to me. You know, there's it, it's improper shower wall material. You know, wood with paint on it ain't it. Anybody see this? We're getting close to time here, so anybody see this? See what it is? Look how deep that trap is. Now, what's going to happen after this thing out, with that trap deep? All that's going to be underwater all the time. It's going to be full of water up to that point all the time. That means there's going to be water in the drain. There's going to be water in the garbage disposal. It's all going to be standing full of water. 
because to get out, it's got to go up that high to go through the pipe in the wall. You know, the pipe in the wall, this thing is roughed in so high, the sink was roughed in so high, it's hard to get it out. You know, that might be a real deep sink. Probably is. It looks, it looks deeper, a little bit deeper, than I don't see anything, I don't see the sink hanging down on the other side. So they got a really deep sink to start out with, and now the, 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 the drain's way down, so they, in order to get it in, it's got to go up and out. You can see where the, the weir of the trap is, is, you know, in that wall up there. So it's got to go down and it's got to come all the way back up to there. So when, it stop, when water stops running in it, you're going to be able to look in both of those sinks and see standing water, which means it's going to collect garbage and it's going to be a problem. This is, um, I, I'm not a fan of putting female adapters on, on basket strainers because they're hard to get up, but, but I wouldn't have got excited about that. But all those fittings are, are not drain fittings. Those are pressure fittings. And pressure fittings have edges and ledges inside of them. If you, if you look at this thing, Think about a drain fitting, nice, clean, long turns. But what makes a drain fitting work really good is if you took your finger inside a drain system and you ran your finger through it, when it got to the elbows and stuff, it would still be smooth when it made the inside transition. It would roll right around because drain fittings have hubs on them. So they make the inside the dry, of the inside of the pipe line up with the inside of the fitting. Pressure fittings don't have hubs. So when you put them together, water would go through the pressure fitting, would drop off, and then would hit an edge of the pipe and go through. And you would have that all through the system, and it would be like having little shelves or little splines or something sticking up all through the plumbing system, catching little particles every time it every time it drains. You know, think of um, I think I got some pressure fittings on, on a slide of further red. I'll, I'll see if I do it. I can I'll probably explain it a little better. But these are pre these are fittings made for are made for pressure, like on a well or a water line coming to a house, and they've used them as drain fittings. And they're not made for that. Yeah, well, I, some things are just obvious. Look at this, this is under a house. I just put it in here real quick. Look at this. They just stuck the pipe in it. There's no connection at all. Uh, you know, they could have done that transition with a fern co. Um, a T on its back, and, and then of course there, there's a, an S-trap, they've essentially, S-traps are not allowed. What's the big problem with an S-trap? I like that word, it sucks. <laughs> they siphon by momentum. They drain so fast. I've had people come in there and say, look how good that sink works. It works too good. It works too good because it'll, it'll siphon by momentum and you don't have any water in there to stop the airflow. It also can't be vented. I remember it by the S. You remember? Siphon, <laughs> I know it sucks. You know it sucks. All right, so that, and that a T is not supposed to be on its back like that, that T with that arrow. Look at all this stuff over here. Another T on its back. This whole thing is messed up. Somebody just came in here and used pressure fittings, drain fittings. And hey, if the water went down, that was good. That's basically the way they looked at it. Just too many things to go into to detail, but I'm just showing you just one place, all this stuff in there. Another pressure fitting. Uh, some areas uh, require primer and glue on PVC. Some areas don't. The, the, in some areas, they don't require primer. Some areas don't require primer. Um, I know the manufacturer says in order to, to work, they want you to use the primer. But a lot of areas will let you use, it, use the glue without primer on a drain system. They won't let you do it on a pressure system. Uh, I'm not a fan. I, I think you should use both because we're not really gluing it together. We're solvent welding it together. We're, we're making it soft. Anyway, hey, see the vent that's turned to turn straight up. If you look at this, when that drain is draining, water flows by there. If air tried to pull the water out of that trap, air would come down through there. That's, that's fine. That, that'll do the trick. Where people make mistakes, where, you know, the do it yourself or makes mistakes is he'll come in and say, Oh, that's going to pull the vent or pull the trap. So he knows that when water's going through here, it would create a vacuum 
so he knows it's going to create a vacuum and it's going to pull air in through there. And again, it won't pull the trap. The problem is if you ever have a stoppage on something like this, the, some of the stoppage could get pushed back up into this pipe and eventually it would plug it off. So the code says in order to have a drive in in there, it has to be up at 45 degrees or greater. So if something gets in there, it's supposedly going to fall out. Or you can put another fixture on that pipe. If there was another way to put another fixture on that pipe, if it got plugged up, you would know it because when you went to drain the other fixture, the blockage would slow the sink down or stop the sink, and you would snake it out and you would open it back up. But the other way, you would never know if it was blocked up or not. Oh, here you go. All right, look at the fitting up in the front. That's a pressure fitting. Look at the fittings behind it. They have hubs. They're flared out on the ends. When you put the pipe inside there, it causes the inside of the fitting to be aligned with the inside of the pipe. So when you're flowing through there, it'll go right around into the fitting perfectly lined up. Whereas on this, you stick a piece of pipe in here, it'll go in so far it'll stop, and then another piece of pipe up here so far it'll stop, and it will every angle will create a little shelf where the pipe is in there. The outside of the pipe is the right size, but the inside now has shelves all through the system, and it'll stay clogged up. It'll stay clogged up all the time. Um, we're running out of time, so I want to make sure I get it. Um, I get this question all the time. How many elbows? How many elbows? So excessive number of elbows. If you, if you put elbows on there, um, most of the time, if you look at the TPR valve, which is that's where it's going to be connected to, it'll say so. I know Watts does on a tag, more, no more than four elbows. It also says no more than 30 feet, you know, for that vent pipe. Is there any way you can put more than four elbows on there and it be legal? It actually is. Use bigger pipe. Increase it to one inch pipe. That's three quarter inch pipe. Just put a fitting in there and increase it out to a bigger pipe, now the elbows are bigger and they're not as restrictive. So you can you can do that and you know kind of get away with it. Um, how many do you guys see pecs on the TPR lines? Yeah. Fending it? Pecs. Pec. Yeah, a lot of people do it. C Pardon me? C PVC. PVC is CPVC is legal, PVC is not. Yeah. Uh, pecs is legal in some areas. Uh, of course, you in pecs you gotta follow a lot more rules because you can't have traps in it. So it's got to go down and it would have to be nice and smooth and or if it's on just hanging down near the floor, it has to be secured because then you don't want to blow off and flop around and hurt somebody. So you secure it. The one thing that a lot of people miss on that, when you use PECs, the, the international code says you got to use one inch. You got to put a fitting in the TPR valve and it's got to blow it out to one inch right there. Because by the time you put the fitting inside, the PEX fitting inside the female adapter or the male adapter that you screw up inside the it just reduces it down to like a half inch vent. It's really restrictive. So the the code knew it was going to be used, but they said use a piece of one inch and you put a three quarter threaded fitting in there that flares out to one inch and then the one inch pipe is okay. A lot of areas aren't aren't sticking to that. They're saying yeah, we don't care, you know, use three quarter, but it is in the code. It's absolutely in the code. Uh, I heard somebody mention this a little bit earlier, about this a little bit earlier. They said they were looking for something. I think it was you. You were looking for um, sediment trap. All right, see that line there? That little, that's an improper sediment trap when you put them that way. Sediment trap should be that way. Um, the way they would work is gas basically is flowing like that. If you get debris, the debris will drop down. You turn it off, you can break the union. You can open it up for, you know, if you get water in there. In, in 50 years, I've never got more than a drop of water out of one of those things. I, I actually have people who would call me home inspectors and would say, should I tell them to clean them out once a year? That T. It's on the wrong side of the shuttle. No, the T is configured wrong. You can't take a T like that and turn it down. 
you can do this way. So the T, if the T comes into the run, or if the gas comes into the run of the T, you can put the line out of the branch. The run, the run is where it comes in and just goes straight through out the other side. Those are called the run. If you run it, bring it in the run, you can come out of the branch and connect it to the appliance. Or you can tie the gas into the branch. If you tie the gas into the branch, you can come off of the top of the run and go over like that. Because what will happen here is any debris that might get in there will bank off of that back wall and drop down. Gravity will pull it down. What they're worried about is a straight through. Sometimes that debris will cling to the side of the pipe and it'll just roll right on by that opening if it's just straight T out the bottom. And people say, well, well you know, well, how do you come up with that? I mean, first of all, I read the code and I understand what it says, but it, they actually have in the commentary that exact thing. They say in the commentary how to do it because it gets done wrong all the time. If you see a line run through the T and they just take the T and turn it down and come out of the branch and drop down, it's not right, you know. You might have a guy in your area that will allow it, but, you know, I've had inspectors show up on jobs and I could tell they didn't, they didn't know any more than, you know, the homeowner, you know, but you just make sure that they don't fail your job and they can leave. I remember when they first came up with FVIR water heaters, I took a, a FVIR water heater after the new code cycle came out, I put a boiler in a house and I put it on a platform big concrete platform but i took the water heater and i sat it on the ground on the on the floor of the garage and the home is the building inspector came in and he looked at it and he said why did you sit that on the floor that's got to be raised it's got to be 18 inches off of the floor the flame does i said is it fvi or a water heater he said what the hell is that i said come in man. and i showed him on the side of the heater it's talk about it being flammable vapor ignition resistant and it could go on the floor he said i didn't know that no oh, okay and he left you know, so some areas don't care. Some areas will say, no, you're not going to do it. But sometimes you get them to read the code. It's amazing. How about this? You can't bury CSST. You can put, you can put it in a, in a sleeve. You know, you can run it in another pipe. And they make CSST that's already sleeved and stuff. You know, but you don't just bury it. That stuff's thin. You know, I had a guy that actually manufactures. I came up here to Pennsylvania. This is where they make track pipe. I came up here and went through their course. And the guy actually said to me, well, it's, CS, it, it's stainless steel, but it ain't really all that good stainless steel. I thought, well, damn, I never heard that. I wonder if that's on his advertising. You know, stainless steel, not all that good. Uh, in Virginia, you know, so you don't, bear, you don't bury it. In Virginia, when we see yellow CSST on a house built before, I think it's May 1st, 2008, that's when they started using the 2006 code in Virginia. We had to put that statement in our report. Don't put anything else. You put that statement. They tell you don't screw around with it. Put that statement. The manufacturers believe the product is safer, properly bonded and grounded, blah, 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 blah. You go through that. We put the statement. I have guys say, well, what if I say? They're telling you exactly what to say. Say it. I wish they would do that for everything. You know, if you find this, say that. I said it, they didn't like it, but the government told me to say it, you know. But anyway, this is, this is what they make us do there. The reason is up until, 2000, until the 2006 code was, in, was brought online, the, the, the building inspectors didn't mention anything about the CSST. And, you know, if, if they didn't bond it, they didn't care. But later on, the code inspectors did start looking for the bonding and the, the clamp and everything. And if you up to that point, they don't care. You know, after that point, after the house was built May 1st, 2008, and the 2006 code was in play, the, they put it back on the code guy. The code guy should have said something. You know, we before that, we would say, well, we would put it in the gas line and we would say, see if the electrician will go ahead and put the bond this thing to the electrical system. The electrician would go, hey, mine, I ain't doing it. You know, so if you had a guy that was willing to go in the panel, I mean, I put a lot of clamps on them and, and went into the panels, it was okay. But if you didn't want to, it probably didn't get done. You know, and the the issue that they had was the lightning strikes and the energy in the air and stuff like that. Uh, look at this. I see this quite a bit. You can go to Home Depot, places like that, and you buy that strap. Some people say, well, you want to use plastic strap with plastic pipe. Um, if it's strapped flat, it ain't going to hurt that pipe, ever. If that flat strap that wide ain't going to hurt it. The problem with that strap is 
Uh, it's got quite a bit of distance between it, so it's, there's a lot of weight there. That strap's rated it not very much. Plastic strap will snap right off if you got a lot of weight on it. Whereas a flat strap, look at the weight on the flat strap. It'll support a lot. Or the um, metal flat strap. It'll, it'll support a lot. The steel pipe will. So when I wrap it, I would always wrap it so it would always be flat. I didn't want it to turn the edges, cut into the pipe, especially on foam core pipe or some thin pipe. You know, it didn't take much to cut it, but good, good plastic pipe. We wrap it around there nice, put a stove bolt in there or something, and you're probably fine. That looks like it might just have plastic anchors on the wall, too. That thing's going to come down, you know. How many of you have been under a house, you crawl under, crawl over some ductwork and you hear a strap break? Well, they, I see guys strap ductwork with that all the time, and I'm like, you got to be kidding. Because when the first one breaks, and sometimes you hear it like it's unzipping <laughs> all the way down the house because of the weight of it. Plastic strap just does not hold a lot of weight. Won't do it. Uh, this is kind of a little beyond the scope thing, but it, it's something to think about. See that sink? Excessive overhang above the sink. Um, it's, a, it's an area, when I see this on a sink where they cut the hole and then they put the undermount in there and it hangs over, I bring it to my client's attention that the overhang right there is a bad place to collect bacteria from processing food. And tell them, just make sure you wash good up under there. You know, it would have been, usually you like to see it kind of come to the edge and it goes down into the sink and when it gets washed, it gets washed. But that's a, you know, that gets to be a nasty spot. And if it weren't food being processed where you get botulism and salmonella and all that stuff, it wouldn't be that big a deal, but it, it can be. And you know, kids will go out and grab a hold of the sink and pull themselves up, put their fingers right in the edge of it. You know, because it's, it's on the front and the back side. So, and like I said, that's just kind of a beyond the, it's the, scope. the average person's not gonna see that. But I, you know, I don't want anybody to get, see something and know that there's a risk there. And I don't even know, I might just have a comment in the report, you know, about it. Uh, what's the problem? Now, they to make that trap work, they made that trap deeper, so that's a problem, but they don't even have the other sink trapped at all. The other sink's going, it's actually going down, sink on the left is connected before the trap. You know, it's coming out of the wall, and it's, so there's no, there's no drain on that one. Most areas would, um, would make you also bring the dishwasher connector up, you know, support it underneath. Um, how about here? Do you see it? Yeah, plumbing vents below a window. You know, you see that. You would say, you would tell them that's a problem, and I guarantee you what they would say is, Jesus, that's been there for 45 years. It's been there for 100 years or something like that. And say, well, you know, 100 years ago, people couldn't smell. Tell them something like that. See if they pick up on it. How about this one? This this we'll see once in a while. Uh, no trap, no handle. I, I'm I'm not a fan when they you know of this type, but you see it in some areas. It's legal to do it like this. You you want cutoffs on the on the valves, missing trap, missing cutoff on the valve. But some areas will let you do the vent or the drain like that. If it's right next to the wash machine, they'll let you tie into the standpipe. So you're like, well, how do I know that? It's in the wall. You, you can, when you're running the sink, sometimes you can hear it over there by the washing machine going in there. Eh, I'm not, not overly worried. It's trapped. You know, I still would like to have cutoffs. You know, I still want to have cutoffs. But that, I see that from time to time. A lot, you know, an average plumber probably wouldn't do it. He would probably, he would probably put, uh, you know, another stack there. I mean, there's obviously a line right below it. How about this? <laughs> this is an island <laughs> somebody thought he was island venting he didn't quite he knew there was some looping going on there but he didn't know it quite quite how it was improperly configured island vent this is the proper configuring of an island vent I, again i'm not a fan because the the uh, this thing is jumping on me this thing the way it's in here the drain is right up under that uh, underneath the floor it's a dry vent that goes over and turns up. If that gets plugged up, it's plugged up. There's nothing to keep it and wash it out. So we're big fans in our area of AAVs. Air admittance valves are great. They work good. Uh, they're a little pricey. You know, some people call them Studer vents. That's probably a $23, $24 vent. 
but it works good. Unlike an inline vent, you used to have to put them way up under the sink. You don't have to do AAV stuff. The more pressure that puts on it, the tighter it closes. It actually seals it. And, and they work fine. And there's not all that extra crap that can go bad. They're also a great place to snake the drain. You know. Now, you might see these in the field. Uh, that's the old ones. They're probably less than $10. They were called inline vent. At one time, they were BOCA approved, the BOCA code, but they're not, they're not approved uh, uh, that I know of any, anywhere else now. But these are, these are whole different things. That, that guy in the back there, that thing is tight. They work, they work really good. They work really good. We do entire houses with these, except for one drain. You have to have always have one drain going through the roof. Always have to have one going through the roof. Uh, that's the code. But, uh, you know, in Europe and places like that, a lot, a lot of things that they, they do like that is because, you know, you get up in uh, the Scandinavian countries and places like that where they got a lot of snow. You don't want a bunch of vents outside. You have to have the vent pipe sticking four feet above the house and what is it going to do? It's going to it's going to have a frost enclosure. So they they like to use AAVs and stuff like that. Yeah, go ahead. Also, Kenny, uh, with those vents, if you're performing a sewer scope inspection, you just oh. don't have a clean out yeah. anywhere. Sometimes it's really yeah, it's tough a place to do. That's a good place for it. Yep. yep. Now, a place you don't use them is on a on a, a a sewage lift pump, you know, or if you got a receiver in a basement or something, you can't put those vents to vent them. Every now and then you'll see one in there. The, the, these things, remember, if, what causes the pressure in the receiver? Water running from the sewer goes into the receiver. It's pushing a wall of air in front of it. Uh, an AAV would shut off if it was pushing pressure on it. So it's not going to really vent it. An inline vent is just not a legal, that's an inline vent. It's not legal anymore. The only place that you could put the, um, the AAV legally it's an engineered venting system, and that's the way it is. And the way that works is it, it's a little complicated, but it, it works so as that water flushes down that drain, as that water's moving down the drain here, it starts creating a vacuum. You know, so it's it's going down, it's going to drain. But you don't if if any the water goes by here, tries to siphon, the AAV will open up in that line. You're not going to see this. Okay, I've never seen it. It's an engineered system, but I've never seen it. But I have seen that. They put it in the, they put it in the basement. They just run the little vent up there. They figure that's going to be good. Uh, I know they don't allow it in my area, they, you know. But again, everybody says, well, the international codes. And I've actually heard people say the code's the code. You gotta do We're not all on the same code. And if and if you think it is, you're gonna, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have issues. <coughs> You guys got a lot of old stuff up here. We got a lot of old stuff. You know, we are one of the original colonies. You know, so we got a lot of old stuff. So that lid around the top, you know, they, these can be confusing when some guy's looking for a collar. You know, you usually think about the collar around the pipe leaking. This guy leaks from here. Yeah, that lid's pretty old. It gets in there. Have, have y'all ever seen uh, where it gets chewed up by squirrels? Squirrels will get up there and eat it. You can tell they little chunks out of it out. They'll actually eat it, you know. And then you got a bunch of squirrels running around your yard with lead poisoning. So nobody wants stupid squirrels, you know. So and before I get away from vents, I want to tell you guys a story real quick. Uh, my my mother has dementia real bad, and she'll sit around and watch TV. And a lot of the people she sees on television. She thinks there's somebody in her life. So, so we're watching uh, this old house. It's like a favorite at our house. So I'm sitting there one afternoon or one evening with her, and we're watching this old house. And it comes on, and Tom Silva walks out. If any of you see it, you see old Tom Silva. So Tom Silva comes out, and my mother goes, hey, that's Les Terry. I said, no, Mom, that's Tom Silva. She goes, no, that's Les Terry. Les, Les Terry was a contractor in our area that we knew for years. He passed away 15 years ago. Mom has no clue. But she's watching. Ah, that's Les Terry. I said, no, that's Tom Silva. A little bit later, he comes walking out, and she's completely forgot what she said. She goes, ah, it's Les Terry. I go, no, that's Tom Silva. Well, when the show goes off, they always introduce themselves. 
So they all walk out. He goes, I'm Kevin O'Connell. I'm Richard Dutui. And the guy and Tom, uh, Tom Silva goes, and I'm Tom Silva. And my mother goes, who the hell is Tom Silva? <laughs> She'd been hearing that and hearing that. And she just couldn't understand it, you know, because she, she recognizes people and she's so certain they were in her past. Um, this final thing, and this is really kind of out there, but when I see stuff like this in the field, it drives me crazy. Um, oops. That is, the, everybody knows you got a TXV, a thermostatic expansion valve. It's a metering device. It's on a, you normally don't see anything. It's in the unit. It's right next to the evaporator. And you don't see that. Well, I don't know why. Oh, there you go. It's supposed to be there. It's supposed to mount inside on the line with insulating tape around there really tight. Ideally, it'll mount at like 10 o'clock or two o'clock on the line, so it'll really sense the temperature of that line. Well, the, what'll happen is as it's sensing the temperature of the line, it's actually sensing the outlet temperature and the device is on the inlet. So as it senses the temperature leaving the coil, it can regulate the refrigerant flow. <laughs> I see this every now and then, and I've even talked to people and they see that, they think, they said, I thought it was supposed to tell how hot the system was so it would know to open up more and let in more refrigerant. You know, he thought it was a temperature. And, and then my response is, well, it ain't 135 degrees in the house. You know, so he's, they, sense, they clamp that thing right to that pipe like that, thinking, well, it'll get a lot colder if it thinks it's a lot hotter, you know, in the attic, it'll trick it and stuff like that. But it is the only adjustable device like that that monitors refrigerant that changes the flow of refrigerant going through the system. Um, but if it's not mounted on that line, you, you could have major problems. You could actually f kill a compressor with something like that. So do you, honestly, would you think that that thing would tense, would it even begin to sense the temperature of the pipe? There's no insulation. It's metal to metal. How hot is the attic? The attic is way down too hot. You'd never know that. But the other way it would, and it would actually regulate it better. And <clears throat> as well as bringing in the, the cool refrigerant, it also keeps too much refrigerant from coming in and getting back to the compressor, which is always, you know, always a, a big issue. So we don't want to, we don't want to do that. Um, one other thing, and then, then we'll wrap this one up. We are often concerned about liquid refrigerant getting to the compressor, and we'll talk about slugs of refrigerant and stuff like that. Uh, we might be running into it again. I mean, for a while there, 2008, we ran into a lot of vacant houses. Right now, it's just, just there's no inventory. From what I can see, there's no inventory. But when we were running into vacant houses, they turned the power off. And so you would get there, and the power company would be coming out of the driveway, and you walk in, and they just turn the power on? Yeah. Well, if it was cold, they just turn the power on. You really shouldn't be testing the HVAC system. The heat, well, you can test the furnace, but you don't want to be testing a heat pump or something like that. Because when an air conditioning system or a heat pump sits in really cold weather, that compressor sitting there and it gets really cold and it's got oil in it. Refrigerant, especially R22, it was terrible for it. Refrigerant migrates through the system, goes into the oil. It wants to get with the oil, so it would go into the oil. Well, when you turn the power on the system and just let it sit, most of them have a, a heater on the compressor. You see that little crankcase heater? It looks like a hose clamp on some of them. It sits there and it warms the compressor up. And when it warms the compressor up, the refrigerant gets warm, refrigerant will boil off. It'll turn into vapor and rise up out of there. But if you just turn the if you just turn on the power and that compressor takes off and that refrigerant's in there, the refrigerant jumps out of the compressor, it takes the oil with it. Takes the oil with it. You've got a compressor that's starting with no lubrication. No oil in there, no lubrication. So when you're trying to convince your customer that you really should let this thing sit for a while, 12 to 24 hours before you turn it on. Reminder, my concern is that the refrigerant refrigerant may be absorbing the oil, and if it, I don't want it to leave that compressor and take that oil with it. It's a, it's, it's, just tell them it could kill the compressor. That, that they usually, they get that part, because they know that's money. Yeah. Kenny, I'm hearing from a lot of HVAC guys now that uh, newer air conditioning systems don't even have crankcase heaters. Uh, so, yeah, and, and you, you'll see more and more of them. Um, the compressors that we call scroll compressors, I think they're kind of surprising us, in my, in my opinion, because 
they're actually turning out to be much better compressors. Uh, some of them, some of the manufacturers even say when you get a little refrigerant into it, it'll actually roll around. Instead of a regular compressor's got a piston that's going up and down, refrigerant gets in, pushes that liquid refrigerant up against the valve that opens and the valves that open and close. And if it's liquid in there, it'll push against a valve, it'll bend it or break it. Whereas a, a, a scroll compressor doesn't have that. It's, the scroll is really clever little way, but we're finding out there's a lot of cool things about scrolls, and that might be that might be the reason. So, I mean, I would never, as a as a home inspector, I would never call out there's no crankcase heater because that's like you're redoing. You know, I, I can understand that, but I mean, you you're right. You probably will see that. One of the manufacturers even say that if you get a a spot in the in the molding, of, you know, in the in the actual casting of the compressor. That scroll, the way it works inside there, instead of wearing out, it will wear that spot in. It'll actually smooth it out over time. That's that's pretty weird. So there's a, several things about the newer equipment that I, I hated it when it first came out. The uh, the idea of having uh, R410A and all that stuff. R410As turned out to be pretty good, pretty efficient. Uh, some of you might see the new evaporators. Instead of the tubing, we've got a flat bar now with little holes in it. The whole bar gets cold called microchannel compressors, some crazy stuff, but it's, it's definitely getting better. And I think the, the inverter technology that we mainly are seeing on mini splits is going into the regular systems too. Equipment's getting better, you know, certainly a great time to get in the industry. Any of you guys want to start a new career? A couple of you are pretty old. I don't think a couple of you are going to have a hard time getting a lunch, but that'd be me. I have a hard time getting a lunch. I appreciate it. Um, I'll do after lunch. I think we're going to talk about water heaters for a little bit. Okay, everybody. Hope you had a great lunch. We're ready to resume now. So we're going to have introductions from some of our very valued affiliates that work with us here. Uh, they're going to just take about a minute to introduce themselves. Uh, in the meantime, thank you for participating in the 50-50. If you hadn't and you want to, they'll be available at my table over here. I just want to remind everybody that there's a survey form in the folders. Please take a couple minutes to fill out that survey. In past years, the feedback was very, very valued, um, helpful. Um, and so please, I uh, would like to have your feedback again this year. Um, don't make me chase you down. Please don't, don't forget. Um, turn it over mid-afternoon if you can, before 5. I think you'll be able to be able to give good comments back on that. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you, um, and here we go. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, you guys. Good to see familiar faces out there. Uh, I'm Rob from Burrow Exterminating. Most of you folks know me already. So we provide wood destroying insect inspections mainly to the home inspection industry. Uh, if you get a chance, to stop by my booth, throw your card in the fishbowl. There's a $50 cash prize we're going to do a drawing for. Um, and that's it. Hope you guys have a good rest of the day, and thanks for your support. I appreciate it. Hello, uh, Scott Ross from EMSL Analytical. Um, our head, corporate headquarters is over in Cinnaminson, New Jersey, right near the Tacone Palmyra and Betsy Ross Bridges. We actually have a branch lab 2.4 miles away from here. I know that because I clocked it this morning um, that do asbestos and mold analysis there. Uh, of course, our, our full breadth of analytical services is done in our corporate lab. And uh, I've for home inspectors today, I have information about our uh, mold and radon services. I have a couple of radon posters over there you can take with you. We have a special right now in a mold sampling starter kit for you get a, a, a pump and a case and a uh, uh, stand and aerosols and tape lifts and swabs all for $315. I have information on an assessment report for home inspectors, which is great because uh, when you do a mold uh, sampling, the results come out with some kind of interpretation, like is this a, mold, a, a plant pathogen mold or one that's produced toxins or one that uh, needs a lot of water, uh, so it's a water intrusion indicator. Uh, we also have our EMSL uh, application, so while you're doing your surveys for mold or asbestos or lead or whatever, uh, you can do your surveys on your phone or on a tablet and you're kind of filling out your chain of custody as you go. Um, so that's something good for you uh, tech heads out there. A uh, bunch of little um, uh, 
knickknacks you can take home with you. Two of them are a home inspector uh, environmental testing pocket guide. Just a lot of the things that home inspectors usually come to our lab for and a specific uh, mold pocket guide. Um, please take my stuff so I don't have to take it home, okay? <laughs> And they're free. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Fran. I work for Elite MGA. I sell insurance. Tell me how excited you are to hear about insurance today. Wow, you're all terrible liars. Um, so I will be in the back. I see a lot of familiar faces. I insure some of you. If I don't insure you, I'd like to. It'll save me from doing real work for the rest of the day. Please come visit, take my things, take a business card. Um, I can't do that. I, that's what I'm here for. Um, I'm trying to get me more business. But um, just high notes about the program. If you're not aware, we are specifically for home inspectors. We own the insurance carrier, which is a big deal. Um, somebody in my office makes all the decisions about pricing, about claims, about what idiot gets to sit here all day. Um, that's me. So um, if you have any questions or I can help with your insurance stuff, please let me know. That's it. Thanks, Fran. Uh, Pete Mulebrunner, I know most of you guys, uh, AHI Consulting, I'll be talking in a little bit, so I'm not going to get into too much detail, but I do have some uh, mugs up here. If you want to grab one before you leave, uh, feel free. Uh, I left my business cards on the table, and again, I'll be speaking in a little bit, so we'll talk more then. Thank you. I think most of you know um, Ed Urban, Urban Property Services, and I perform stucco, stone, eaves, and brick moisture testing and inspections. And so I did want to also highlight um, sponsorship here. Uh, Rob um, was our lunch sponsor today. Um, we appreciate his uh, generosity. We want to recognize that. Uh, I'll be doing the tool giveaway later. That was my sponsorship today, the tool giveaway. Uh, and to the to the Zoom attendees, uh, I want to acknowledge you there and make mention uh, of the surveys. You'll get a separate survey by email, uh, and I hope that you'll be able to return those with your feedback on your Zoom experience today. Thank you, everybody. You're up, Kenny. I was talking to somebody when we first started talking about me coming here, and they said something about water heaters. They said, well, most of the guys are pretty familiar with that. Okay, I'm going to try to tell you some, th some things you might not be familiar with about water heaters it might might be good for you to you know pick up on too i want to give you a couple of tips that you can use on your own heater i always tell people i'll i'll give you a couple of tips you might save you a service call and you'll get some of your money back for whatever you whatever you paid to, to come here today if you can do the service call don't do it unless you're qualified yeah that's what i hear um this is um storage tank to tankless, because I touch a little bit on everything and some of the things that have come about in the last few years. Um, tankless is something a lot of guys are interested in. I've actually gone to Kentucky, and when we finished the presentation, we brought a tankless water heater in front of the room, and I showed them how to flush it. Actually put the pump up and did all that stuff. People knew that it was supposed to be flushed periodically. They didn't know, you know how it actually, how it works, and not that complicated. So, Let's start with storage tank heaters. Very popular, been around a long time. Uh, I can tell you tradesmen like them. They're pretty easy to install. Um, companies that I've worked with or owned, we would have competitions on replacing like uh, electric, electric heaters. You can usually swap them out pretty quick. I had a brother that worked for me at the time, and he could change out the average one in a garage in 55 minutes and be up the road. So pretty good. Anyway, um, some people, you, I hear them talking, and they're talking about a two-element heater. And they say, well, I want a two-element heater over a single-element heater because it's, it'll heat faster because you get two elements. Well, they do not heat at the same time. Both elements do not heat at the same time. One element comes on. It, let's say the heater was just filled to the top with cold water. You just got it installed, turned on the water, filled it up, and then flipped the switch, and it comes on. What would happen when you turn the heater on is the top element would heat up first. would heat up to about the top third or maybe a little more of the tank. It would cut off. 
and that would allow the bottom element to come on. The bottom element then heat, and you'd have a tank full of hot water. As long as that top element is satisfied, the bottom element can keep coming on and gutting off. Well, when a water heater fills up, a tank type water heater, the dip tube carries the cold water to the bottom of the heater. So cold water enters the bottom of the heater. So the, the bottom of the heater cools off first. So it's very common that, you know, because of that bottom of the heater getting cold for the bottom element to constantly be coming on. Some days I bet the top element never comes on at all. If you just draw some water off for a, a lavatory, maybe a kitchen sink or something, the water would, the water would, you know, just, it's not going to use that much water. A little bit of water would be getting cold at the bottom. So the bottom element could come on and warm it back up. And you'd be good to go. All right, you say, well, I wonder why he's telling me that. Because many times we would get a call and people would say that they don't, they don't have as much hot water as they usually have. They seem to run out quicker. The bottom element works the most, comes on the most. It tends to die the quickest. So often, you know, you, you don't have as much hot water. You can actually take the covers off and put your thumb or finger in there on the bottom of the tank and realize the bottom of the tank's cold. You know, let it sit for a while. It should heat up. If it hasn't, if it hasn't heated and you put your finger on it, 99% of the time, it's the bottom element. You can, you know, turn off the power, drain the heater down, change the bottom element. You're back in business. So that, that's one of the things that you can actually do uh, on your own. And that's a very, very common thing. Apparently, we're being attacked or something that I hear. So again, I guess they didn't take us out the first time. All right, gas water heaters. Gas water heaters, very similar to putting a pot on a stove. You know, it's basically a fire down at the bottom. It heats up the bottom part of the heater. There's some heat, obviously, it goes through the, the flue, and it just transfers that heat right into the water. Water heaters all should have these devices that I'm going to talk about here. All water heaters need a shutoff valve. Uh, cold side, I'll hear people say, well, I told them they should have one on the hot side too. No requirement to have one on the hot side. It's just one more thing to go bad. If you turn off the cold water going into the heater, the hot water will cut off. I promise you, you don't have to turn it off. But there are some guys that like to have them on both sides. There's nothing that I really know of that says you can't. It's just doesn't seem a real need for it. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest thing it would help probably is a technician. If he was working on a heater, he could turn both heaters off. It's just not, it's just, there are other ways to get around that. The valve is supposed to be full bore. There were a lot of gate valves sold for years that have turned out to be junk. And some of the professionals will actually call them one-time valve. You turn them off one time, and that's it. It ain't gonna ever turn it back on. It comes apart. The gate just comes apart, and you just you know you're just trying to turn it on. You're not going to get anything. So guys like ball valves. This is a ball valve. It's a full bore, full bore valve means the whole basically the whole through the valve is as big as the pipe. Okay, so that water will flow through it. That's that changed since I've been in the business since the seventies. I mean, there was a time we just put regular stop valves on there. You know, so full bore valve. Um, a gate valve is a full bore valve. There, you, you get away with it, you can use it, but I will tell you personally, if they don't put a good quality gate valve in it, a lot of them just don't hold up that well. So we, you know, we always, we always figured when I was when I was running my plumbing company, we figured the cost of a new valve in the cost of replacing the heater. We just tell you know we just add it and put a ball valve in there and just held up better, you know. And that way, next, over the years, you know, if we were going to be there be their uh, plumber, we knew that when we turned the valve off, it was going to work, you know. Anytime you have a vessel like this and you put water in it, you have to have a drain. Um, these drains are all over the place as far as quality. Some of them have a real good quality brass drain valve on the bottom, and some of them have this weird looking plastic thing on the bottom. And I've literally seen, I've actually seen dogs eat them up. Dogs will chew on some of these plastic things. You figure it's got to be dogs look like teeth marks in there. I guess they think they're like a toy or a bone or something. And if they get damaged, you might not be able to get a hose on there. So I, I used to write them up. If I'd see them damaged, you know, I would tell the people, you know, your drain valve's been damaged. You're not going to be able to get a hose on there. 
if I will say as a plumber, if we took a water heater out of a garage, we didn't drain it first. We turned the water off, we cut the lines, we disconnected the electrical, and we walked the heater out of the way, started putting in the new heater. And at some point, we might even walk the heater all the way to the garage door. And we would, if it's a plastic valve, we stomped it. It would break it off and the water would just come on out. And we just want to drain it in a hurry. So that's, that's the way we would do it. But make sure they got a valve on there that you can drain. Uh, some of them just have a screwdriver slot nowadays, too, and a little brass valve. They're pretty good. They're pretty, they're pretty tough, the little brass ones. I think, uh, I think Bradford White's got a decent one. But anyway, there's, there's different valves that you, you'll see. Those have a valve. Uh, TPR valve needs to be installed in the top six inches of the heater. You guys remember when they all were on the top? They moved down to the side. We well, think, well, that's no big deal. When they moved down to the sides, it actually caused a problem because some of the heaters, when they were installed originally and they were at the top, they would, they would just run the line from the top into the wall, connect to the pipe that they had sticking out of the wall. And connect. Well, when they moved the, heat, the line down, now you had to go uphill to go to it. You can't trap the valve. You can't turn the valve up. You know, so now you got to figure out how to get a pipe on there differently or you have to raise the heater if you're going to try to go back to the pipe in the wall. I, many of them I've had to reconfigure. But again, you can't go uphill. It's trapping the valve. The, think of this. The pipe has to drain by gravity. Okay. Uh, when you look at some of the ones where they're in the, the top part of the tank, don't get confused if it looks like it's like eight inches in the side or something like that. Remember, the jacket isn't the tank. The tank's inside, and the tank, especially nowadays, they're just foamed up real big and everything, so your, your numbers might not be right. They understand top six inches when they build it. You're good to go. Um, the top of the heater is usually where you will find the thermostat and the high limit switch. The high limit switch, a lot of us call the high limit switch the reset button. Okay, the reset button. The reset button is a is a manual high limit basically thermostat so that when it pops off you have to manually go and reset it that particular one is a safety device we want to know if it's popping off so the best way to make you know it's popping off is you have to go to hit it again to make it come back on if you ever find yourself in that situation and you have to go and hit that red button that you can you know that red button on the top and it, you, usually you hear it click if it's definitely out. Sometimes it's hard to look at them until it's out, but you push it and it goes click. And, it goes, and you, sometimes you'll even hear like sizzling sound. If you hit the reset button and it clicks, it means the heater is overheated. It's probably got up, it's probably pushing 200 degrees. It's getting up there. It's like what's supposed to happen before the TPR valve blows off. Okay? So if you hear it click, there's a good chance it'll do it again. It'll cut off again. If you want to avoid that, Kill the power, change both thermostats. Just change the top one out, change the bottom one out. It's one or the other. And it takes too long to figure out which one it is. Just change them both, and they're both new at the same time. So, again, that would be, that'd be helpful for you. Um, they have to have a temperature control, an automatic temperature control. You can't just walk over, turn on a switch, let it heat for a while, and turn it off, because you will forget and you'll, you'll have a problem. Gas units will have this type of gas valve that you see on the screen. The, the thermostatic valve like this will be the one that's automatic control on an electric heater, but they have to have automatic controls in order for it to be a legitimate heater. Most people are not going to swap it out and put something else on there. Yeah. Okay, you were referring to electric heaters, which is reset, right? Yeah, there'd be no reset on a gas heater. The, the gas heater... The gas heater, uh, gas heaters are getting more and more intelligent. I think they even call the valve an intelligent valve now. It'll flash little code things and so forth and all. Uh, well, the original gas ones, I know for a fact, when they would, it would get too hot and it, it would cut the valve off, you had to change the valve. The, I'm talking about the gas temperature control. You actually had to change it. So, they, but they're getting way more intelligent than they used to. You'll actually see a light on that'll give you some give you some information about them. So, you know, that, that, but that's happening on everything. Everything in the industry. Uh, some stuff you were thinking, well, they can't do anything with this. This is about as good as it's gonna be. And then they come up with something else. You know, so it's, it's, it's pretty amazing. Usually they're, 
They're trying to make it safer. Uh, they seem to approach it from that standpoint. They try to make things easier to do because we got, we're got we just dying for help. We need, we need plumbers, HVAC guys. I noticed that South Dakota's advertising, you can come there and they'll accept other licenses. They're so hard up for people right now. They got Christy Nome on TV working as a plumber under a sink and as an electrician and stuff. And it's saying, you know, come to South Dakota, we'll accept your trade license, you know, and, and we need help. We need it desperately. I taught HVAC two for three years to a lot of the guys. I called them my 20 somethings. And uh, they, they approach things totally different than my home inspector buddies that are, you know, a lot of them 40, 50, 60 years old. They definitely approach things differently. But I don't, I don't think some of them even realize that they can make good money. They learn to trade well. They're young. There's no reason why they can't be make, at some point be making 100 k a year. You know, it's just, just, it's just easy enough to do if you, if you know what you're doing. A lot of the companies, too, in this world are getting bought out. And they're becoming like part of a conglomerate or something like that. And, uh, and these companies, a lot of times, are figuring out ways to even get more money out of the situation, you know. Um, so we got to have a disconnect for the electrical. There, there are some areas that will accept, you know, a variation of it. For instance, a disconnect right above an electric one. Now, a lot of the older ones didn't have them. And, you know, some of the guys will tell them it's a good idea to upgrade. Some of you won't. That's fine. I, I don't think it's that big a deal myself. But a breaker, if the breaker can be turned off and you can put a lock on it, some areas are accepting that, you know, just to clip it off. They don't want you to turn it back on when somebody's working on it or, you know, they turn it off and it's dry or something. Also, um, if, if the electric panel's in the same room with it, you know, if the electric panel's in the same room with it and you turn it off, you don't have to really worry about it because, I mean, some guy comes in there and starts messing around the panel, you know, you tell him, hey, don't do that. So, a little different. Uh, you got to have a, a valve on there, like I said, and if it's a gas water heater, you got to have a gas shutoff valve. It's supposed to be an independent valve that shuts off that heater. You don't want to shut off the heater and kill the dryer at, at the same time. So, a gas shutoff valve. A pan. Uh, pans are a little different. Some some areas will say if it'll do structural damage to the house. Some will just say if it does damage to the house. You know, most people are going to certainly put a pan if it's in the attic. Do you guys get any water heaters in the attic out here? Huh? Yeah, we, we get we get them in the attic all the time, all the time. We get them in the attic. And what, a big mistake that they made for a while was they would put a gas water heater over a plastic pan, and that's a no no. Because you can, I've seen I've seen floors rot out so bad a water heater drop off of the legs and go down in the floor, and you're literally there's a fire like that far up above the wooden floor. People don't know it, you know. But anyway, uh, a, a pan's a good idea, a good full size drain coming off of it. Uh, I tell you, uh, one of my favorite installations would be like oh, let's say we have one in a garage. We put a lot of them in garages. And we're allowed to vent them, the TPR valve, into the yard. We're allowed to come through the house, you know, through the wall, turn an elbow down and vent outside. The downside of that is if the TPR valve drips, you'll end up with a chunk of ice. You would end up with a chunk of ice and the valve might not take it. What I like to do to them is put them in a pan, run the pan drain outside, and the TPR valve just run down to the pan. So if it did freeze up going to the outside, but I, it could still blow off. You know, and, and that's the pan oft, is often referred to as an indirect waste. So it's, it, it'll drain there, but it'll get it'll get outside. So that that's something you can do as well. But, you know, mainly the pans are for locations that you might end up with some damage. Um, they do make a, a valve that you can pipe into a pan. It'll, it'll come off of the main line coming out of the wall, go into the pan, connect to a WAGS valve, and then it'll turn in and go back up and then go into the heater. The WAGS valve stands for water and gas shutoff. And if you get water in the pan, it'll shut off the water. If it's gas, a water heater, it'll shut off the gas at the same time. So you maybe prevent a flood. You know, you'll get a situation where it might. Normally on a leaky water heater, if you turn the water off of it, people say, well, there's still 50 gallons in the heater. It's going to leak. A lot of times if you shut it off, when it's not under pressure, it doesn't leak much. Or, or if any. I've seen water heaters, you just shut the valve off. They didn't even know they had 50 gallons of water in there. A lot of times the leak on the top. It'll leak down a little teeny bit and it'll just stop. All right, one of the most important things you guys do on houses, and I'm not kidding, I think it's, it's absolutely the most important plumbing device. And in some ways, I think it's the most important device that you look at on the house. 
is the TPR valve. TPR valve, temperature, pressure, relief valve, and I take it seriously. There's a lot of things that govern this device. It is a very, very important device. People get killed by water heaters every year. And we don't hear that much about it, so we don't think about it. Here's the way the TPR valve works. It's installed, we're gonna, this is a more modern one, so it's installed in the side. The water heater heats up. When the water gets to 150 PSI or 210 degrees, it's, it's usually gonna be the 210 degrees. There's not too often you're gonna see 150 PSI. You'll see 210 degrees. When it happens, it'll blow off. As it blows off, the pressure would drop off, let's say if it was pressurized, It'll fill back up with water or fill whatever blew out will be getting cold water back in. That'll cool the heater down. A lot of times the TPR valve will seal itself off and it'll wait for a while and do it again. If it's overheating, it's going to keep releasing. You hope it's going to keep releasing if that happens. Now, look at the names. Those children were killed and the teacher's name at the bottom in Spencer, Oklahoma, when a water heater blew up and took out a wall in the cafeteria. The installer had taken the, the heat sensor off of it, the heat sensor part, and cut it off. He couldn't get his hand, apparently, in, in some fittings or something to screw it in, so he cut that off, put it in, when he did that, the water heater would still react to too much pressure. Water heaters almost always blow up because of too much temperature, not too much pressure. Almost always too much temperature. What happens is a water heater sitting there and it's cooking. And as it's cooking, you know, at 212 degrees, it makes it's, it would make steam. Well, a water heater is under pressure. So it can make it can go to 220, 230, 240, 250. it can keep rising up and you end up with superheated water in it. Then if it starts to leak through the side of the heater, finds an opening and it begins to come out, it goes from under pressure, liquid water, liquid scalding hot water, and then hits the atmosphere, flashes off to steam, and usually rockets the water heater out. And that's why superheated water you know, usually comes because it's water under pressure. That's what it happens. That's, what, that's the reason it goes, and that's why people end up hurt. By, by the way, water works the other way, too. And some of my HVAC classes, I got three- and four-day HVAC classes. In one of my HVAC classes, I point out the whole reason we put a vacuum pump on a system, we, well, the main reason is we draw out the impurities and stuff like that. But it also, if there's moisture in there, it'll boil that water off. You put that water under vacuum, the water will boil. One of my... Uh, in one of my classes, we hook a vacuum pump up to a container of water and we boil water at, at, at room temperature. Pull a vacuum on it, and you see the water boiling inside the jug. It's 80 degrees in the room. The water's boiling because I lowered the pressure over it. There's a temperature pressure relationship there. All right, a few years ago, I wrote this for Ashy, the reporter. Got a lot of stuff in it. Some of these articles are hard to get nowadays, so I, I don't know if you, can, if you can find it, but there was a lot of good information in there I think you might like, you know, like to look at. All right, water heater blew up in the 50s, killed a kid, uh, I think this was in a theater or something, it blew up and killed a kid. Here, look at the, it, um, it ended up a block away. You, you, that's the kind of terminology they use on the internet or an article, hurled 135 yards. Found part of the water heater nearly 70 feet away. These are what happens to water heaters when they explode. They often go right out of the utility room and cause a lot of damage. Now, there's a huge list here of all the different things that to be considered, primarily venting the heater, the, the vent pipe. You know, most of it boils down to don't reduce the size, make sure it can drain by gravity, you know, don't create a restriction. You know, you start putting too many elbows in there, there's a restriction. You reduce the size of the pipe, that's a restriction. Uh, cannot tie two water heaters together through the TPR valve. Some people will have three or four heaters together, they tie them all to one pipe. No, don't tie them to one pipe. Don't tie the TPR valve vent into a condensate drain. 
TPR valve is supposed to have an independent vent, so be totally isolated from any other things, nothing coming to it. If it blows off, you know exactly where it is. The valve shouldn't be connected directly to a sewer system. Some people will have a vent pipe in the room and they'll think, well, I know, and I'll cut it off and I'll, I'll put a T in there and I'll hook it in there and they think that's really good. When you tie a water heater vent pipe into plumbing, there, several things could happen, but right off the bat, it's a cross connection. You know, if you don't tie the relief valve, set the relief valve above a sink or something, it's a cross connection. And in certain circumstances, if the valve was defective, you could siphon something back through the valve or, you know, from the, the drain system. So we don't want to tie them together. Um, I'm, go I'm going to go through a few defects. And as I do, I'll, you know, I'll kind of expand what I'm talking about as far as uh, the rules for TPR valves. Of course, we got to have one. You got to have, and you got to have a vent on it. Because if it's aimed where it can cause personal injury and that can cause personal injury, you're going to have a problem. Typically, we want them to extend down to the floor uh, if it's in an area where it's safe to do that. About no more, you don't want to be a, more than six inches above the floor. Remember, if the heater's sitting on a stand, some areas put them in a the garage, they put them on a stand. If it's in the garage, remember it's six inches from above the floor, not six inches from above the stand. Well, I'll see guys run them down six inches above the stand. Well, the stand's that high off the floor. A child comes over there or an animal comes over there, your pet, and the thing would blow off. You don't want, you don't want that animal or that person to get hit with that scalding water. Um, I see a lot of this. People just kind of think of, well, I just direct it. I'm going to shoot it in a direction. I want to shoot it in a direction. Very often they just trickle. When they leak, they just kind of trickle off water. But sometimes they open up wide open. They're, they're really strange how they can do that. Uh, I mentioned I wrote an article. When I wrote that article, the, the day it posted on the internet, a woman, uh, I think it's Karen Arthur, she called me. She said she saw the ASHI article and wanted to know if this picture, the one on the left, was okay, if, if the heater was okay, but she said because it was jammed up against the wall. That stem has to move in and out for the heater to blow off. Um, the substance that's in the thermostat that sticks into the heater creates pressure and pushes the pin out with the lever on it. And the pressure, the air, or the, the actual pressure of the water pushes the stem out. It's gotta come out. Gotta be able to move the stem out in order to, you know, to, to work. So if it's jammed up against the wall, that's a problem. Gotta be able to get that stem away from the wall. You can see this is jammed up right up against the wall. This one, the one to the left of that, I just put that in there because I always, I always make a joke and say, what was the problem with this one? They ran out of zip ties because there's so many zip ties. It's crazy. This heater was leaking at the TPR valve, and they realized if they pushed down on it, it didn't leak. Well, it was leaking because it had pressure on it, and they kept putting zip ties on it, trying to hold the lever down. In other words, they were making it even more unsafe by doing that. Um, we see these sometimes in supply houses and stuff like that, uh, Home Depot. Uh, these, are, these are rated for water heaters. I think they're polypropylene. Um, other than that, you want to see material used that's rated for hot water, essentially. Um, the one on the top, back up, the one on the top is actually it's got a little clamp on it you slide that clamp down near the bottom of the heater and you screw it into the jacket so that if it does blow off that thing is pretty flimsy it doesn't flop around you know the other one is the other one is, is one where you got a the tpr valve is in the side you screw it right in it's good to secure them at the bottom you'll notice when you get to them they're very flimsy you know, they can flop around i i found a lot of them that just leak you know, you tighten them up and you let water come out of them. Sometimes they'll leak, so. Um, no PVC. PVC is rated for cold water, not rated for hot water. Uh, no valves installed between the TPR valve and the heater. They put a T in there. That's not sensing the pressure in the heater. It's sensing, or the temperature in the heater. It's actually sensing the temperature in the pipe because the sensor's not reaching into the heater now, it's reaching it, you know, toward it, but it's not gonna make it in there. So nothing in between the tank and the TPR valve. You can't, you can't have a T in there, or certainly don't want a valve in it, anything like that. How do you get this thing on there? 
that no, the va that's a that's not a uh, a stop valve. That's a boiler drain. It's just something that they could hook a hose onto, I guess, and so that's how they would do that. Now this one is one that they had to do it before they put it in. They had to screw the valve into the TPR valve and then thread the TPR valve into the tank. So they not only made it unsafe, they worked at it to make it unsafe. They actually worked on it for a while to make it bad. Uh, we can't reduce them. You know, here's one with some tubing in it. The other one's just, it went, started out at and uh, three quarter went down to half inch. The, the heater on the left shows you where the, the, the TPR valve actually goes into the wall. The one on the right was in a similar apartment there. And what they did was they wanted to go back into the pipe that was in the wall. So they turned the TPR valve up at an angle and they went uphill. So you can't do that because if it weeps, you'll get water in there on top of it. A lot of times that water will sit in there and create a rusty plug. So got to always be able to drain downhill. Uh, <laughs> That's a garden hose. It's not listed in the proper piping material. But that is a garden hose. And they cut it off and hose clamped it on there and just kind of tossed it out the side of the house there. So got to be approved material. Again, the approved material is basically the pipes that you use on hot water lines. It's approved. Now here, I told you a minute ago, can't run the TPR valve into a pipe that has other things connected to it. This was an apartment and they had other water heaters higher up and they just kept all bringing them back to the same one. And you, you know, they they more or less just tied everything into one pot. If it if it leaked outside and you walked down there and you saw it leaking outside, you might even t have to take a while to figure out which one it is because they tied them all together. But we don't want them tied together, not just because of the fact that you'd have a harder time finding which one it is, but if, if by chance you had a couple going off at the same time, it might not be able to, to blow off. Also, if somebody had the pipe opened upstairs and was working on it, it blew off, it could scald them. Anybody know what the, the issue is here? Threaded pipe. Can't have a threaded pipe at the end of the outlet pipe there because people see the water leaking and they try to fix the, they try to fix the drip. And so they'll put a cap on the end of it. They fi now they fix the drip. Well, now they don't have a TPR valve. If there's no threads there, they're not going to try to fix it. I've even seen people put a hose on it. You can thread a garden hose onto a three-quarter inch pipe thread. It's not... It, it, you got to work at it a little bit, but it'll throw it on there. And then what you have is, like, you know, a 50 foot hose on the end of it. And maybe they'll run it and maybe they would run it outside. But what what you don't want to do is give them an opportunity to create a restriction in that line. We don't want any restriction in that line. A garden hose with hot water dripping through it might collapse. Then you end up with like a 50 foot long flat piece of hose on the end of it because it's collapsed. Same thing as a plug. Hard to see until I zoom in. It's hooked up backwards. And that camera I mentioned earlier with the floppy disk, I took this picture with that one. I was walking in the guy's garage and the owner, it was a, I was doing an inspection for a buyer. The owner saw me take a picture and wanted to know what was going on. I said, well, it was installed wrong. I just put that in. Well, you just put it in wrong because it was wrong. And the, this only works one way. The garage has to be on fire and it'll open up then but until then it's not going to open up because you cannot have that element sticking out of this thing let's see if i can make this work i don't know hollis no it worked but all it did was there you go if uh let's see if i can back that That is the element that's supposed to be in the tank. That guy right there is supposed to be in the tank. So they even put an extra nipple on it so they could screw it in backwards. So they worked at it too, like the other one I mentioned. Um, I never really paid much attention to old water heaters. When I took old water heaters out, I never really looked at things to see how they held up until after I got in the home inspection business. This TPR valve was in a water heater that I put into a house that I once lived in. And at that time, my ex-wife was living in it. I, I was gone. 
she, even though we weren't married, I would go to that house and make repairs and her mother owned the house. That's weird. Yeah. You get divorced with a woman and the mom ends up owning the house. Here's the key. I liked her mother better than her. <laughs> and so I pulled that out of the heater. You can see where the, the corrosion is on that element. It's not going to sense temperature real good. And it's in the hole around the element. That's where the pressure is. So that I took out of the old heater to kind of look at it. Then I put it in the new heater. No, I just, I always tell people, I put it in the new heater. So, no, I, I didn't hate her. We just had disagreements all the time. So sometimes it's better to just move on. Um, I was in a crawl space. Uh, we have a lot of oceanfront property, bayfront property. We're right on the Chesapeake Bay. And I was in a crawl space and I heard water falling. And I turned and looked. I was, it was a really high crawl space because it was in a flooding area. And this water was coming from above the floor joists or right between the floor joists, dropping down below. And it's where they had run the TPR valve in the crawl space. They figured it was a high crawl space. It was sand. Probably wouldn't be a real issue. So they, they went with that. It has to be, it has to terminate in an area where it's readily observable. Periodically, you can tell something's wrong with that. That's the thing. Usually don't drip. Of course, a safe location. Uh, a lot of times, we would run them out on the side of the house. We, I would try to get them near the front steps or something. So when you're walking into the house, you would, if you, it was trickling, you would say, well, that's not supposed to be doing that. But this was in the crawl space. Nobody saw it. And guys, the entire crawl space, the length of time that I was standing there, filled up with steam. Look at the right front corner of the picture. That's subfloor. It did so much damage to the crawl space. The deal collapsed before I got finished with the inspection because it just so happened that the guy that was buying the house was a guy that did repairs. And he, he said there's over $30,000 worth of structural repairs needed to be done to this house. It was blowing in the crawl. It, it would have never happened <laughs> if it was readily observable. Somebody would have seen it. So it, uh, I even found what apartment it was coming from. It was a six unit apartment building. And I asked this young Navy guy, we got a lot of young kids there, call them squids. So anyway, met this guy there. And he, uh, I said, hey buddy, have you, have you, is your water heater make noises? He said about every two to three hours, it just raises cane for a few minutes and then it stops. I said, how often does that? But he said, well, it's been doing it since I moved here six months ago. So that thing had been opening up and blowing that water in the crawl space at least six months. And first of all, thank God it was blowing off. It may not have done it, but so long and it could have killed the guy, you know. So they do blow. Um, again, I don't know if this is going to work, but we're going to try it. Hollis, you'll have to tell me if the... No. You can see it here. Can we see it online? You don't have to necessarily hear it so much, but you can see it. That was just a heater, 12 gallon heater overheating, 12 gallons. You see the tank where it's marked up at the upper. All right, here's another angle. Now watch this, look at the upper part of the picture. That water heater goes, that water heater goes 400 feet, lands in the field. It was strict, it was just a, it was a 12 gallon heater, took off, plugged off the TPR valve and let it cook until it blew up. And this guy told me, you know, uh, uh, Randall Hilton, he said, yeah, go ahead and use a picture. I put it out there so people could see how dangerous these things are. 
because um, everybody always says, well, did you see the Mythbusters? Everybody's seen the Mythbusters ones uh, just about, but these, this is available online. All you gotta do is go to waterheaterblast.com. You can download and, and you know, and, and put it in your uh, laptop. Um, I've already mentioned the beyond the scope stuff. If your heater overheats and the buttons off, you know, reset buttons off, change both thermostats. If you don't get as much hot water as you typically do, it's probably the bottom element almost all. Remember, if the top element burns out, the heater won't heat at all. The bottom element won't heat until it heats up at the top. You know, this is all electric, of course. All right, gas water heaters, no bedrooms or bathrooms, all those closets. Uh, I, every state I go to, I, I have to, I don't know if, if they'll allow it or not. Uh, they will allow us to put it in a bedroom closet or a bathroom closet, providing, um, you know, gas water here, providing we bring in the fresh air, you know, from outside. Not, it doesn't have, it can't go from the room. It can't come from the room outside the closet. Uh, the door has to have an automatic closer. It has to be gasketed. What they're worried about here is they're, they're worried about carbon monoxide poisoning or something like that right in the next to a bathroom or a bedroom or something like that. So some areas, what they've done is they've, they've allowed it as long as we address the space. Cause it has to be dedicated for the water heater. You know, you're not supposed to be hanging clothes in there, stuff like that. So some areas will allow it for years. It was just, no, we can't do it. You know, direct vent water heaters, a lot of direct vent water heaters are, are in there and they just, have, again, have to make it just for the clothes, but that would be an okay place. I think what they ran into is there was a lot of finished rooms over the garage. They put a water heater in there or un, and they were unfinished at first. And then when they decided to finish them up, they had a water heater in there to take care of the whole house and they would have a hard time relocating it. So code officials finally came up with a way said, okay, when you frame that room out, put a little closet there just for the heater, bring in your fresh air, you know, your combustion air from the outside, put a door closer, put a gasket on there, on the, on the door. And, you know, they, they approached the program from a different, or the, the problem at a different way. Instead of just, you know, saying, don't do it, they figured out a way you could. Uh, 2003, I saw an article recently and it said something new about water heaters. And I'm like, 2003 is not new. You know, that's a long time. But basically what it was is the FVIR, flammable vapor ignition resistance requirements came out. The water heater companies, a lot of them work together on this. They're trying to figure out a way so that if the combustion air going into one of these gas water heaters in a garage, uh, would draw in flammable vapor, leak from a car parking in the garage, uh, lawn mowers, mini bikes. Uh, honestly, I've, I've even seen the ones on, on uh, platforms, people put turpentine under them with the paint to store it. I'm like, the people have no clue. But anyway, the, uh, the requirement that these guys were, or the challenge these guys uh, were, uh, required to come up with was a way to stop this from being a problem. Um, so they developed a, you know, a flammable vapor ignition resistant thing. So essentially the way it works is if flammable vapor goes into the heater and it ignites, the fire doesn't come out. Okay. It, it's more or less achieved by a, a thing called an arrestor plate. It lets gas go in, won't let fire come out. Some of them, when they when that happens, they shut off. Uh, they shut off the gas to it. Some of them are resettable. Some of them are not. The resettable ones are nice. You can go right to it. Um, that's kind of what they look like. They're the first teenagers you guys probably saw the little spark igniter on top of them, the little piezo type igniter where you push it down and it sparks. The front doors. Once you take the little loose cover off the front, the the doors are gasketed. They have a sight glass. The um, there's grommets around the gas lines and stuff like that. In other words, we don't want vapor to be able to get in there. Uh, I've had people say, well, the, the little glass was knocked out of the peephole, but it's still flammable vapor ignition resistant. No, it ain't because now gas can go in through the peephole. So, you know, you, you, you need to get it fixed. So when, when you see something like that, he was just trying to figure out a way to make it legal. Can I just sit it on the ground? You know, what, what, you know, they all these different questions. So anyway, um, these things are tricky to check. You're not going to pull the cover loose on one of these guys because you have to take the whole burner out in most cases in order to get to it. 
Uh, if you look immediately below the red grommets at the bottom, you see this little black strip there. That's the screen that the flammable vapor could enter through. It's, it's basically drawing in the combustion air all the time. But if flammable vapor would enter the heater, it would enter through there and it, it could flash off. Some of the heaters you can see on the side of them. The two on the left, you can see the um, like some grill work built right into the heater. That's where the that's where the gas is in her. The one on the right is a, a direct vent heater, so it doesn't really need one. It takes its fresh air from outside. Um, how does it work? Regular water heaters, the vapor the, or the gases, I guess, the air combustion. It just goes in through the front door on the old ones. The new ones are sealed off. So on the new ones, if you get flammable vapor in there, they're actually directed through these vent openings in the heater they go under the arrestor plate and then rise up through the arrestor plate that's how the that's how the uh combustion gases enter the heater and if it's flammable vapor of course it'll do the same thing and once that gas gets inside it can actually flash off it'll burn when it blows it won't let the fire come out and like i said it'll it'll shut the heater down uh, Bradford White, I, they give me a bunch of stuff for their for their classes, and, they, and theirs actually had a reset button on it. Now, I'll tell you where I found more trouble on these things than any other place is if they were near, if they were near um, a dryer. Even if the dryer was vented outside and stuff, enough lint around that dryer would get funneled into that. Uh, new design FDIR firebox there enough would go in there that it would it would clog it up have any of you ever ignited dryer lint it's like boom it's gone just that quick it just flashes off and in my opinion what happens is enough dryer lint gets in there it it flashes off as if it had a mini fire and you know a mini explosion in there and it'll shut them off so when they first hit the when they first hit the market, they even said, "Ah, it's not going to be a problem. You're not going to have to keep it clean around the front. Just you know, just brush it down with a broom." Later on, they started realizing certain things are a problem, and dryer lint's one of them. Dryer lint gets in there. You have to you you probably will have to pull the whole burner out. The guy working on it, I've had to pull the burner completely out. Take my rat tail brush that I would clean an oil burner with and clean it out and vacuum it out real good because that dryer lint will shut them off. You know so. If you have it nearby, you know, you, you, you would probably want to tell your client to keep that little screen vacuum, keep all the dryer lint up around that thing, clean it up, or you're going to have a problem. And you know when it goes off, on the, you know, when you got guests and you need hot water, it always picks the worst time to happen. Uh, I mentioned direct vent just a minute ago. A direct vent heater, um, you've got a vent pipe, a big vent pipe, and inside that vent pipe, there's another vent pipe. The one on the inside is carrying out the spent fuel, and then around it through that is where your fresh air comes in. All right, we, we have a lot of them because they, one, we install them in garages. So you can slide it up against the outside garage wall. You know, that's easy to vent. You ain't got to worry about a whole lot of B vent and stuff like that. But anyway, this was one I was actually replacing. I remember, my, again, my dad was saying, why are you taking pictures? You know, well, so that I could sit in a place on September the 8th in 2023 and talk about water heaters. That's why I took that picture. Yeah, so actually he's been gone 17 years now, but I think he would think, I think he would think, hey, I never thought about that, you know? I said, yeah, I figured out a way to make money without having to get my hands dirty, you know? So anyway, uh, in a way, the air coming in around the outside, of course, it provides your fresh air for your combustion. It's supposed to cool it down a little bit. Do not touch that outer pipe. It might cool it down a little bit. The key is little bit because it's still cooking. That pipe gets pretty hot. On the outside, it looks like this. You see an intake and you see an exhaust, and then they put the little cover over it, and the cover, the cover kind of makes it work. You're actually discharging out the top. You can kind of see the little... the if you look toward the back, you can see there's kind of a little gap in there. That's where the fresh air is coming in in the back and the discharge coming out to the front. Where they messed up a little bit is some of these heaters are now FVIR and they're taller. They're a little bit taller, so you can't go back to an old vent if you replace the heater. You have to redo the vent. 
I don't know if it still if it still applies. For a little while, they put out the instructions and they said it was okay to actually dip it down and go out. And I'm like, yeah, that's not happening, you know. But anyway, that's they work pretty good, you know. When you get on the outside of the house, though, if you're up there trying to see if it's don't touch that. See that word hot? They're not kidding. It, like I said, it gets really hot up there. Uh, some of you might have seen these. They're fairly fairly new. I mean, you know, last ten years or so. Uh, they're actually power vented and in many cases we're condensing pretty good in these and there's a the top part of the heater notice that there's connections on this water heater on the side because the top part is the the venting mechanism and stuff like that and the way this works normally you don't have the fire on the front of the heater like this by the way if you have the fire on the front of the heater write it up okay that, that's just to show you where the fire comes from it's down low like that but what happens is the the a normal heater would just have it come straight out the top well the way this works it it's got a long long heat exchanger in there there's a fan that's going to come on and it's going to draw the spent fuel through that big old helical looking heat exchanger and what it'll do is it'll come up and then it actually goes back down and it comes out through the back and rises up through another piece of pipe before it's ex exhausted out the top. At the top of that heater, you can see a little nub at the top of that heater. That's where the exhaust finally goes out. So this thing will condense, it, it, it's, and it's got this big heat exchanger on it, so all that gets hot. So it, it heats the water up fast. Everybody I've ever talked to, and I get to a lot of these conventions like this, things like this, and people tell me, oh yeah, I got one in my house, it's great. So they do, they do a good job. You can, you can put them in place of a standard water heater. There is one difference. A standard water heater doesn't need an electrical outlet, a gas water heater. There's no need for an electric outlet. These have to have an electric outlet because they got a fan. So if somebody says, I want to switch over because I want more hot water and I'm not really into the, into the tankless heaters, they can do this. They just have, a, have an outlet put there. So you can, it's got a service cord on it. You just plug it in. Uh, another one, you guys probably see these, you see boilers as indirect heaters. Essentially, you can take like a zone off of a boiler and you pipe it into a little tank. Sometimes they're just sitting, you know, it just looks like a water heater sitting next to the boiler. And they can pump water into that tank, circulate it through the boiler, and they can have a coil inside there that picks up the heat. The advantage of these things are, especially on a big house, a lot of people want to have a really big house, especially if they love that kind of heat. They're, they're able to do multiple zones through the house. So if you've got a big, huge, you know, five, 6,000 square foot house, you might want to have a, a water heater at this end and that end. It's, it will be way better than having the circulator lines going. It'll be much more efficient. So what they can do is they can actually set these tanks in closets and stuff and there's no fire you know it's just it's just basically just you know some hydronic lines that you pump down there and that would put your water heater right right there at your bathrooms you know uh, you know just depending on how many bathrooms you have it's the same thing as many of you've probably seen hydro coils that put in duct work the coils heat up and they run the air across it for heating the house and they and they there it's connected to an evaporator coil as well and the evaporator coil cools the house down those are nice. And then you have one plant to produce the hot water. And that's a big boiler. So the big boiler will produce the hot water. And then all these little separate zones make it nice. Uh, here's one actually installed. So it goes right, goes right over to the, right over to the boiler. Uh, who, who can see, uh, look at the boiler. What kind of boiler is it? <laughs> I don't mean brand. <laughs> Hollis goes burn them. I mean, what's the fuel? Oil. oil. Guys, you would be surprised how many times I go and I ask people this and they don't get it. They, they don't see that oil line with that oil filter. They don't see it. Uh, we had a guy working for us. I worked for a company one time. We had 13 inspectors. We did 4,000 inspections a year from the ocean front all the way out to 95 to King's Dominion. And we had guys serving in different areas. And, and of course, we fudged the numbers because we would count the rechecks where you go back out afterwards if they made repairs. Anyway, we were advertising 4000 a year. And we were losing some guys, so we went to replace, <laughs> replace them. And uh, this inspector came to us, and she was 
she said she was certified in Illinois. And my boss took her out and he was just excited because he wanted to get an inspector to replace it. He's just looking so hard, he couldn't get it. The inspector would go out with him every day. Well, after a few days, the girl was from Texas originally, and she would talk, he had the Texas lingo and stuff going. And I realized he was, get, he was getting over it because she would talk about stuff. And one day he came in and he said, I'm not gonna be able to keep her. And I said, why not? He says, cause I asked her today, we were looking at a furnace, standing in front of the furnace. And I said, what kind of furnace is it? Gas or oil? And she didn't know. And he was literally standing in front of it. And I said, oh, that's a shame, man. He said, yeah, she's supposed to be certified in Illinois. You don't even know the difference with the furnace. And then he stopped and he just stood there for a minute. And he says, and if I hear this yippee ki stuff one more time, I'm going to pull my hair out. He just, <laughs> he was so disappointed. I could tell he wanted to hire this person so bad. But, you know, she overrepresented herself. Came in and telling him he could do all this stuff and couldn't know the difference between oil and gas. So, uh, how many of you, well, you, I'm sure you do if you see a lot of boilers, you see a lot of tankless coils, you know, a lot of tankless coils. They're real popular. What happens to them when they get old? They usually don't produce. You know, you get some of these real old ones and you're lucky to get, uh, you know, a, a couple of gallons out of it before it starts getting cold. Burnham's actually pretty good. They got their coils go on the top. The flange is real easy to deal with it, you know, take it off, gasket it. And you can, there are companies that'll make you a new coil if you have the flange pattern. They'll actually do that. Do you guys see Ari Michael around here? Yeah. I think they're, Ari Michael's huge. They're big in our area. Uh, we, we, you know, go to them. And a couple of times they've, they've told me, can you get me a cardboard cutout of that flange and we'll get you, you know, we'll get you a new coil made up. So they're really popular. Uh, when you're trying to explain to somebody, a novice, how these things work, what I tell them is, Imagine if you drilled a hole in this wall and stuck a pipe all the way across the room and it went out the other side. And if you ran water through the pipe, there wouldn't be much change in the temperature of the water when it got from this end to that end. But fill the room up with scalding hot water. Then as the water was flowing through the pipe, what does it do? It picks up the heat from the water surrounding it. So essentially, it's like this. There's, there's a boiler heating water and the coil for the hot water heater the tankless coil is submerged in the water. So when the water flows through, it's not actually touching the fire, it's just touching the hot water. And most of them over the years will start scaling up. We flush them and have to do stuff like that. If you have to do too much flushing at some point, it's usually better just to get another one. A lot of times people will take and just They'll put another heater next to it. I, we find it on gas boilers that they want another heat. They want a, a, a regular storage tank water heater anyway. And they want one right next to the boiler because they can turn the boiler off in the summertime and they just like to use that instead of keeping the boiler on. All right, tankless water heaters. More or less the way a tankless water heater works is when the water begins flowing through the heater. As the water begins flowing through the heater, the flame comes on and it's heating the metal and the water is running through the tubes. And this, so the fire comes on as long as the water is flowing. When the water stops flowing, it cuts off. Only flows when the water is going through it. Uh, a few of the problems we've had with them over the years is people get confused when you say instant hot water or something like that. And they think when they turn on a faucet anywhere in the house, they've got instant hot water. If that heater is still in the garage and it took a couple minutes to get down there before, it's still going to take a couple minutes. So sometimes we want to put a cir circulator on there. The problem with these heaters is to circulate the water through the heater. Initially, the problem was the heater would come on anytime the pump came on and turned it on. So some guys would set a little tank heater next to it and we would recover the tank with the heater, but we could circulate water through the tank to the far end of the house and give them that instant hot water that they wanted. Some of these tankless heaters now more or less have a little tank in it. So it's a tankless heater with a tank, which is kind of different. But they come up with different ways because the circulator loop thing is definitely needed for some people. They're not happy with them if you tell them instant hot water. It, you know, it's people need to explain this a little better. 
you know, because I think that that's what people think. Now we try to put them in if we can find another location in the house, uh, close to a bathroom. You know, we I mean, we put a lot of stuff in attics. We'll build a we'll build a little wall from the rafters, from the rafters down to the the ceiling joists. Put a couple. Of, is that me? I don't know what that noise is. Sounds like the beginning of a rock opera getting ready to start. Because of the wireless mics turned on, just make sure they're turned off. I don't know. I just hear I hear a thump. So I was I just wondering. Well, anyway, what we would do is we would put them up near the bathroom in the attic, and we would do them in such a way we'd be up there where we could run the vent straight out. You know, we'd put one of those concentric type vents on the roof, and it was pretty good. And if people got their water, we would tap into the line somewhere, so it put it a lot closer to people. But we would normally put the the thermostat control. We would put that thermostatic control in the hallway, and mo most people don't mess with them after they get used to it. But until then, they could always go up and program it to produce a little hotter water. You know, whatever they wanted, they could they could do it that way. We just found it it worked better. But they need to understand just because it's tankless and it talks about it, it really is a water heater. It, it's an on demand heater. It, it comes on when you need it. And it doesn't store any hot water to speak of. And so that's that's the difference. So people, like I said, people will get that a little little confused when they think of that. Yeah, go ahead. Kenny, we have one. We have a Noritz and uh, about a month and a half ago, we stopped getting hot water to our master bathroom shower. It was just the master bathroom shower. Um, here in the long run, I fig finally figured it out. Uh, we have uh, not very good water to the home, a lot of calcium, mineral deposits. So the shower head kind of clogged up over time and it reduced the flow. So basically what it was telling the water heater was- It wouldn't, it wouldn't let the water heater rise up. What he's like, talking about, you slower flow. It would be like, instead of it being a shower, it thought it was a lavatory. Exactly. It was, it was only asking for a little Because the bit flame of comes water. up. The flame, the flame adjusts for its need. That's how, we, that's how we size these things. So once I took the shower head off and soaked it in like vinegar for an mm -hmm. hour, put it back on, it was fine. Uh, one of the things he's, what he's talking about are these shower heads, believe it or not, that is one of the areas where they believe people get Legionella from. Dirty shower head, it, the, the Legionella can be in the biofilm. And sometimes, again, it would be a mist. You'd have to breathe a mist. It, they don't believe it comes from drinking it. They believe it's inhaled and stuff like that. And so, yeah, if the, if, Remember, it, it adjusts for the flame depending on the flow. You don't have to have a big heaping flame when you're just washing your hands at a little sink. But you go fill the Roman tub up, big old jetted tub, you know, that's going to be, that's going to need a lot more water coming through it, you know. We used to actually put in like 80 gallon water heaters in a closet near one of those big tubs, just for the tub. So we know it loses, you know, uses a lot. Here's the sad thing about it. You can't really convince the people that they're only going to use this twice. <laughs> you know, they're only going to run it twice. The first night that they get it, they'll run it, take a shower in it, and then they might run it when they're getting ready to move to make sure they wash it out real good. But they, they, people just don't use them that, that often. And, but, you know, it is what it is. Here's one uh, on the wall. We, do, we are required to put the TPR valves on them. Actually, it's a pressure relief. Not TPR, but it's pressure relief valve. We're, now this one's piped in, you know, it's piped right in. They do make a kit that you can put on the bottom of the heater that did a screw right in the kit. I love them because the kit is made so you can shut off the lines coming to the heater, but still keep a loop, the loop open through the heater, and you can put a pump on it and flush chemical through and clean it. Chemical is basically vinegar white vinegar stuff you can pump it through there and, and again that's one of those things they said for a long time i oh, never have to flush them off and now they're like yeah probably every year you know you put the chemical on there it goes through the heater comes out a hose into a bucket and you got your pump sitting right in the bucket picks it back up and pumps it through i got one of the little kits with the pump and everything in there that's like i said i'll take them some meetings sometimes and and uh and, and just show how it's done i get asked some sometimes people say well i wonder why he's doing that we don't have to do that a lot of guys like to see what gets done when they re recommend stuff, you know, so we'll, we'll actually do that kind of stuff. 
Yeah, um, go ahead. Do you think electric tankless water heaters make any sense at all? I mean, they'll work. Uh, I put in two and both of them leak. I don't get many calls for it. I didn't many get, you know, so I, unfortunately that, my experience with them is that. And um, I mean, the, the only reason I would buy one is, or put one in is because I didn't have any access to gas. If I had access to gas, I'm gonna get gas. Now, here's the thing. I think it's New York. New York says they're, they're restricting them from gas stuff. You know, I talked to an inspector there recently, um, and he and he said that you know it was going to be electric. A lot of stuff was going to electric, and people are not going to be happy, especially when they do it with cooking and stuff. You know, I'm hoping. Well, no, what's going to happen is there's going to be a big black market for that stuff. People people will figure out a way. You know, people. If anytime they do stuff like that, like uh, they for the. Uh, the SEER ratings on equipment, air conditioning equipment, stuff like that. It used to be the SEER rating was for everybody. Everybody followed the same thing. Well, now we have zones. So you'll see equipment, you probably have, you'll see equipment that will say right on it that this equipment's not to be installed in. It'll, it'll, it'll tell you one of the zones. Well, if a guy figures out a way to make some money off of it, they're going to show up in your zone, a zone near, you know, your zone is going to be there. It's going to show up in a zone near you. There's always something going on like that. Always something going on. They, uh, when they said that you couldn't get an electric water heater over 55 gallon, when they, the, some of the standards came out, we'll talk about them in a little bit. Guys started hoarding, hoarding them. They were buying them like crazy, the original heaters, because the new heaters were going to be fatter. And they knew they wouldn't be able to fit in the same spot. You could buy them off of eBay, the original heaters. You could just buy them off of eBay because basically they, they were going to quit manufacturing them. But if you had them in stock, you could buy them. And I'm finding out all these guys, oh, yeah, I got, I got like 20 of those things, you know, if you need one, you know, and it'll go in there and they would mark it up because you didn't want to, you didn't want to put a smaller heater in. You know, you, when you needed, when you had a 50 and you couldn't put the new 50 in because it was too fat, you didn't want to, you know, you didn't want to put a lower wind, but if a guy had one, you'll pay a little extra to have it done. By the way, a good plumber can take a 40 gallon heater and make it perform like a 50 using a tempering valve. You know, you can, you can put a tempering valve on a water heater, turn the temperature way up, and the water coming out of the heater will be like 130, 140 degree water. And before it leaves the heater, you temper it with a little cold water to bring it down to a susceptible level. You don't use as much hot water. You know, so a lot of a lot of guys will that understand it just say, "Well, your fifty won't fit in there. I'll put a forty in and and temper it." You know, it's so, and many of them I found if you shop it out, you can find a heater that's taller, not wider. But the wider part that seems to be the biggest seem to be the biggest issue. Some of these heaters outside of the house, um, we've got them in Virginia Beach, which is just stupid. I'll be riding by a house and. You know, like I said, when you're in the profession, you see stuff that other people don't see, you know, and you'll see a water heater going down the road. And I, I've seen some a block from the ocean front in Virginia Beach. Guys, that salt air eats up everything. You know, we got we got units with uh, heating and cooling units outside that never make it through the warranty and the manufacturers won't honor it because they said it's considered hazardous because the salt just eats them up, hazardous conditions. The salt just destroys them. I had... Uh, five houses with two York heat pumps and not a single one of them lasted the warranty. The, the salt air eat, literally ate through the compressor, ate through the compressor and the side of the compressor started leaking. And then that was it. I, I put, I put the same unit in a house in Hatteras, same thing. I went down to Hatteras to take a camper down there with a buddy of mine. We'd hang out down there and work on this guy's house for a few hours until we got this system in. He called me about four and a half years later. This thing's leaking, and I thought I could get my warranty made good. I said, you want to talk to them, talk to them. They're not going to give you a warranty at Hatteras. I don't know. When I used to buy, I went to carry our York school, and they were Borg Warner yeah. back then. They were big. I, I was there during the champion heat pump stage, which was great. It was something new. We were, we were plugging in test stuff out in the yard, pushing buttons. Making, making the equipment do stuff before anybody was doing it. 
now it's like, you know, it's typical today. But you could simulate conditions with these little testers. You know, one of the one of the weirdest problems I had one time, I, I was working on a heat pump and it, at night it would go off. It'd get to about 72 degrees at night. You know, during the day it's 80, 90 degrees, but at night when the temperature would cool down about 72 degrees, the unit would shut off. I was like, what in the world's going on? This is in the summertime. Well, I get out there and I get working on it one day and I'm standing there looking in the backyard and I notice there's a tree in the backyard that has a burnt mark on it. It got hit by lightning. And the guy, the guy told me, yeah, oh man, that thing got hit by lightning. He said, you know, we're standing there looking out the window at the storm and all of a sudden, boom. What had happened was that power surge destroyed a sensor on the unit and it was supposed to sense 10 below zero. When it got to 10 below zero, in the wintertime, it would shut all the equipment down. It wasn't really safe to run the equipment at 10 below zero. I hooked that equipment up and realized that when it would get down to 72 degrees, it thought it was 10 below zero. The, the electrical surge destroyed the, the little sensor. It was, it was kind of weird, you know, the way the, the whole situation came up. I learned a lesson. You would take a two minute break? Two minutes. All right, let's get going again, guys. Okay. Okay, I got a, uh, an image of a tankless heater here on the outside of the house. Like I said, you get out in the southwest and places like that. Good area for them. You'll see you'll see of them outside. The the nice thing about that is you don't need the footprint print in the house, and you know, so you can you can put them outside. Uh, I will tell you this: some of them they'll put them in a wall. They'll build a cavity in the wall. They'll put the units in the wall and they have this little jacket thing that comes on the it goes on the bottom and it actually covers up the piping. The the downside of those things are a wasp will get in there. You go to open up that cabinet and you're fighting wasp and yellow jackets and stuff like that. So be careful if you if you get if you actually get in there. All right, here's the heater. Essentially what happens is heater's off, somebody turns the water on the faucet. The water comes on the faucet. As the water's coming out, it'll open, the flow sensor will sense the water. The water will begin to flow through the heater. The burner will come on. It'll start going through the heater. The heat exchanger will get hot. And basically, as the water's passing through, it's going to heat up, come out of the spout. That's, that's it. You turn the heater off, or turn the faucet off, it turns the heater off. You know, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. Um, somebody just mentioned, I think it was the online guy, he mentioned uh, flow rates and stuff like that. A lot of people know to, a lot of people know when you, when you size a storage tank heater, first of all, I don't try to tell people how to size them. It's, it's too easy just to tell them to go online. Everybody's got a sizing chart. But there is a difference. A storage tank heater, basically look at it as, I'm using the water and then I got to wait for it to heat up. Okay, so that means, you know, capacity is important. If you got two or three people that are going to take a shower behind each other and you got a 40 gallon electric heater, you're not going to have enough. Okay, and it's not going to recover. Certainly electric heater is not going to recover if you're doing one behind the other. So that could be a problem. You go to any any of the manufacturers. Uh, A.O. A. Smith, State, whatever, you go to them and they'll, they'll have a chart for you. Now, it's a difference between how they heat, there's a difference between how they size than, than the storage tank. The tankless heaters, tankless heaters are based on volume. The flow of water, the flow of water going through the unit. So if you've got a lavatory running, almost any of them will handle that flow. That's not going to be a problem, though. When you turn on the lavatory, the water will come on. The, the burner itself will adjust. It might not need to adjust, but to, you know, 19, 20,000 BTUs, you'll have a little heat, you'll be fine. All of a sudden, you open up a big fixture, you know, a bathtub. Bathtubs use, some of the bathtubs are, you know, you're going four gallons a minute. You know, so the bathtubs, when they start coming on, it's a lot of water coming out. What does that mean? It's going to be a lot more water flowing through the heater that has to be heated. So the capacity is going to have to be greater. You're going to have to size it out based on your lifestyle and what you're going to run. If you're running two bathtubs at the same time, you're going to have to either get a monstrous tankless heater or one that's got a, 
really kick and burner on it, or you're going to have to are you going to have to sister them, you know, sister the heaters or divide them up and put one in one part of the house, one in the other. When you got that much going through it, but usually what we recommend to people is just tell us what the likelihood will be of with the most fixtures running at the same time. Now a lot of times they'll lie to you because they know if they tell you, you know. Well, you know, I, I might have a, a faucet running in the, in the kitchen and I might have, you know, a shower going or something like that. You know, that's your numbers are going to be totally different than if they come out and tell you I got a bathtub running and I got different things like that. So they, you, you just got to try to figure a lot of this out what they're going to what they're actually going to be using. You guys aren't sizing, I'm assuming, you know, but, you know, if I saw a little off the wall storage uh, off the wall tankless water heater sitting you know, sitting up on a wall somewhere and it was like a hundred and some thousand BTUs and then they got two full bathrooms and stuff like that, I might, I might at least be concerned. But all this stuff is easy to size on the internet. You go in there and you pull up, do uh, you guys see Renai's heaters? We see a lot of Renai's. I think somebody said Noritz while ago. It's all out there. The information's out there. But whereas a storage tank is based on the, you need that first capacity, that water, you don't have to worry about capacity on the tankless. The tankless is going to produce it as it's coming out. But just remember, as the flow gets higher, the number of fixtures that come out, or the number of fixtures that are hooked to it that are running, the burner's got to get higher. So the burner capacity is huge. You know, I used to see them, you know, low 100,000 BTUs, and now it's nothing to see 200 some thousand BTU tankless heater. When you say that you put two tankless water heaters together in series, so they're both plumbed in together, uh, no, they don't have to be. They the don't necessarily fixtures. have to be series. You can you can pipe them together, other one way. Next to the, yeah. One next to one yeah. each other. Yeah, but yeah. they're plumbed together, so it's going to be drawing to all the same yeah. fixtures at the same time. Yeah, you can draw draw it that way. way. Yeah, you don't see that that often. Normally, you have a really big house. A lot of times, you're, you're able to put you know, another heater somewhere else in the house. But, you know, you can, you can sister them. Uh, I don't know that I got the picture in here, but I got a picture of like 10 of them on one wall. It was for, um, I, th I think it was a, a nursing home or something like that that had a lot of, a lot of rooms and it was just, they were just lined up. You know, so there's ways that, you but know. they were all feeding through the same plumbing system. They're feed yeah, the, well, no. But, well, they were probably divided up into some zones, but they weren't 10 zones. Some of them were helping each other. You know, of course, they probably had medical equipment in there and all kinds of stuff. Capacity is contingent on how many people are going to be running the water at the same time. You know, and, you know, they only get so big because now you're, you're starting to get too big. You're going to have different size flus, and then you're going to run into issues like that. Go ahead. Does the area of the country that they're installed in have anything to do with it, meaning like the winter time in this uh, state? Good, good point. I'm glad you said that. Very much so. The other, the other factor that comes into play is the water temperature going into it. So do they manufacture them differently for certain areas or? Oh, it's not so much you manufacture, you got to size them differently. Okay. Okay. It's the temperature rise. You remember temperature drop, like on an air conditioner, 15 to 20 degrees, the temperature rise is important. If you're up north, the water going into the heater might be, you know, 35 degrees in the middle of the winter or something like that, but that's important. Whereas you live where I live, we only put water pipes 18 inches deep, you know, and, and even in the wintertime, the water is probably going to be in the 50s. So it only has to run the water up, you know, nowhere. It doesn't have to run the water up nowhere near what it would if that water was in the 40s. You know, it, it doesn't have to do as big a job. So the temperature of the water coming in and the capacity, the capacity or the requirement that the fixtures have are your, are your big consideration. I'm glad he said that because I normally remember it. But like I said, I'm, I'm losing it. But anyway, yeah, that's that's real important. I tell you what, we had a, a spell probably 20 years ago, and it was just hot all the time, and the ground got baked. And our water lines are pretty shallow. And we had people complaining that they had hot water coming out of their cold faucet. And when we would get there, it was just coming out of the earth hot. It had been so hot for so long. Then we had a really extreme cold winter. It was actually, it was before, it was the other way around. It got really cold one year. And some buildings overnight, the water line, part of the water line would freeze. Because when you, you tell somebody you're going to put a water line in 18 inches deep, 
a lot of times when you go to cover it, it kind of bumps it up a little bit. And some of the lines will have little humps in it, you know, especially if it's a, a plastic or something. So some of the lines were probably barely a foot down. And they that winter was so cold it froze. And, the, and here's the thing. It stayed so cold for so long, instead of trying to thaw the lines out, we dug them up and replaced them. We just, we just cut it off at the building, took it loose from the meter, and got on top of it with a ditch witch and, brrr, and just whipped across the yard and put a new line in. You know, Most of the time, in my area, when I would see a water line freeze, I would go in the crawl space and try to go near where the water line came in up under the foundation. Nine times out of ten, it was near a foundation vent that was open. And I just take and put some heat right there near the foundation vent on the pipe where it came up. Very often, it, it would thaw it out. You know, you know, would would heat it up enough right there. One time, I remember going to a house, and the lady she she said that another company had been out there. She said for hours, and she said they did one thing I'm not sure is right. And I said, "What are you talking about?" She said, "Go look in the water meter." And I went and looked at the water heater and opened it up, and you could tell something was going on in that heater uh, or meter. They had poured glue, PVC glue, in the water meter box and set it on fire. <laughs> <laughs> the guy said he thought the water meter for. I was like, well, there's ways to check for that. You know, break the union loose and see if there's water coming out of it. But he literally said it on there. And the lady said, I thought that was kind of weird, but, you know, they don't know. But she she showed me the bill, and they built the guy built her for fire. He just wrote fire and had a price next to fire. I thought, this, this is ridiculous, you know. But I, I went under that house. I wasn't there an hour, but I was experienced. So I went to the house and I crawled right over the, oh, well, there's a the foundation vent right there. I just heated that, that pipe up for a few minutes and you start hearing boom, boom, water trying to push through that pipe where it's moving. Once it starts moving, it's done. It'll, it'll go ahead and thaw out. It'll go ahead and once you get the movement, that's why, you know, one of the things about dripping your pipes, you're keeping some movement going on there. You know? um, drain pipes typically don't freeze, but if you got, you know, a lot of the older neighborhoods, you probably probably see it in some of your neighborhoods. They'll have a pipe exposed on the outside of the house. I see the cast iron pipe crack from top to bottom. But what happens, people say, I don't understand why it does that because it, there's, it's not full of water. You'll have a dripping faucet. Dripping faucet, it will drip, water will go down, it'll freeze. And it'll keep adding up and adding up and adding up. And then it can become the blockage of ice. And then enough water gets in there, a lot of times it'll just, it, you know, it only has to crack the pipe in one section a lot of times. It'll, it'll crack it all the way down. You get there and you're running water and everything. You finally get everything going. You don't even notice it at first. You know, you don't notice anything until you're running it for a while and then you start seeing water leaking out of there. One, some of the prettiest things I've ever seen were why I would walk around the back of a house during an ice storm or a freeze and the trees would have icicles hanging off of it and stuff like that. Of course, the people inside the house are freezing to death. They got no, they got no heat. They got water everywhere, and you're out there, you know, just look, looking at the pretty sights. Uh, this kind of goes along with that. If you have like a small house, you know, it only got one bathroom, you're probably going to find that the average average tankless heater is going to be able to handle that with no problem. You start, you start getting into, you know, bigger houses. Like I said, you you may find yourself sistering them. You may find them, you know, dividing them up, you know, because they, they, there's a limited number of capacity. You, you just have to see. I haven't sized a big one in a long time. I really don't know what the biggest heaters are that are out there, but you know, it it, it is an issue. Uh, th there's that valve I mentioned a while ago. See where the see where the pressure relief valve screws in the side. Now the the valve with the blue handle and the red handle. You, they're actually turned off right now. If you turn those off, that means you don't have any cold water or hot water coming into it. By that orange arrow, it's supposed to be blue. I, when I switch programs or something, the colors don't always come over on the on the slides. But look above it. See the little, uh, just above those handles with the little keyed slots? Those are valves you stick your hoses on to flush the heater. So you shut the two lines off, the red and the blue handle valve off, and you take those little caps off and you can flush water through the, you know, well, we flush, like I said, an acid, which is basically white vinegar. You, you pump it through there. What you do is you hook a pump up to it. The pump sits down into a, like a five gallon bucket and you put the chemical in there and it comes out of your little pump. It goes in through like the cold line and where the line comes out of the hot line, you just drop that line back in the bucket and you just circulate the water through the system. I let it run about 40 minutes. And, you know, if it's a really clogged up coil, it'll, it'll be some nasty looking water when it's finished. 
Yeah, it's going through. It's on the inside. You know, it's definitely on the inside of it, and, it, and it'll just flush any crud and stuff out of there. Out. How often do you recommend it? Uh, so it, you know, it just depends on the quality of your water. If I was going to give somebody a number, I'd tell them, you know, probably do it once a year. You know, but but it, again, it depends on the water. A lot of times you can, a lot of times you can figure it out. But uh, you know, if you live in a in an area that's got some crappy well water or something like that. And you live in another area where maybe the city water is cleaner. You don't know. And a lot of times it's vice versa. We got areas we got areas in Hampton Roads that have high levels of chlorine, and there's another area there that has high levels of arsenic. You know, I try to get my ex-wife to move there. She was. Uh, electric ones. Somebody mentioned electric. Probably the best thing about the electric tankless is the. It just saves so much space. I mean, it's just like a little teeny thing there. I've got a, I've got an electric going on a, on a on one of my exhibits. It, it stands that far away from the wall. You know, it's really flat. It's really small. But almost always, when you you put in an electric one, unless you got a very modern house, you almost always need more upgrades, electrical upgrades. Uh, the one that I have at my office. It would handle, you know, your basic single bathroom house, but that's about it. And and it requires 80 amps. It's got two 40 amp circuits going to it. It's not unusual to see 120 amp or something like that going on. And the way they work is, uh, you know, whereas the burner comes on on the gas, what happens with this one is as the water's moving through it, the water goes through an, an element, then another element, then another element, and then another element, and it comes on and it, you know, it heats it up. It, they look like this here. They, look at the elements. You can kind of see them screwed into the top. So it, it'll keep flowing. Warmer, 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 and it'll kind of hot. Now, like I said, and I know it was just it was just chance, but sometimes you can do something and you have a problem with it, and it puts a bad taste in your mouth for that product. Like I said, I put in two electric tankless heaters. That's it I've ever put in. Both of them leaked. He had, it was like, it was a real quality one. It was like Bob's water heater. Something. Like I, don't, I don't remember the brand, to be perfectly honest with you. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you. Um, energy savings. I get people all the time call and say, um, yeah, I thought I could save some energy if I put one of these. I never tried to make them think that. That it was going to save energy. Uh, here's my theory on. Here's my theory on uh, tankless water heaters. If you have unlimited hot water, you use it. You know what I mean? If you put that thing in, and up to that point they've had a storage tank heater, and they know after ten minutes, fifteen minutes, they got to get out of the shower. They get out of the shower. If you if you're still hot in 15 minutes, it's cooking. You're going to stay in longer. Your kids are going to stay in longer. Your wife's going to stay in longer. So I'll get a call, and the guy says, "I thought you told me I was going to save energy." And I, you didn't hear that out of me. I said, "I'll never say that because look at your water bill. I bet it went up too. Every time people use it longer, you can't help it. You know, you just got the hot water, and it and it's nice." So, you know, if, if they're trying to save energy on the energy bill and stuff like that, that's probably not what they're going to do. And the standard one wouldn't do much anyway. You would have to get a condensing heater, condensing water heater or something like that. And a lot of your water heaters that you see, the basic ones that just have a direct vent to the, through the wall to the outside, they're, uh, remember I mentioned Category 1 furnaces and then I mentioned Category 4 furnaces? Condensing. Category 4 stuff is condensing. Most tankless water heaters that you see really the are tank are category three. A little little different. A little different configuration. And you, you're probably not going to see a category two appliance around. But anyway, that's that's the one of the few things about that. Most of them, like I said, they got a little vent that goes through the wall, they got one that goes through the roof. Some of them, even though they're not set up to condense, might even condense a little bit. You know, they have a a, a condensate collection place on it as well. Um Heat pump water heaters. Uh, this is from the Ashy article. It's been a while. Um, that type of heater, that, that's an add-on. See that thing on top of that heater? That's an add-on. I, I don't even think they make that anymore, but basically part of that is it, they, they put part of the condenser in the tank 
And as the, con the, the hot gases coming off of the compressor go through the condenser that's in the tank, the heat goes into the water. Um, you have, you have drop-in, excuse me, you have drop-in and add-ons. Uh, a drop, that's a drop-in. You take a regular water heater out and you put that guy in place of it. That's, that's what most people want. You do need a condensate drain uh, or a way to get rid of condensate when you put in the drop-in because, it, you know, you'll have some condensate. You've got an evaporator or a condenser. But, you know, a lot of them are called drop-in, meaning you can hook it up right to the same outlet, the, you know, the, 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 the circuit. Anybody know what the circuit on a regular water heater is typically? 30 in. Yeah, so you can put, you know. Uh, there's a few things that are a little different about these than regular water heaters. I mean, obviously, the way they produce water is. Um, if you see them, that's what you're looking at for most of them. And by the way, A.O. Smith's and States and a couple of them look alike because A.O. Smith owns them. A.O. Smith bought State years ago. I don't know if they still own them, but they bought State years ago, and everything started looking like State after that. You know, there are, they started looking like A.O. Smith. All right, let's see if this works. It's a little... Uh, Uh, where are you? Almost, I should have used yours. You got a touch screen. Here we go. You might, I'm not sure you're going to be able to hear it that well. I'm not hearing it. Good. All right, read, read the text. See the coil wrapped around that tank? That's your condenser. It usually doesn't make that noise. That's your condenser. The high temperature gases go through the coil wrapped around the tank. There's a thick wrap of insulation on that so that heat moves the cold, so the heat from that coil is going to move into the tank of water. And that's one of the ways, that's one of the ways these things do that job. But the whole time it's doing it, it's blowing out cold air out the top. Because it's blowing out cold air, because it's blowing out cold air, one of the big issues with heat pump water heaters is the space where you put it. You couldn't put it in a little closet because it would cool the closet down so cold, then it wouldn't be effective. It's got to, it extracts heat from the air and the space, runs it through a mechanical refrigeration cycle, runs the temperature up, puts it in the tank, and then, you know, the whole time that's happening, you're getting cold air out of it. If the air temperature in the room keeps dropping because you're pumping cold air, and there's going to be a point where it's just not going to be practical. So the, the lowest number I've ever seen is 950 cubic feet, but typically they're 1,000 cubic feet or more. That's cubic feet, not square feet. So you got to have them in a space with, you know, capable of having that much. Uh, some, some areas will tie a vent into another part of the house or even, even to the outside or something like that, depending on where you live. They have some real marketing. They have some tech, uh, some techniques that they use in marketing. I think it's kind of funny. One of them actually says, yes, they will, they will heat your house. People put them in a closet, and, then, and they, you know, you're, you're worried about it running and pumping cold air into the house in the wintertime because you're trying to heat the house, and it's trying to cool the house. And they'll say, yeah, but it helps you cool the house in the summertime, so it washes out. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's going to sell real good, you know. But anyway, so a lot of times you just try to figure out how to tie the room into another space or do something like that. Now, I asked the manufacturers, could we put them in an attic? And th their concern was it's just too hot in the attic. It, the refrigeration wouldn't work well. Um, I thought it would be a good one to go in a, in a garage in Arizona or some places like that where it's really hot in the garage. It might be fine in, a, in one, of, one of our garages, but out there, uh, a guy told me Kenny it gets 135 degrees in our garages. You know, I don't know how those people live with that much heat, but anyway, they do. So, uh, the drop-ins, uh, the the one to the left and the one to the bottom, you probably won't see them anymore. But the one up at the top right, it might it might pop in. And the way it works is instead of putting the heat in a coil wrapped around the tank, it actually has a pump in it. And it takes the water out of the heater and runs it through the, that blue box there through a, uh, a water-cooled condenser. I think i got an image here to show you. Let me see. 
this is the one where the, it's going through the tank and you know it's going around the tank with the with the coil wrapped around it. I got one in my school. I would go to Home Depot and buy stuff, and I noticed one was twelve hundred dollars, twelve hundred and some change one time. And I, you know, I thought that's too high. I'm not going to buy that for the school. And then one day I walked in there, it was nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. So I thought, hmm, it's getting closer. And within a week, it was seven hundred and ten dollars, and I pulled out the credit card and I bought it. And took it to the school and the first thing I did was try to figure out where the condenser coil was so I cut the side of the unit open the jacket off and exposed the coil now mine wasn't copper like I think he showed that one copper mine was aluminum it had aluminum coil wrapped around it big old blanket of insulation so that the heat would move into the tank but we got one sitting there so you can see the coil and, and the stuff at the top where you know we know cold air is coming out of so the, the other one I just mentioned you where they'll take the water out of the heater what it does is it takes it takes the hot refrigerant gas and it pumps it through a tube, essentially, inside another tube. That big coil there is inserted inside that tube. It's in it now. It's not next to it. It's a tube in a tube. The tube inside has like got refrigerant flowing through it, let's say, and then the other tube has got the water flowing through it. Water pump pulls it out of the tank, flips it through there, the refrigerator's going through the tube. That's basically a water-cooled condenser. We use that on certain, mainly commercial products and stuff like that. We use it on water to air heat pumps. Anyway, what that does is you get that hot tube inserted in there, and then you got the water flowing, usually flowing in the opposite direction, exchanges heat that way. So it's a little different than the, the tank. I, I tend to think that's probably the more efficient way, but, but I've worked on water to air heat pumps, and I, I just like the, the idea behind it. And what it actually looks like is not two springs that I've kind of put in there as illustration. It looks like that guy up at the upper left. That's the, that's the coil that actually one, one line is hooked up. One of those things is hooked up to the water circuit. The other two lines are hooked up to the refrigeration circuit. And that, that's how it goes. So uh, one of the things you need to remind your, your client about, if you see one of these uh, heat pump water heaters installed, there's a filter. The air filter has got to be clean. Most people do not think about cleaning an air filter on a water heater. So, you know, make sure you let them know that uh, it depends on the heater. Some of them are right on the top. Some might be in the side there. I got one, at, the one in my office, it's like a slot at the top, but you pull it straight out. But some of them are laying flat on the top. It just depends on how it pulls the air in. He's just, he's just vacuuming that one off. That was a course I took. A.O. Smith had a course, an online course. You could take their one hour online course and get one hour credit, you know. So, there's a there's a strainer in the water line on the gas heaters. Um, on some of them and, and it's right where the inlet line is, turn the water off and you clean it out. But that I just would always assume you would we would do when we're flushing it. It was it was it in the little air filter in a fitting, a black fitting. Yeah, but yeah, but was it in the water line? No, it wasn't in the water line. Hmm. Let me think about it. I'm not, I honestly, I I'm not sure. I haven't it, but it's yeah, it might have been. Uh, yeah, we, we, he said commercial yeah, stuff. So. Uh, this thing here, the National Appliance Industry. Um, I, you're probably not going to be able to hear it where the sound is in the room, so I'm going to tell you what he says. In 2015, the standards changed, and that's what I mentioned a while ago. You would not be able to find a water heater above 55 gallons, residential water heater above 55 gallons. Electric. Yeah, and what you would have to do is, uh, on uh, uh, electric heaters, um, what they, the requirements on them made them essentially have to put more insulation around it. I mean, there's only so much you can do. Electric is very efficient. You put electrical energy in, you get about 100% of it back out. It's, it's just a pricey fuel. You know, because some people say, well, it's not very, it might not be very uh, economical, but it's very efficient. You know, so the gas heaters, they still had some room to kind of work on the gas to try to meet the standards. They had some things that they could do to make it work. Just couldn't do it to, 
They just couldn't necessarily do it to uh, on the electric. So a lot of your electric heaters, the guy's talking in this video, the, he'll say the, the heaters that you're going to replace them with may not fit in the space anymore. That's what he's talking about. It might not fit in the space anymore because they had to put more insulation around the sides. Around the size. So a 50 gallon you took out might not fit. For example, that's one right there. Look at the pan. The other heater fit right over the pan. It was great. But this one's all, as big as big as the pan. And you know, I would I was looking at that and I was thinking, I would probably see if I could get a put a square pan in there. Then the, some of the front corners, you got a little room that you could kind of you could at least tell what the hell was going on. The way that thing's hooked up is you know, it's pretty hard to see. But but as I said, sometimes as as um, just remember, see, he had to take this line. It, can you see this? But I can't see the screen. Is that is that uh, TPR valve line going through the floor? Is that a mobile home? <laughs> you see, a lot of a lot of times we just try to run them to the pan. Well, you're not going to run them to that pan. You know, so a square one you could, you know, if you had a business where you got a you got a, a metal shop too, a lot of the guys would just fold up a pan to fit exactly between the wall, and they'd sit the the heater over top of it. But a lot of them you're just not gonna be able to get them back in the room. Period. They're just that much bigger. You know, they're they're just they're much bigger. Um, one of my concerns with these is you have to make sure you got the right TPR valve on the new heaters. That it, that it has the long shank. See how long that shank is that goes into the heater? Because if you go to put another water, heat, another TPR valve in there like this guy, it ain't going to reach. So what are you going to do to make it reach? You're going to put a coupling and a nipple. But now it's it's not going to be in the heater. You put a couple a coupling on the end of that valve and then a nipple into the tank. It's going to sense the temperature inside the nipple. Which it, you know, ain't like water's flowing through it, so it ain't going to be as hot as it is in the tank, and it's not going to be safe. So, I, I would tell you, as a home inspector, if you see a, if you're pretty sure that's a nipple sticking out of the side of there with a coupling on it, you might want to bring it to their attention that the the TPR valve is supposed to extend into the tank, and that ain't what's happening. You know, that's what I, that's the kind of stuff I see that I know homeowners will do. Do what your yourselfers will do. They, they they don't know any better. This this guy here though. It's got its own shank, basically. See how much longer that is? It senses in there. It knows the temperature in the tank. You know, both of them might sense the pressure. But what did I say? Temperature blows up water heaters. You know, not too much pressure, too much temperature. And this, we're getting close to wrapping up here. Hollis, Hollis knows this one. I think he sent this picture to me. This is... Uh, a heater did you you actually saw the inspection you did the inspection right all right here, yeah, here we go yeah. we got the we got the guy himself <laughs> so has anybody ever seen that that's the real deal that's that's a that's a proper installation well it's actually not a proper installation there's not enough clearance on the yeah, side on the end we figured that out but yeah he sent the picture to me and i would i've never seen it yeah never seen it it was a whole condo Whole condo, high rise condo building. That heater's unit like three thousand dollars. It's crazy yeah. priced. It's cra I called the guy to get some information on it, and for two months he was trying to sell me one. After that, all I wouldn't know was how much it cost. So I can tell you guys. The coming down on the side of the heater where the threaded rod's going through. Those could be. Yeah, could be. Yeah, I wonder if they still make them. I don't know. They're they're called Hubbles. They're really expensive. But with, it's a water heater laying on its side, how's a dip tube going to work? The water heater has to be standing up so the dip tube goes down to the bottom and pushes the hot water out the top. You know, when you fill up a water heater, because, I mean, I've had people, they don't realize you can't put hot water, you can't put cold water in the top of a tank and expect hot water to come out the other side. You put the cold water, they used to pipe them right in the bottom. Well, today, we pipe them in the top, but there's a dip tube that goes all the way down to the bottom in the tank. Cold water goes to the bottom. The heat is already rising the water up. Well, the cold water going to the bottom pushes it out. Well, when you open up a door and you see that, Hollis saw this. He's got some pictures of it. That 
And that thing, see where it's got threaded rod holding it? That's part of the heater. They actually come with those little deals on the side of it so you can hang it up. So we looked at it. He, he sent me a picture and we looked at it. And because I was like, man, I've never seen one. But I went online and I started, I started researching it a little bit. And then I found that. All right, here's the problem. There are fittings on the end of the heater. There are, let's see if I can show you. There are fittings on the end of the heater that you have to be able to remove to make a repair. So how much room I got on the end of that heater? Not enough. So basically the, the write-up on this heater was, you know, it, there wasn't enough access to work on it later. You know, and when you, if you've already spent 3000 some dollars on a heater and then, you know, plus installation or all that, they probably should give you one that you could work on, you know, for that price. So that was a thing. Uh, I don't remember. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was like 40 or 50 gallon. It was up there. It was like a stone line heater. It was crazy. All I could think about was, man, that thing must've weighed a ton. Yeah. You know, it was, it was crazy. But anyway, you know, uh, yeah, that's what happens around DC. Any questions? What do I got till 15 minutes or something? Huh? All right. Well, I'm running out. So I'll come up a little bit early. Any questions? We can, anything else you want to talk about? Here's a guy. He jumped over a guy in yeah, front of him. Almost did, a, did, almost did a Dick Van Dyke there. Yeah. But anyway, uh, I still see some 75 and 80 gallon electric water heaters out there. I'm thinking, where did they get them? And the plumbers are telling me, well, we're, we get commercial ones and put them in residential. Yeah. So that was like, what did I say a while ago? A black market opens up. Yeah. You know, you want something bad enough, you're willing to pay for it. You know, it gets to the point when there's nothing available. You know, I, I guarantee you, there's a ton of people out here. They got some nice fresh cans of R22. They'll sell you. You know, because they were smart. And before that 2021 cutoff date of manufacturing came around, they got them a storage facility somewhere and filled it up. You know, so that's the way to do it. Go ahead. Hi, Kenny. Um, what do you think about PVC supporting cast iron stack pipe? I, I see it. You mean as the vent? Or uh, I, what, what are we talking about? Right. Comes down into the basement. In plastic? We'll, we'll have the, a section cut out and PVC put under uh -huh. in it. And it's, and it's supporting that weight. The only time I don't call it out is when that cast iron pipe comes down the wall and then it comes this way over the foundation. Yeah, it's got some it's support. Kind of I mean, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to support pipe vertically. So it's not supposed to be the pipe on the pipe that's supporting it anyway. Some of the the... The weight above it is supposed to be supported, but you don't know that. You don't know what you're looking at. I mean, I would be looking for other, I'd be looking for other signs. I mean, there's ways to fix stuff like that. You could buy clamps that go around the cast iron here, maybe the cast iron there, and put threaded rods in it or something like that. There's different ways to do it. I think that's on a case by case type thing. I know what you mean. You know, I've, I mean, I seen a guy one time, he cut the ends off of an inner tube. And he took one end and he put it over the pipe and he put a hose clamp on it. And he took the other end and he put it on another pipe. And so he had this bladder in between, basically, and the bladder filled up with sewage. And I went there to unstop the drain and saw that, and I had to force the helper to cut that bladder off. And can you imagine that? It's like the old the old thing about a blivet. My father used to talk about a, that was that was definitely one. But I mean, you you you'll come up with some stuff sometimes out here, and you're like, man, I would have never thought of that. <laughs> you know, sometimes they're hilarious, and sometimes they're like, you're going to kill somebody. You know, uh, but one of the things that you know, we were talking about AAVs earlier, one of the beautiful things about AAVs is you don't have to cut the house up so bad. You know, all that fire blocking, you know, you just don't have to, you don't have to chop it up. You got to have one vent through the roof and some of them will go in the attic and they'll just stop in the attic. Some of them will just go in a wall. A lot of them will be under a sink. When you do all that stuff, you know, it, it, it's, it's pricey to put the AAVs in there. But you, you're, you're getting the benefit of saving the labor, and that's going to offset the cost of the, the, the devices. But like I said, the other area is kind of where plumbing overlaps. Plumbers always get blamed for cutting the house up. 
I, 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 when I hear somebody say, damn plumber, I can't believe he cut the floor up from where that, to put that toilet in. And my answer to that is, well, put the toilet somewhere else. If you're going to put the toilet in the, on top of a joist, what am I supposed to do? And I now hear people say, well, you're supposed to offset it. Use one of those offset flanges. They're the worst things in the world. You know, every other time you flush the toilet, it's going to be stopped up. Those offset flanges are terrible. You know, in some areas, they just flat ass, they're not allowed. Oh, did, did we talk about orphan water heaters? No, I'm glad you mentioned it because somebody mentioned it over here. What we're talking about is you take up, you take an old chimney and you pull out a, you, you have a furnace boiler or whatever and a water heater and you pull it out. Es essentially, you're cutting, maybe you've got a 150,000 BTU furnace boiler or whatever in an old house tied into a chimney and now it's just a water heater. It's not going to heat the chimney up. You know, so there's a likelihood of doing that. And the whole part of the drafting of the chimney was warming the chimney up. Yeah, not, exactly. Not on a cold winter day. So you're, you're probably going to have, your, but usually you'll see signs of back drafting, you know, at the draft hood and stuff like that. But now you can, you could take maybe and stick the flue pipe in there and then, you know, run it up through the chimney. At least you wouldn't have to go through the roof or something like that. I know a lot of guys that'll use a condensing furnace that way. They, the chimney becomes more or less a chase for the pipes. But yeah, that's a good one to look for. Like, like you, I, I, who mentioned it earlier? Somebody mentioned it earlier. But that's a, that's a good thing to look for because it's one of those things that might get by you. But you realize, like I said, that they've, they've, they put a condensing boiler or something on the wall and they're not using it anymore. And you got a chimney that used to have 200,000 BTUs pumping through it with, and now all of a sudden it's 40. Yeah, it's and, very common. We see it a lot. Oh yeah. Here. You might, well, y'all bring it. It's just the first time I've ever heard anybody bring it up. I know what you're talking about, but it's the first time you bring it. See At first I asked him, what do you mean by orphanage? Did they just leave one in the attic not hooked up? That's kind of orphaned. I've actually seen that. I've seen water heaters in attics, two or three of them not connected because the guys didn't want to take them out of the attic. You know, it was too heavy. We charge a lot more money to put one in an attic. I hated it. It's hot. It's miserable to work up there. Plus, you got to get them up and down. All that we'll stuff. We'll see it all the time around here. Like for gas units, the, uh, they'll have the blue and the red plastic on top of the pipes. Oh, on top sure. Of the water and, heater. And it's, well, it's, and it's melted. Melted. Yeah. On, always on the inside near the draft hut. Yeah, the it's not on the outside. Out. It's on the inside. So that's yeah. how you know it's yeah. back drafting. Well, I mean, the, the key, of course, would be to be able to just recognize that that flew. Remember, the water heaters at one time had a twenty-nine thousand BTU burner on it. Now they got a forty thousand BTU, but it's still not enough to heat that big ass chimney up. So, what about when it's a B vent? That's the question I always run into. So, let's say I used to have an old, what is it, class two or three furnace with a, you know, it had a, mm -hmm. a power vent on it, but it was a B vent. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And now I've just got the water heater left. Mm -hmm. Where I looked up, Same, a, I mean, the B vent's got to heat up the draft. Well, I looked up the standard on it, and you know, the six inch B vent required, you know, a hundred thousand BTUs or whatever. And if I only got that water heater, then that should yeah. still be the same failure, right? Yeah, yeah. So we should be calling those equally. Is yeah, kind of get, what I'm, a good point because a lot of times you'll see the B vent with the T in it or the Y in it, they're tied together. I mean, essentially, I think what people forget is we think about the output coming out of that flue pipe and we think of the the contamination, the, the carbon monoxide and stuff like that. And I've actually seen plumbers and HVAC guys go, well, bigger's okay. It's when you get smaller, that's a problem. They don't understand how B-vent works or they don't understand flues. When a flue gets hotter, it drafts, it, it pulls up. Without it getting hotter, it's just gonna be cold air. You know, and that, that's definitely gonna be, be a problem. So it's gotta get warmer in order for it to, create that draft and pull it out of there and if if you got a flu like like john was talking about you know now you, you know sometimes you know you you end up doing things like I, I i pulled water heaters out of places before and the chimney was just not lined and there was too many problems and we put a power vented water heater in there or something like that there's there's a few options a tankless water heater a lot of times you can just put it on the outside wall pop the pipe through the wall but you know the uh the, the power vented water heaters, they give you a lot of options. You know, definitely give you a lot of the options. You again? Yeah, me again. <laughs> Never been a big fan of the T connections where the water heater connects the T connection into the furnace flue, which ends up into the chimney. I've seen many times where you turn the furnace on at the same time you have the water heater cranked up and it's drafting poorly and you turn I, the furnace off yeah. and it drafts fine. Yeah. 
Well, you know what? I think one of the things we don't do sometimes is we don't tell them exactly what we noticed. We try to give it a nice little word, a nice little sign or something. Like when I, when I run a tub, a bathtub, and I'm testing the hot water, and I go into the other bathroom and I turn on the tub and it's like just a little trickle, and it's not, that's what I put in the report. I ran, I ran one tub, great pressure. I ran the second tub and both tubs dropped down to nothing. They understand that. I don't give them gallons of flow and all that crap. People don't understand that. You know, the average person has no, has no clue. You know, people, people don't know, you know, some of them think they're, the water from the drains is just being recycled in their house. It's a, some of the stuff that people tell me, I'm amazed, you know, at, at what they think. I have a lot of people that call a furnace a heat pump. And I said, well, why would you think that? Well, it pumps heat. Okay, well, I guess I guess that's the way to tell it. But anyway, you know that that's the thing. You could do an, an all day seminar on vending easily because vending is confusing in how much air you bring into the room, and you know, and a lot of the appliances today. One of the things that's happening today, though, is we are doing a lot more appliances that are that are uh, condensing furnaces and direct vent. You know, you bring in direct vent makes it nice. I mentioned the thing with the moss while ago coming in the intake, you know, that that's something people just learned over time because they, it makes sense when you think about it. Yeah, you got a vent up there, intake up there, and the moths are kind of flying around that light and all of a sudden, boom, you know, he's going, he's traveling through this, he thinks he's going someplace special and he ends up in, <laughs> he ends up in a fire. He says, damn, I went to the other place, you know, so, yeah, I'll, so, Kenny, I've heard a lot of explanations for the, um, I, I think they were guesses, not um, informed explanations of the, the, the logic for the uh, high, and, high and low um, combustion air um, vents into a utility room. Well, most of the time, they're, they're working on circulation. Yeah, so what, what do we need to do? Yes, air has got to circulate. Move air through it. I, I, I got to be honest with you on that because I've had some occasions where they would, they would have a louver door. And, and this has happened to me a couple of times. I'll go to a place, I'll open the louver door and the water heater's off, and I'll squat down right there in front of the water heater and I'll work on it. And I'll get the water heater lit, and then I'll, I'll close the door and I'll go, and there's no problem. But sometime I'll go there and I'll pull the door open and I'll do the stuff and I'll close the door and I leave and it goes off immediately and I come back and then I realize, damn, they changed the door. They put a solid door here. They had put a solid door there and I didn't realize it. And that's when you know, it really does burn up all the oxygen in the room and it goes off. I've, I've had that happen two or three times. You know, and after about the third call, you actually realize, oh, that door should have, a, have some vents in it. You know, what I think the best thing to look for when you're concerned things are not venting well, Look for evidence that something going on, backdrafting, a lot of these things. You know, you can, you can look at stuff and, and tell that there's definitely a problem. You know, an older house is tricky because most of the air, a lot of times, it, you might be getting air in there through a vent or something like that, but you're probably getting air in there through, with infiltration too. You know, I used to tell people I lived in houses, I knew the wind was blowing outside because the curtains were moving. You know, they were, they, they were that leaky. You know, now, I mean, I did a session on HRVs and ERVs recently, and basically, I mean, you have to ventilate the air in the house mechanically to get those turnovers of air because the house is so tight. You know, it's just that tight now. We never thought about that. Of course, we're getting a whole new, a whole new set of diseases and stuff. Like I said, every time you change something. But uh, a lot of our systems are coming up. They're going to be integrated. An exhaust fan comes on, air is going to be coming into the house. Some of it, right now, a lot of them are just still pulling it in through the furnace. You know, they're tied to the outside. But some of them are going to have to go through an HRV or an ERV because you don't want to be pulling in cold air. It's getting really expensive uh, to do that. It's getting really expensive. But, you know, there's, there are parts of the country where anything new like that, you got to have it. You know, I understand the guys in California, they have to have ear, uh, sprinkler systems in the house. I'm talking about fire suppression. You know, you have to have all new construction. Yeah, I ain't moving. Yeah, I ain't, I ain't moving here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. You get, you get there's some of the stuff that you know you think about it and they're like, you know, I, there's a lot of things that we don't see. You know, in some places you go in others. 
You know, I remember the first time somebody told me to talk about strapping water heaters. And, you know, the only reason I strap a water heater is to keep somebody from stealing it. You know, but, uh, and then you get out there. I remember one time I actually said that on a, to a client. She came from California, and they, you know, seismic straps and stuff like that. Last time I was out there, I actually stopped and bought a, a, a strap kit at Home Depot because it's unusual. I don't, we don't see that stuff, you know. know. So I go and I buy one. Well, anyway, one day the lady goes into the the lady goes into the garage and she turns and looks at the water heater immediately, and she sees there's no straps on it. And she goes, "Mr. Hart, there's no straps on the water heater." I said, "Oh, we don't strap water heaters around here unless we're worried about somebody stealing it." And the and the agent was standing over the corner, and she was going. <laughs> and I didn't say another word. I just kind of walked off and I said, what was that about? She said, she'll think you're trying to say that the neighborhood, you know, there's something bad about the neighborhood. She says she always assumes the worst. She said, Kenny, she has no sense of humor. Do not joke with this lady. I said, okay. <laughs> you know, so, but I mean, you know, it, it is kind of interesting. You see stuff every, all the time and, you know, but all of you probably, how many times have you watched a television show and something in the room would draw your attention? You you miss what the guy's saying because you're looking at something that's hooked up wrong. You know, you're looking at, well, damn, that's a gas water heater and it doesn't have a gas vent on it. And you're like, no wonder they act stupid. You know, so you'll see stuff like that. Uh, I see that all the time. I, I was in uh, Las Vegas at the Palms Hotel and it's weird how my perception is. I walked into that building three different years, and I did not realize there was a, a food court in there. And, and it, it was attached to a, like a 12-screen theater with an with a IMAX screen in one of them, and I didn't notice it. But yet I went to the, you know, because I went there and Jack, Moore, uh, Jack uh, uh, excuse me, Mike Casey, I said, Mike said, what do you think about this hotel? I said, it's okay if we have more places to eat than these three little restaurants here. He said, are you joking? I said, no, why? He said, hey, there's a whole food court around the corner here. I never noticed that. Been there three different times. I never noticed it. So one day I realized, well, damn, there's a movie theater here. So I went to the movie theater and I'm sitting there in the movie theater. Now, I don't notice there's a food court in this hotel, but I'm sitting there looking at the at the movie and there's a movie called White Boy Rick. It was about a guy that had had basically three strikes all put him in jail forever and the three strikes were just a little piddly things you know but he ends up going to jail well he's having a conversation in his basement basement with matthew mcconaughey who's supposed to be his daddy and i'm sitting there looking at him in this basement and it flashes up 1976 or something like that flashes on the screen when they're having this conversation and all i can see is there's a o smith water heater behind that guy that's a, like a 2020 model or something it, it was all it was not an old water heater and i'm thinking oh man that's a continuity problem i can't believe they did that and i'm thinking about that water heater in the meantime i didn't notice a food court with a mcdonald's in it when i walked into the building 